Pete here with the Small Business Resource Center and the Small Business Resource Center YouTube channel. I'm going to be making a video with five stocks that I think are going to, some could double, triple, or at least times 10 in, I would say, the next year minimum. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to post this one first or not, but if you're looking for this type of information, uh, business tips and more, hit subscribe. This video is about Harry Dent and James Rickards. There's also a couple other people. They talk about gold. They talk about the economy. Um, they talk about inflation. They're also going to give um, a couple training classes on how options work. They do have a sales pitch, by the way. I understand that. Everybody needs to make money. This is a over five hour long video, so it's not a mistake. You may want to bookmark it, save it. Um, you might have to come back to it, of course. So it's a very long video. It's very good. It's Pete with the Small Business Resource Center. Smash a like button. Let us know what stocks or options you're invested in. Comment below. Hit the subscribe button. Have a great day. Check it out. Owen, the CEO of the GoCo Group. We have an extraordinary program for you today. We have Harry Dent and Jim Rickards. We have had over 6,000 people register for this event, and I know why. If you go to YouTube and you look up Harry Dent and you look up uh, Jim Rickards, these two guys are the most viewed guys out there. Everybody wants to watch what they have to say. I think only Warren Buffett does better than these two guys. And we proudly have them on our program today. Hey, listen, after the debate, we're gonna have the debate and then we're going to have Sean Allison presenting. This guy is a clever, clever person. He understands the share market. He, he teaches people how to make money as the share market goes up, as the share market goes down or sideways. He'll teach you how to do it. And I had to get uh, Aiden Michelson on the program as well. Aiden speaks about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Uh, look, this currency has gone nuts, gone up like 400%, did a little bit of a dip in the last 48 hours, but it's gone crazy. So I had to have um, this uh, young man on the program. So don't miss him. He'll be on the program a little bit later on. Now, like every good program, we have a sponsor. And we have the Dent Sector Fund, who is the sponsor of this event. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Harry, and I'm also going to ask Andrew <clears throat> Stewart, just to say a few words. Andrew is the CEO of the fund. And um, uh, so, Andrew, can you hear me okay? I can, Greg. I can. Go, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's, it's great to have the Dent Sector Fund operating in Australia. Uh, <clears throat> we opened late last year. And uh, the first few months of this year, uh, it's been great to be working alongside Harry and uh, the investment team based in Australia. The fund is actually run out of Australia. It's under Australian corporate governance. Right now, you can invest in the fund if you are operating an SMSF. If you want to invest, you can invest in the name of your family trust or a company or in your own personal name. Right now, we don't have the fund on a retail <laughs> super platform but we are looking to have that uh, on a retail super platform in the coming months. Uh, everything today is just doing the usual disclaimers. It's uh, just general advice. We would suggest if you want to invest in the fund that you should actually chat to your financial advisor to see if the, uh, the fund is right. <coughs> uh, but since opening, the, uh, we've certainly taken a, a more cautionary approach to the fund. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know if you saw it, uh, Greg, but uh, overnight we had uh, Charlie Munger from Berkshire Hathaway. He's come out and he said that uh, it feels like investors are treating the market like a, a horse race at the moment. And I think we would subscribe to the same uh, thinking at the Dent Sector Fund. Uh, we've uh, certainly been uh, looking at uh, where the emerging markets are and we figure that uh, they're probably pointing to some impacts in the world economy and the developing markets. Uh, we're waiting for those trigger points to occur. So uh, with Harry as the investment manager, uh, we're looking to take advantage of those going forward. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the fund, you can register your interest at www.dentsectorfund.com. 
Uh, we can collect your details. We'll put you on the mailing list. Uh, you can also download the PDS uh, and read all about the fund and what the, uh, the, the mandate of the fund is. Uh, you also have the opportunity to click on and fill in the application form electronically. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a process if you are investing through an SMSF or through a company or through a, uh, a family trust. But what you can do is, is that you can call the number on the website and someone will actually step you through the application process if you're having, if you're having trouble. Uh, but we are certainly looking forward and we believe that uh, it's going to be a great year for the fund uh, and looking forward to, of course, today we're proud to be the sponsors of today's uh, debate. So we're looking forward to what, uh, what, uh, what, what Jim and Harry have to say there. So uh, we'll, be, we'll all be watching online at the Dense Sector Fund uh, intently. Uh, but uh, that's, that's it from the, from the Dense Sector Fund right now. Go to www.densectorfund.com, register your interest, and we'll get you on the mailing list. But I'll hand it back to you, Harry. I don't know if you want to say a few words about the fund, Harry? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, when I first published The Great Boom Ahead in 1993, I quickly got in favor with financial advisors and mutual funds. They just loved this endless boom I was predicting back then. So I worked very intensely in this in industry and, and you know, I came to learn how it worked. You know, basically there's a lot of funds and the funds specialize. So they do what they do best and the financial advisors match an asset allocation of funds and tweak that over time. And that sounds great, and it is a great concept, but, but I see in problems like, think about a fund, like a large cap growth fund. My statistics show generations will cause those to go up strongly for 26 years and then suck wind for 14 years. What does that fund do when it's out of favor? And what do you do when your asset allocation calls for a large cap growth fund and you have to hold it anyway? Shouldn't there be some other stock funds and stuff? So that was one flaw I saw. So we designed this fund differently, I'll get into. The other one is that, you know, it's difficult for financial advisors to make these allocations when things are changing rapidly. I, I always say the boom of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, everything went up. Real estate, all sectors, stocks, all sectors, emerging companies, you know, developed countries, of course, China and some places more, but everything did well. Bonds did well. Rarely do bonds go down in yield and go up in value and, and stocks go up at the same time, but it did for a lot of it. This is gonna be different. We're in the reset back out of the bubble into the winter season for a short period of time, just a couple of years. Nobody's gonna get that. Nobody's gonna know how to asset allocate that. I've studied it for many, many years and know exactly how to do that as tricky as it is. And then when we come into the next boom, it's gonna be even more important because what I see is it's not going to be everything boom. There are East Asia, including China, is pretty much done with their growth. Most of Europe is done forever, except for very Northern Europe. North America, pretty good, but it's going to be a whole different set. It's going to be Southeast Asia and India and Australia and New Zealand in the next boom are going to outperform. And then and when we do invest in places like the United States here, it's going to be the aging sector. So, so we I've designed this fund very simply. And, and the reason we're launching it in Australia is because people like Andrew and GoCo got the concept. I, I could not do this in the United States. Everybody wants to do it the old way, and I got to specialize and just do one thing. No, this is a seasonal fund. We're going to manage the seasons for you, and we're going to go from bubble to deflation winter quick and then to a spring boom. And I'm telling you, that's gonna be the trickiest maneuver in history and very few people are gonna get it right. But, but again, we're not just gonna invest in stocks, we're gonna invest in the best countries at any time. And that changes even in the boom uh, broadly. And we're gonna invest in the best sectors, every consumer sector for people who follow my work. No, I can tell you when apartments and nursing homes, they're both real estate, they couldn't be more different, okay? And nursing homes, are my number one sector for the next boom. So this fund is designed to be able to change, manage the season and the sector and country shift and, and allocation shift for you. And I've already got an idea for the next fund uh, on, on income, but I wouldn't start that for another two years because when the season would start to favor that, okay? And, and when it'll be necessary after we get through this defensive time. So, but also, I ask you to look at this two things. 
as a core fund. Since we're going to manage all this for you, you can have other funds, but start with this fund as a core fund. Give us something reasonable and then let us prove ourselves because I think you're going to find you want to allocate more, but you, you shouldn't have all your funds in one fund. And, and again, I would like to come out with some other funds, especially an income fund, but this is a core fund and especially right now that is set to manage the most difficult transition in the markets since late 1929 to 32. And I'm in telling you, I've been in this industry now since the early 90s. I know financial advisors, I know mutual funds and analysts and all that stuff. Nobody's gonna be allowed, even by their firm, to do what we're gonna be able to do for you. And the last thing I'd, I'd leave you with, I know how these waterfalls happen, especially when a bubble bursts. The next, I've got my chart set out already, the next crash, which is probably coming. And Jeremy Grantham, another granddaddy, came out and he said, we are within a month. He doesn't give it past May and probably earlier. And I, and I agree with that. The next crash is going to be the strongest and deepest of the entire three year or so process. So it's gonna pay to put in some money on the early side with us. I, I want you to get in at least with some money to catch that next move. So with that, I'll leave you. But I, I am very excited about this and I'm very excited to do this in Australia because frankly, you guys have always been my most responsive market. I, I tell Andrew and Greg and Steve, yeah, so you know, I probably sell three to four times more books per capita in Australia than the US. Obviously I sell more books in the US because we have 330 million people, but you are my favorite audience and you are my favorite country. So I'm, I'm very happy to start this here. And we are gonna move this to the US probably in the next year, but you guys in New Zealand get the first crack at this. Thank you, Harry. So remember everybody, www.dentsectorfund.com. And you can also go through to the um, website from there and have a look at the PDS. Um, so please register your interest. We look forward to that. Thank you for that, Harry. Now, by the way, Harry will be showing some slides very, very shortly, and everybody will get a copy of the slides. And that is a great gift from Harry because people kill the Harry Dent slides. So listen, everybody, you will get a copy. Jonathan from our office will be getting them out to you in the next few days. So don't panic. The slides are coming. I just want to also quickly say, look, we're seeing in the chat box that people are coming in from all over the world, and Germany and England and Vancouver and uh, uh, California, uh, Indonesia. Well, so welcome to all of our uh, uh, viewers from all over the world. It's so exciting to have such a uh, global audience, of course, as well as a very strong audience from Australia and New Zealand. Okay, what I'm going to do to um, kick off is I'm going to bring in Jim Rickards. Jim, are you there? I can see you're muted at the moment, but I'm sure you can come, turn on your yeah. video. Yeah, I'm here. Good on you, Jim. Jim, welcome. I'm so thrilled to have you uh, on the program. Uh, look, as I've done my research on you, uh, you're a pretty important guy. Jim, it's great to have you. As I did my research on you, the heavyweights in the political arena, journalists from all over America, you're a bit of a go-to guy in the economy. Um, obviously, you're one of the uh, wisest men out there in the economy for the USA. So we're so thrilled to have you on the program. Um, you're, a, you're, a, you're a whale in the, in the industry. Now, uh, Jim, I'd like you to give us a, 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 some opening comments before Harry will come on and give some opening comments and then we'll go into the debate. So Jim, over to you. Great, thanks for that introduction, Greg. And, uh... Great to be with you and great to be with Harry. Those uh, Anyone who's followed either one of us may know that Harry and I had a very high profile debate about six or seven years ago. And uh, John Malden, very well-known commentator, was the moderator. Um, the funny thing is a lot's happened in the last six or seven years, but in some ways we're, we're debating the same topic, uh, which is uh, inflation versus deflation or how that affects the price of gold. And Harry uh, you know, went through a number of very large uh, you know, potential changes and meltdowns and crashes, et cetera, uh, involving equities and real estate. And, uh, you know, you can pick your spot. There was a lot there. But um, fortunately, tonight we're going to be, or this morning uh, in Australia, we're going to be able to focus on gold because that's our uh, specific uh, uh, topic tonight. And um, Harry has a, a forecast that gold is going to go to $1,000 an ounce. My forecast is $10,000 an ounce. So there's a pretty big, uh, pretty big spread, pretty big difference. You can 
uh, pick your side of that. And I want to kind of go through um, the analysis. Uh, but I should make it clear I'm not in the uh, mutual fund sales business. I'm not in the gold sales business. I talk favorably about gold uh, you know, frequently. Um, people say, well, you're just talking your position. You're trying to sell us some gold. Actually, no, I'm not a dealer. If you want to buy gold, you know, be my guest. Uh, if not, uh, that's that's up to you. Um, I just try to you know, do the analysis, um, look at the fundamentals, look at the technicals, and and write about that and talk about that and kind of keep it at that analytical level. I'm not um, not out to sell anybody any uh, any gold, but I like to just point a couple of factors. Number one, for the last several years until very recently, Harry had a forecast that gold was going to go to eight hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, today he's at a thousand dollars an ounce, and that's fine. Uh, you know, you get new facts and information. You should revise your forecast. But I just think it's interesting that Harry's uh, gold target has gone up twenty five percent in the last couple of years. So we're, we're, we're there's still a huge spread between one thousand and ten thousand. But I think Harry's coming my way a little bit. I'll just give a little more time. Um, so let me look at three main drivers of gold price, three things that would indicate that the price of gold is going a lot higher and getting to the $10,000 an ounce I described. The first one is technical. So we're in the third great gold bull market in history. And you say, well, it's a history. It goes back, you know, five civilization, five, 7,000 years. How come it's only the third bull market? Well, the, well, the answer is that until 1971, gold was just money. You didn't have to say, you know, what's the ratio or what's the price? It, it was a form of money. Um, the IMF took subscriptions in gold. Uh, IMF, or sorry, gold was on in the reserve positions of major central banks. So it wasn't until 1971 when President Nixon broke the last link between gold and, and what I call it paper money or fiat currency that the price of gold could fluctuate enough uh, that uh, you could have so-called bull and bear markets. So I start from 1971. So we had a bull market nine years from 1971 to 1980, uh, gold went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. That was a 2,100% gain in nine years. Uh, then it was it was flat, flattish, uh, trending down for a very long period of time, almost 20 years in the 80s and 90s. Finally hit bottom at uh, $250 an ounce in 1999. That's when the second great bull market began. Uh, and from 1999 to 2011, Gold went from $250 an ounce to $1,900 per ounce. That's a 670% increase over 12 years. Then a very sharp bear market uh, from 2011 to 2015. The uh, price of gold uh, collapsed um, over 50%. Uh, just about 50% for a round number. Uh, and then you can pick the exact day. I'll tell you the day, December 16th, 2015. That was the bottom of the bear market and the beginning of the third great bull market. And we're in that bull market today. The price of gold, uh, it, it peaked, uh, uh, interim peak uh, recently, August uh, 8th, uh, 2020. Um, it hit uh, $2,060 an ounce. That was uh, more than double, just about double from the, the end of the uh, last bear market, the beginning of the new bull market. It's backed off a little bit since then, about uh, down around you know $1,800 an ounce, uh, give or take. Uh, obviously, a lot of volatility, but that's that's normal volatility and fluctuation in an extended bull market, which is what we're seeing right now, where the price of gold has doubled. But where is that going to go? So what I did, if you take those numbers, um, first bull market, nine years, 2,100%. Second bull market, 12 years, 670%. Just take a simple average of the two. You don't have to pick the higher of the two. You don't have to assume it'll be bigger or, or longer. It could be, by the way. But just take a simple average of the two. Uh, that would come to uh, a 10-year bull market where gold goes up 1,385%. So that would put gold at $14,500 an ounce in uh, 2025. So, so there, there's one way of analysis, a technical analysis. But if the current bull market is simply the average of the prior two, not bigger, not better necessarily, just the average of the two, gold's gonna hit $14,500 an ounce in 2025. So let's flip to another mode of analysis. And, and Greg, you were right in, um, in in previewing this that there were mathematical basis for what I'm saying. I don't, I don't just pick a number and throw it out there and say, oh, gold's gonna go here, you know, or up or down. Um, there's, there's, as I say, very rigorous, mathematical analysis uh, behind all of it. The second mode, one, one way to think about it, um, what if you had 
a gold standard. Now, I'm not saying we're, we're going to have a gold standard. There is not a central banker in the world that wants a gold standard. I, I can assure you that. But they may have to go to one. Uh, there's a loss of confidence in the dollar. And by the way, we're not going to live in a world where the dollar crashes and everyone says, get me some euros. I mean, that's nonsense. If, if there's a loss of um, confidence in paper currencies, such as the dollar, starting with the dollar, that uh, loss of confidence is going to apply to all paper currencies. It's not, it's not going to be one. The only thing that's going to go up in that world is gold, because gold is not a fiat currency. It is a form of money, but it's not a fiat currency. So the idea that you know the dollar is going to crash 50% and the euro is going to go up, that's ridiculous, because you know, if you double the euro, uh, it's going to kill European exports. They're not going to sell very many uh, uh, Airbuses or Airbus planes or bottles of French wine, et cetera. So, so major currencies trade in a range. Yeah, they can go higher or lower, but they trade in a range. They don't go to zero like Hertz. They don't go to the moon like Apple. They just, they fluctuate in a range. That will continue to happen if you're a currency trader or an exporter. Yeah, you care about that. But um, if you're looking at, you know, what is sometimes called the Great Reset or monetary collapse, it's going to affect all currencies at once. And at, at that point, central banks may have to go to a gold standard to, um, to restore confidence. Now, people say, well, there's not enough gold in the world. You know, maybe once upon a time, there was enough gold to support commerce, but there's not enough gold today. Uh, you know, numbers are so much greater, GDP is so much greater, commerce, trade, foreign exchange trading, you know, et cetera. Sorry, there's not enough gold. Uh, well, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's not about the quantity of gold. It's about the price. So what you have to ask yourself, what is the implied non-deflationary price of gold in a new gold standard, or even an approximation of a gold standard where you were trying to restore confidence. Um, well, the way to do that, again, I, I, the, good, the good part of this is the math is also a seventh grade math. We don't need integral calculus for this. The global M1 money supply today, when I say global, I mean United States, um, ECB, uh, UK, Canada, Australia, China, and Japan, the major economies, in other words, which is the vast majority of all the money supply. Uh, the M1 money supply is about, 32.3 trillion, approximately. Now, the amount of gold, official gold, we know that number is 34,000 metric tons. So again, this is all publicly available information, none of it's secret. So you got 32.3 trillion of M1 money supply, 34,000 metric tons of gold. How much gold backing do we need to support the money supply? Now, this is a subjective judgment. I don't think it's a, a, a you know definite number. I'm using 40%, you know, the Austrian economists and monetarists will bang the table and say, you know, it's got to be 100% or else you have, a, you know, what they call fractional reserve banking. Uh, but historically, gold standards have worked well with 20% backing. That's what the Bank of England had throughout the uh, 1900, uh, the 1800s rather than the 19th century. So I'm going to use 40% as a conservative assumption. That's high relative to some uh, most historical gold standards that have worked. So... The math is simple. Basically, you take 32.3 trillion, you need 40% of that, which comes to 12.9 trillion. So you need $12.9 trillion worth of gold. You have 34,000 tons. So what's the price per ounce for 34,000 tons to get to 12.9 trillion? Well, the answer is $12,000 an ounce. So to take your 34,000 metric tons um, and do $12,000 per troy ounce, and that comes to 13.2 trillion, which is enough to more than enough to get you to a 40% level on 32.3 trillion. So, so that that's called the implied non-deflationary price of gold in either a gold standard or uh, a shadow gold standard is some uh, way that central banks are looking to restore confidence in the paper money. So that gets you to $12,000 an ounce. Um, the third method um, has to do with uh, confidence, specifically confidence in the dollar. Right now, the U.S. Uh, debt to GDP ratio is about 130%. So take the national debt divided by GDP. What's that number? Well, the answer is it's uh, it's 130%. Debt is about $32 trillion and uh, GDP is about $24 trillion. Um, there's very good evidence that uh, I mean, a ton of research, empirical data that says when your debt to GDP ratio is above 90%, the Keynesian multiplier drops below one. Uh, what that means is, you know, the Keynesian multiplier says if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar twenty of GDP or a dollar thirty of GDP, uh, because the dollar, you know, you pay me the dollar, I pay somebody else, they pay somebody else. There's turnover and velocity, and you get slightly more GDP. 
Um, and that works well. A 30% a 30 debt to GDP ratio is considered very comfortable and sustainable. 60% is a little high. That's where Angela Merkel uh, you know, gets nervous. 90% um, you're through the looking glass. Well, the US is at 130%. That means we cannot borrow our way out of a debt crisis. So you just can't do it. In fact, the more you borrow, the worse it gets. You're dig digging a deeper hole for yourself. So what would it take to reduce the debt to GDP ratio? Well, the easiest way is growth, but we're not gonna get growth. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the way the the American way is inflation. You basically you you know it's like holding an ice cube in your hand and watching it melt. You inflate the debt away, so the nominal value of the debt can be unchanged, but by diminishing the value of the dollar, and that's what inflation is, uh, that debt to GDP ratio falls into line. Um, so it would take a seventy five percent devaluation of the dollar to get the debt to GDP ratio from 130% to 30%. And people will go, oh, that will never happen. You'll never have a 75% devaluation. Well, we've had this several times. What, what do you think happened when uh, in the 1970s when gold went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce? That was an 80% devaluation of the dollar measured by weight of gold. So something similar would put gold at $8,000 an ounce. As gold at $8,000 an ounce would be a 75% devaluation of the dollar measured by weight of gold. So I, get, I just gave you three methods. One was a technical method. One was uh, uh, money, involved money supply. And the third one managed, was involved managing the debt to GDP ratio. If you take the simple average of all three, so one, one had a $14,500 per ounce um, price target. One had a $12,000 per ounce price target. One had an $8,000 per ounce price target. The average of the three is $11,500 an ounce. So I'm not forecasting that any one of those three things will happen. All three of them could happen. Um, the, the last one, the inflation scenario is extremely likely to happen. We'll talk about that in a minute, but all of them get you to about the same place. And again, 10,000, 11,000, $15,000 for a range. Uh, I, would, I would really say as a range from 10,000 to $15,000 per ounce, but just take the low end of the range, $10,000 an ounce. That's where we're going. A couple other factors driving it in that direction. Um, central banks uh, since 2010 have become net buyers of gold uh, for uh, 40 years before that, uh, from 1970 to 2010, they were net sellers. Uh, all of a sudden it stopped on a dime. 2010, the IMF sold 400 tons. It was the last major sale by any uh, central bank. Canada sold their gold. Uh, a little bit later, but I think they had, I don't know, 100 ounces or something. They didn't have much gold. But, uh, but basically, central banks today are net buyers. Mining output is flat the last five years. Mining output globally is around 3,100, 3,200 tons. I'm not forecasting peak gold. I'm not a geologist. I don't have to forecast peak gold. But I can look at the data and see that that's flatlining. So when you have a situation where uh, demand is going up, which it is from the central banks, and supply is flat, which it is from the miners, that by itself is a recipe for higher prices because you have to go to the secondary market and bid it up to get any. So there's a host of technical, um, uh, geopolitical, monetary, and supply demand factors that all point to a signif significantly higher price for gold. And let me just uh, finish up by talking about inflation because if you get inflation, nothing else matters. Like everything I just said is you know, good substantive analysis and the facts back it up. But inflation will take care of it by itself. That's what, that's what inflation is. The value of the dollar goes down, measured in. Well, it could be corn, wheat, steel, copper, a lot of things. But gold is number one because gold is an alternative form of money. And here, uh, the driver will be uh, demographics. Um, uh, China has had an inflection point for the last 30 years. The increase in their workforce, the increase in a low-wage workforce has been an extremely deflationary trend. Um, and But today, they're at the point where the workforce is aging rapidly. They're now paying the price for the one-child policy. There's something called a dependency ratio. The dependency ratio is, what is the number of um, working age people, what is the working age population, relative to the size of the population that is retired, um, you know, uh, elderly, uh, just not working, uh, simple as that. They're consuming, they're just saving, but they're not working and they're not producing. So in a healthy society, you have a very high, a very, sorry, a very low dependency ratio. You have relatively few older people, a lot more working age people. And that's what we've had for a long time. That's what we had with the baby boom in the United States. And that's what China had. But right now, literally as we speak, just in the last couple of years and getting worse, 
with Japan as the, the canary in the coal mine, but China there on a larger scale, the United States and Europe not far behind. We have this inflection point where uh, you in China, you're very quickly going to have one grandchild per four grandparents. So there are going to be four grandparents in their 80s, let's say, and one grandchild who's 30, 35 working, supporting, in effect, the four grandparents. It doesn't have to be literally, you know, your exact biological grandparents. It's the ratio that counts. But it's supposed to be the other way around. Four, grand, four grandparents are supposed to have 16, 20 grandchildren. It's the opposite. You're going to have one grandchild per four grandparents, because that's what the one China policy has done to China. But you're getting to the same place. Sorry, the one child policy has done to China. But you're getting to the same place for other sociological reasons. In Japan, uh, I had a conversation with Saki Kibara-san. He was the assistant minister of finance in Japan in the 1980s, very famous. He was known as uh, Mr. Yen. Uh, and I said, uh, Saki Kibara-san, you know, your population is declining. Um, you know, you've been in a 30-year depression, which they have since uh, New Year's Eve 1989. So how are you going to get out of that? And he said to me, he said, well, well, here's what you're missing. He said, yeah. He said, but our population is declining. So our per capita performance is much be better than our gross performance. And I understood what he was saying. I said, well, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, we look at the GDP of Japan, but if you do it per capita, they're actually outperforming the gross number because the population is declining. I said, so, so where you're going to end up is, uh, you know, in, uh, in 50 years, there's going to be one Japanese left and she'll own the entire country and be the richest woman in the world. But that was sort of the reductio ad absurdum of what he was saying, but he was right um, about the demographics of that. But what it means is, is very low productivity. You don't get growth. I talked earlier about growing your way out of a debt crisis, but we're not going to get the growth. When people are 80, 90 years old, a couple of things happen with that kind of longevity. Imagine 100 years old. The first thing is, to a great extent, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's disease are highly correlated with age. It doesn't mean every old person gets Alzheimer's. It does mean that the number of Alzheimer cases skyrockets as the average age goes up. And the same thing with dementia. It's just, it's just a fact. And for some reason, it seems to be slightly worse in Asia. I don't know all the the genetic or biological factors that might, that might go into that, but it's pretty bad all around. Well, when you have dementia, you need a lot of care. Uh, you need a caregiver. You need to be bathed. Um, you know, uh, you need to be fed. Uh, you're not out working. You're, you're not saving. You're, you're dissaving, meaning you're spending your money, etc. The thing about bathing is robots can't bathe people. Bathing is a very labor intensive activity. It's an important activity. I, I mean, I, I uh, uh, compliment and praise the caregivers. My point is that we're going to need a nation of caregivers to get, take care of the nation of non-productive elderly, and that is not a job that can be automated. It is not a job that lends itself to the kind of productivity gains you can get in other uh, other areas of the economy. So what you end up with is um, fewer producers, more people in the working age population who are giving the kind of caregiving I described, which is important, but it's resistant to productivity gains. You don't, uh, as I say, you, you can't spoon feed somebody or, uh, or bathe them with, it, with a robot. Um, this will lead to, uh, uh, and then there's also slowing, um, slowing globalization, um, you know, name your factor, nationalism, you know, nationalism, uh, um, uh, you know, America first, Europe first, whatever it is, but globalization has now hit, hit the brakes. And that was a main, another driver of efficiency and productivity, et cetera. So put all, put all this together. You're looking at a low growth, low productivity world with massive uh, shortages of workers. The, the labor force is going to be way too small. What does that mean? It means higher wages. So I'd say, Harry, I've studied his uh, books and works and speeches. Harry's exactly right about the importance of demographics. He's exactly right about slow growth. But where he gets it backwards is suggesting that that's a deflationary trend. It's not. It's a highly inflationary trend. And we saw this in the, uh, in, the, in the late 14th, early 15th century after the Black Death. The Black Death killed 75 million people. Estimates vary between half and, uh, um, sorry, between one third and one half of all the adults in Europe died in the Black Death. Well, guess what happened in the late 14th century? Wages went up. They went up a lot. Income inequality went down. It was as if you had you know, the AFL-CIO in, uh, uh, in 14th century France. But the point is, uh, it was a period where there was inflation and wages went up a lot. The reason was exactly what I'm talking about, which is a massive labor shortage. So all of this uh, 
the demographics that Harry puts a lot of weight on. And I agree with Harry. The, uh, demographics are like a tsunami relative to, you know, everything else is like kind of playing with sand and puddles. Here comes the tsunami. Well, the, demogra the, the demographic wave is coming. It's going to make people a lot older, a lot more ill, a lot of mental illness, lower productivity, more call for caregivers, which is a low productivity um, uh, uh, occupation. And it's going to drive wages much higher. And that is inflationary. And that's one more factor why um, why the price of gold is going to go up because it just does in inflation. And just one last footnote, uh, Harry was talking a little bit earlier about you know certain emerging markets outperforming others, et cetera. That's generally not true in a world of floating exchange rates. In a, in a world, in the pre-1971 world, of, the pre-73 world of fixed exchange rates, that was true because if your currency was overvalued, uh, you had to basically have a depression and lower your unit labor costs to, to justify that valuation. But uh, in a world of floating exchange rates, the, um, the, the adjustment doesn't take place in labor costs, it takes place in the exchange rate in the terms of trade. So whatever trends are going on, and I just described them, they go all over the world. They don't, they don't stay in a bucket. So, uh, so the point is um, we are, you know, globalization has hit the brakes. Uh, we're at a demographic inflection point. The workforce is getting older less productive, more people are going to be engaged in kind of non-productive, not non-productive, but, but activities that do not lend themselves to productivity enhancements. That's going to drive wages much higher. That's inflationary, and that's going to take the price of gold exactly where I say. Right. Thank, thank you, Jim. Now, Harry, if you can unmute yourself, mate, uh, and we're ready and get your slides all op operating, that'll be wonderful. Harry has his uh, technical staff and team standing by. And uh, so Harry's bringing it up now. Can, thank you, Harry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. We can hear. We can hear you perfectly, mate. Okay. Great. Uh, good day, everybody. I'm going to run through some important slides very quickly. You are going to get these slides, as Greg said, so you can go after them uh, over them more in depth later because there's a lot of important information here. My view is that every major bubble. It, it, you know, except for rare third world and, and Weimar Republic, when you lose a war and go bankrupt and then borrow overseas, it's usually overseas debt that causes a hyperinflation. Um, that, that most bubbles burst with deflation because debt, money, debt, and financial assets that build up in a bubble disappear. And then that causes not only assets to deflate and debt, but also spending and businesses and unemployment and everything. So I see deflation, even though there will be inflation down the road, I see deflation as the most likely outcome here when we crash. Now, two important cycles, 90 years since stocks started and the industrial revolution and Harry met Sally with democracy and free market capitalism, greatest explosion ever. The stock markets have been going up exponentially, and this is a log chart and it's still exponential, but the one trend that is crystal clear that stands out, 90 year super bubble and then great reset cycles. 1837 to 42 after the great Midwest expansion. And I'm not gonna get into what the governments did to stimulate there. And then the 29 to 32 bubble crash, which everybody knows, and now the greatest bubble, the most global, ever. So we're right in that. In fact, we're about a year late on this because they've been stimulating so hard to, to avoid it. Another important cycle on demographics. Stocks tend to peak a little less on, on cycle than they bottom. Generation bottoms have come in, in 42, uh, Henry Ford generation, uh, 82, Bob Hope generation, and now baby boom, late 2022. I have been predicting since the 80s when I was super bullish that we would see the lowest stock prices of our lifetime at the end of 2022. And I still say that it just might be a year later because of all the money printing to, to stall on that. Most important concept here, my important breakthrough indicator from demographics and inflation is the four season cycle. Generations drive booms and then bust, and then inflation is driven, especially by high workforce growth, which the baby boomers exaggerated. And of course, immigration cycles do as well. But here, here's the key point. We hit the peak of the fall bubble boom season in 2007, went into a deep downturn that started to look like a depression, and, and they didn't know what to do. You couldn't get people to borrow more. They borrowed <laughs> off the charts, businesses and consumers and governments in the boom. So they found out, oh, you just inflate you know, quantitative easing. If you keep printing money, at least financial assets go up, okay? 
The reason this hasn't caused inflation is going into financial assets, not consumer spending. And we're in the winter season, 2008 to 23, which I've been forecasting for decades, when deflation, falling demographic trends, which is deflationary when it's spending trends falling, and high weight of debt and financial assets that weighs on the economy and eventually has to deleverage and wants to. This is why we've been printing 25 trillion, now well over 30, just after COVID adding that. We can't create inflation because we're in a deflationary era. If we'd done this sort of printing money in the 1970s, we would have had hyperinflation. Real quickly, great chart from Ray Dalio. Here's what happened. Just look at the top real quick, because I can say a lot about this. Last time we had a big bubble, you know, the debt bubbled up and then it deflated, not government debt. Governments always go more into debt when there's a crisis because they have to fund everything and bail everybody out. 62% of private debt was deflated after that 29, 30 bubble peak. Now we see the 2007 peak later and what happens? We barely deflate at all. In fact, new debt's being created, particularly in emerging countries. So we haven't deflated the debt which takes the excesses out and allows unproductive investments to be cast away so we can grow again, especially when demographics turn around. Now, what I've been saying for years, yeah, they've been, they started printing money and they, and they said, oh, this will be a short-term crisis. No, it's a long-term demographic and debt crisis and nobody's dealing with it. So they're printing money to cover it over. And I said, it's going to take exponentially more. They just printed in the last year since the repo crisis, a, a little more than they did in the entire QE cycle before it, over eight, 80 months in just eight months. So it's taking exponentially more. And guess what? No inflation. Here's the inflation chart. Look at this. It just goes up 1.3%. <laughs> Printing money at this rate, anybody that says, and, and, and Milton Friedman was dead wrong about it. He said inflation is entirely a monetary phenomenon. Well, not anymore. We've been printing unprecedented by any measure and all we get is 1.3 percent inflation and the federal reserve is praying for two percent and they can't get there okay what, what happens is there a correlation between money printing the blue line the growth of the balance sheet and inflation no inflation was going up even faster before the money printing then it went up at about the same rate and money printing got higher and higher didn't budge at all and then when they tapered in 2017-18 inflation kept going up and now they've just shoved it up the roof and inflation is still doing the same thing it's going up in line with the same indicator i've already used workforce growth which is getting slower but it's still positive for now gold tends to go up when they print money because the assumption which rightfully normally would be you print a lot of money and and it's going to you know and especially if it goes into consumer and business spending it's going to cause inflation but remember it's not going into consumer spending everybody's spent out or only the wealthy are spending more and then they happen to be the top 20 percent happen to be 50 percent of spending that's the only reason we're growing 4% growth in the up end and on the bottom 80% zero growth. But, but it's financial assets, but gold went up, especially with the money printing after two, that late 2008. And then when Japan tripled down on money and the inflation kept falling, gold finally fell into late 2015. And it's rising again, because money printing is stepping up. But again, I keep saying, where's the inflation? I've been saying literally out in public, It'd be impossible to create high inflation and really impossible to create hyperinflation in this global and US deflationary environment. So again, what's really happened, what really correlates with money printing is financial assets go up. Stocks, bonds, real estate, those sort of things, and especially stocks, because stocks are the highest return and benefit the most. Here's the US. We, they, stocks have gotten six times the GDP when normally is about three-ish, okay? So just to come down and reset, stocks have to fall 50% in value. That, that's $61 trillion of financial assets that, that will disappear. So my view is, again, why did you get deflation in the 30s and not in the 70s? Because we had a great reset out of a bubble. Financial assets disappeared and did not come back for a long time. Debts, 62% we saw, were restructured down, money disappearing again. And then, of course, unemployment and business failures and bank failures and, and, and less spending as well. But the biggest thing was the disappearance of financial money, not bank accounts 
but financial assets and debt. Here's the global picture. 2017, I had to really dig to find these damn figures, okay? And I've upped that. Here's the original analysis I do. Conservative, what it would take to deflate bonds and stocks and real estate back down to reality. And now I've just upped it recently because I don't have these figures updated, but I've updated for what I know is about the 525 trillion in financial assets. By the way, most important number in the world right now, 525 trillion of assets, six and a half times global GDP, way off the charts. It should be like two. And debt, 281 trillion, 24 trillion just added with COVID and, and more coming, 3.3 um, times global GDP. And it's going to deflate at a minimum. I'm being conservative here, okay? Original calculation, 205, this calculation updated for a little high, $225 trillion, three times the global GDP, roughly of about 80 trillion, disappears. That is deflation, and I will leave the country and move to Mars if I'm wrong about this. That much assets deflate, and you don't get deflation, then I'm the dumbest person on the earth, okay? I'll stand by that. Gold, everything bubbled. We've been in the biggest bubble in history, and money pretty good. Gold bubbled up. This chart shows, not quite as steep, but over a similar time period, within one year, gold went up, what, 7.6 times? I can't see this because it's covered. And, and the NASDAQ went up 11. Gold bubble too. I've always been debating people in the gold. And I say, the gold buds always said, well, look, the bubbles, the bubbles and money printing. I said, well, gold's in a bubble, damn it. And gold's going to have to reset the reality and then it'll grow again. And by the way, when does gold grow? Historically, 30 year commodity cycle is one of the best cycles out there, most consistent. We peaked in 2008. Gold came later because of the money printing and silver. But the next one is 2040, and this one shouldn't bottom till at least 2023, something else I've been forecasting a long time. Now, here is the last, the Great Recession. One of the things I see, remember I talk about that winter season, okay? 2008 to 23, the normal way that happens without endless money printing and quantitative easing, which did not really exist substantially in history, you have the big crash first, 29 to 32. Oh, most of the assets go. Same thing with Japan, 90 to 92. Stocks routed, real estate routed, take down the financial assets and the debt as much as possible. Japan didn't do the debt and we did in the 30s, okay? That's the normal way. Big crash, 30, 32. You have a stimulus program that gets you back up into 37 and then you have a final deep recession or lesser depression into the end of the winter season. This time we're gonna get the opposite because of this 90 year cycle, which hits later than our 80 year demographic cycle in winter and, and, and this bubble being extended so long, we're gonna get the big crash by my view from 2021 into 2022 or 23 and stocks are gonna go down 80, 90%. But again, just to get a preview, what happened in the mini depression in 2008? Here is the red line is TLT, treasury bonds. And the blue line is gold. Gold did better first, held up in the early stages of the down. But when things really got ugly with Lehman Brothers, oh, dollar goes up 27%. Bonds go up 20, 30, 40%, depending on the duration. And gold goes running to mommy, okay? Gold was anticipating a... Gold likes to see money printing because that's going to cause inflation down the road. Did not happen we started to see a depression-like scenario, and that's when they really turn on this big chart now. And here's the good story for gold. Gold goes straight up much faster than bonds. We're coming out of this with massive money printing because it is favored by that. And at least we get a tiny bit of inflation. And bonds take a while to go down, but eventually they go up when, when, when monetary easing pushes down bond yields. But the point is at the worst of the crisis and into the most important part, it was the treasury bonds that were the safe haven, not gold. Gold looked like it would be until it saw deflation. Here's another chart from somebody said, you know, gold back historically, not always, but often runs in nine year cycles. And they just saying, you know, I was projecting myself that with a, a trend line through the two 30 year cycle tops, 1980, that was the biggest, as Jim said, that was the biggest granddaddy because that was the strongest inflation and gold correlates more with inflation than anything. And Bitcoin doesn't, by the way, 
You want an inflation hedge, it ain't Bitcoin. It's gold, okay? I agree on that. The trend line up through here would be about 2,200. I could have seen gold in the early stages of a stock crash, like in 2008, continuing to edge up until they saw that deflation. But you know what? I'm not seeing that now. It's already underperforming and, and it's about to break out of a potential head and shoulders pattern on the downside. So we'll see. I think gold may have a little bounce here. And if it goes to 2,200, I'd be telling people that's where to cash out. And that's still a possibility. I do not see gold going to 10, 12, 15,000 because deflation does not favor gold. Gold is the best single inflation, inflation edge on earth. Real estate is too, but it's more complicated. Now, real quickly, how do I see this playing out? Here's a typical topping process, megaphone patterns. I love these patterns. They only come at top. People don't see them often. We've been going up, higher highs, lower lows. I keep reminding all these bulls, every time we make a new high, guess what? We make a new low. You know what the next new low is? 2,100 on the S&P. And that's just the first pop to this downturn that's gonna get very, very deep and deflationary. This is an important point here. If we see this, and Jeremy Grantham is saying something very similar, somewhere between now and May, I agree with him, we're gonna see a top and the next crash is gonna be the steepest we've seen yet. And that's when I think people lose faith in these dumbass, academic, never had sex, never run a business, central bankers, okay? They're going to lose credibility because they're going to want to print 20 trillion next time. I think they're going to start to lose credibility and people are going to finally see you don't get something for nothing by just printing money. The economy keeps getting worse and worse, not better and better, despite brief new highs. And guess what's the safe haven? What's the last thing to know? We've had the greatest bull market in, in, in treasury bonds ever with falling rates following the greatest bear market from, from the late 30s, early 40s. I've been projecting back decades that by the end of 2022, we would see the lowest treasury bond, risk-free bond yields of our lifetime. And then they would turn up into the next spring boom and mild inflation cycle. Now, if you believe me, you should be in treasury bonds. And what's the better bonds? The 30 year, look at this 10 year bond. If I make assumptions a little deeper, and this is a conservative too, than we just saw in the flash crash last year, February, March, that, that the 10 year goes to zero and the 30 year goes to 0.4. They went to 0.7 and 0.4 last time. So this is not, <laughs> it'd probably be worse than that, maybe negative. 10 year would make nine and a half percent appreciation, 30 year, 38% from locking in these measly 2.2% yields when they go to zero for 30 years. That's how you make a lot of money. Zero coupon, a little more leverage, 40, almost 50%. And the TLT average 20 year, 22%. So I say buy 30 year treasury bonds or zero coupon. That is the best safe haven. If we do get inflation down the road, you can play gold and other things then. I say, and I'll stand by this, deflation comes first when $525 trillion of financial assets and $281 trillion worth of debt eventually has to deleverage. And for Bitcoin, you know, we had the debate with Michael Turpin a few weeks ago, and I, I'll just show this briefly. Here's my view of Bitcoin. I think it is, along with blockchain, more importantly, the next thing, how financial assets get interneted, okay? The, digit, the digitization of all financial assets and money, okay? But it's in the early stages. I compare it to the dot-coms and Amazon. The internet index went up great into 2000 and a few years and then crashed. They were the end of the first tech bubble. Amazon did better than ever because it was one of the leading stocks and then crashed. 95% crash, that's my projection. Let's say 58,000 was just the top and I put out an update to my newsletter subscribers today. That could have been a top, okay? To go down 95% would take it where? 3,000 where it bottomed after the 2017 crash. That'd be the fourth way that I got a million. Three to 4,000 is my target for Bitcoin. A couple of years from now, it is not an inflation hedge like gold and it is definitely not. It's the worst possible safe haven on this earth because it's the biggest bubble of all bubbles like the dot-coms were in the last tech bubble. So that's my view. We are in a bubble that is beyond anything we've seen before, more global, more pervasive, all asset classes, almost everywhere. And now the emerging markets are joining in late stage. And of course, crypto and Bitcoin 
and crazy stuff like GameStop, which showing there's so much money floating around, you're just going to keep bubbling stuff until it blows. Somebody asked me yesterday in an interview, how does this thing blow? I said, you know what? I don't know. Do you know in an avalanche when that one snowflake adds in or that one grain of sand on a mound and then it all of a sudden collapses? That's what's coming or I'm going to quit my profession in the next two to three years. It may be less deflationary, I say or not, but it's going to be deflationary. This bubble is going to burst, I think, very soon now. It's been stretched so far. They're printing so much now. It's making no difference. What are, what are they going to do next? You know, 10 trillion? And then, then when we crash, are they going to recommend 20 trillion? And then, but, but if you go back to that one chart just in here, where, where the bonds did better in, in the crisis, but then coming out of with the money printing, gold did better. That's where I could see gold in a second stage of this towards the end doing well. And guess why I like gold long term? Not because of inflation. As Jim said, demographics say a low inflation, low growth world, even in emerging countries increasingly. Asia is going to be the dominant part of the world on a cycle I have into the next several decades. And Asians love gold. Chinese buy the most. Indians a close second, but Indians as a percentage of their incomes buy way more than Chinese. And India is going to be the biggest growth story of the next 30, 40, 50 years. I would buy gold hand over fist when it hits my thousand dollar give or take target. And by the way, that is going to be way less than commodities and silver, way less than stocks going down, more like real estate. Gold is not the worst place to be in the crash. And in fact, you really sitting there listening to me and Jim said, I know these both guys sound good. I here, here's what you do. 40% short stocks, unleveraged, SQQQ, let's call it. 30% 30-year treasury bonds and 30% gold. So you're covering all bases. I would just take the stocks and the treasury bonds, you know me. But if you want to do that, that's another way to play this. Harry, thank you. I've got to tell everybody, I like it when Harry gets worked up. And uh, remember, we Harry's going to be coming to Australia as soon as we can get him on a plane and get him out here. And you must come and hear Harry Dent live. We take him Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth. By then, he's almost over the jet lag, and then we put him on a plane and send him back. But um, you've got to come and hear this guy live. He is sensational. But anyway, any rate, thank you for that. I like your challenge to Jim. So let's get right into it, gentlemen. And I've got some questions here for you both. And the first question is, um, you're both saying we're in the new Great Depression or heading into the new Great Depression. So the question is, how do you reconcile your negative views with such a positive market behavior at the moment. And I might ask Jim, would you like to answer that first for me? And you'll need to unmute yourself, Jim. Uh, yeah, I think, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, mate. Can you answer that first? I'll come to Harry after that. Sure. Uh, well, um, a lot of people don't understand what a depression is. You know, a recession with the R, two or more consecutive quarters of declining GDP. So. Economists like it because it's quantitative. You can plug it into a closed form equation. They like that. Depression, the D word. Economists have banished the D word. They don't like to talk about it because they think they're too smart to ever have one. We're in one now. Japan's been in one since 1989. You can have growth in a depression. Depressions do not mean continuous decline in growth. What they mean is occasional technical recessions and growth, but growth below trend. It's depressed growth. So if your trend is 3.2%, or your potential is 3.5%, and you're growing at 2.2%, which we were from 2009 to 2019, or I expect even less, maybe 1.9% in the coming years, that's depressed growth relative to trend. That's a depression. If 1%, uh, you know, the difference between say 3.2 and 2.2, if that doesn't sound like a lot, it is. You take 1%, put it on a $24 trillion economy and compound it over 10 years, you're looking at three to four uh, hundred trillion dollars worth of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, three to four, uh, sorry, three to four trillion dollars of lost wealth, lost output, money we could have had if we could have performed that uh, a trend. So, um, so you can have the depression, uh, but you can still have inflation. There's a name for it. It's called stagflation. We had it in the late 1970s. In other words, I am uh, projecting slow growth. I am projecting a depression. The effects of this pandemic will be intergenerational. They'll be with us for 30 years. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have inflation. And by the way, I should just add, because one, I was looking at the questions uh, myself. I can't answer all of them. There are too many, but I, I think it's great that there's been uh, so much participation. But one of the questions that came out was, hey, Jim, 
in your new book, you talk about deflation, and yet you just spend 20 minutes explaining where we're going to have inflation. Uh, and they're both two very short term, meaning the 2021, uh, the, the tendency is still towards deflation and disinflation. What's amazing about gold is that with deflationary headwinds, which we have had, gold has still gone up uh, almost doubled in the last uh, six years, and it's held up very well. It gets you know, knocked down every now and then. But if you had the kind of impact Harry's talking about, why isn't gold at $1,000 already or even lower? So I'm impressed with the performance of gold in a deflationary environment, which we have had. Uh, but we're right at that inflection point. We're right at the point where it, it tips into inflation and accelerating inflation beginning in 2022 and thereafter. So the way to reconcile that, yeah, very short term, meaning a year or less, um, yeah, more disinflation, borderline deflation, but that's going to turn very quickly. So that's how I'd reconcile that. Um, and by the way, just to be clear, I agree with Harry that we have come through enormous deflationary trends. I mean, that's absolutely correct uh, for the reasons I mentioned, which were the uh, you know cheap Chinese labor, hundreds of millions of people coming off the farm, going into Lego style assembly um, and, and other, uh, other factors. Uh, and then all the money printing, the reason the money printing didn't produce inflation was because it was just holding its own against the deflationary trends, which were demographic and globalization and um, automation and a number of other factors. But the, but the point is, and what, what I think is being missed in the discussion, is we're right at the inflection point. So if, if you ask me about Harry's thesis about deflation, I say, yeah, that's been, the, that's been the story of the last 20 years. Absolutely right. But we're right at the point where that's going to flip. You can't just extrapolate deflation. You have to watch the turning points, the tipping points, and we're, we're right at one right now. Mm. Harry, your thoughts on that question? <clears throat> Okay, I am crystal clear about what depressions mean typically. Depressions, almost the thing they always involve, unlike the 1970s, and unlike what we've even seen in Japan with kind of zero uh, inflation or deflation, it's the deleveraging of debt and financial asset bubbles. That's when you see a depression rather than a deep depression. Demographics predict deflation or inflation because slowing workforce growth is deflationary and rising rapidly like in the 70s is inflationary. So in the 70s was due to be an inflationary thing and people now still think the government's printed money in the 70s. They didn't. They ran deficits in a recessionary inflationary economy, duh, but they were not printing money off the charts like they are now. They did print money in 1932 at the end of the worst first crash because it was so bad, but they did, they printed it like 6% of GDP rather than now. Real quickly, when you print all this money and, and do all these assets, why, why do I not listen to markets? The markets are on crack, okay? Would you listen to a crack addict and ask them, of crack addicts on a roof, what are they gonna do? They're gonna try to fly off of it. The markets have been fed free money that all this money comes in, adds to the financial asset pool. It's not been given to businesses and consumers until just recently with fiscal stimulus. It pumps up financial assets. They're on crack. They're going up. They don't need a good reason. Oh, but they have earnings and the price earnings is not that high. There wouldn't be any earnings because there wouldn't be any economy. We'd be like Japan or worse if it weren't for this constant money printing. Everything is fake and artificial and the markets are so high they don't know it. And they don't want to listen to me or Jim because everybody out there from Warren Buffett included, everyday people, financial analysts, Wall Street, everybody's high. Nobody high wants to be told they're high and they're heading towards detox. Debt deleveraging financial asset bubbles is detox. It sucks. That's why nobody would choose it. Central banks will not choose it. They're going to blow this thing until they have the avalanche and then deflation will take over. The economy will heal itself so fast. Income inequality will be solved so fast. Debts will be leveraged like they did in the early 30s. 62% of private debt disappeared. That's good. That's a detox. That makes you healthier, even though it almost kills you. So that's the way I see depressions. That's what's unique. And depressions have deflation. Japan's only thing, they had the financial assets deflate at first. They never let the debt deflate. That's why they're in between inflation and deflation, and they're going to end up in deflation. And guess where de Japan's demographics go? Down again as strong as they did in the 90s. 
So Japan is going to deflate this time because they're going to go down so hard they'll have no choice. Our markets are going to cause this crisis. And then debt gets restructured because the markets collapse and, and, the, and the economy cannot grow without these markets feeding the rich who are the only people still spending money out there. So if you're selling yachts, sell them now because they're not going to be selling very soon. The rich are going to lose the most money when this bubble bursts, not the poor. Harry, I'm going to continue on that vein of printing money because, you know, we hear that as they print the money, 70 or 80 percent of it leads to the uh, share market and places like that. The Federal Reserves have pumped four trillion dollars into the economy. In fact, we're told that they will potentially continue to print money for many, many years to come. Why do you think this monetary stimulus just won't work? Harry, you first. OK. Do you remember that number I threw out, the most important number in the world? What was it? Just for that to deflate normally back to somewhat reality, two to 250 trillion disappear. Do you think two to 250 trillion? So do you think Jerome Powell or Janet Yellen, thought I thought a booty cap, okay? You think they're fast enough on the draw to print that much money ahead of time, fast enough? You think they're gunslingers? You think they got the to do that and do you think people will let them if after we just printed more money in one year and more fiscal stimulus than the whole past cycle and we still fall into recession again and that's the key we have to fall the economy has to weaken or the markets have to weaken to trigger this but if that happens again do you think people are going to say well why don't we do the same thing we did before duh i think the people say well maybe you do as soon as this thing cracks, all I think it takes is that 47%. That's a megaphone pattern. You want to argue with that? Good luck. It's one of the most reliable patterns. A 47% crash in the S&P, which means 50 some percent in the NASDAQ, I think will tell pe people wake up and say, oh, this really doesn't work. And then when they come up and say, well, now we're going to print 10 or 20, people are going to go say, I'm not going to say the words they would say. Okay, You know what it would be. But Harry, what about if they keep printing for the next 10 years? Yeah, you can, but, but they just printed 10 times the rate they did before, and it didn't do much for the economy except for restore a quick downturn, and it didn't create any inflation with their target. But, but somebody has to let it, they can't just print money. I mean, what if people start riding in the streets and say, I'm sorry, you guys, we let you do this for 12 years, and it failed. I think People are smart enough, even though we're on crack, everybody's on crack here, okay? Every, even everyday people are getting a 3% mortgage when it ought to be six or seven, getting a 2% car loan when it ought to be seven or eight with higher risk. Everybody's high, everybody's getting a benefit. The economy has lower unemployment than it would have if we hadn't printed 30 some trillion dollars and now tens of trillions of fiscal stimulus. So I think people will get it, but that is where I could be wrong people are stupider than I'm assuming they are. I think they'll wake up. What I found about people when the barn's burning, people get real smart and they become heroes overnight. They run in and save the baby and the horse and run out. They quit being an everyday dumbass Homer Simpson and they do the right thing. I think a crisis is going to wake people up and I think it's going to come in the next few months with that first 47% crash. And if that doesn't happen, then I have to recalculate. Okay, but if in five years' time they're still printing, could this lead to a melting American dollar? Well, has the dollar melted with all this? Print? Okay, let me tell you about money printing. Percent of GDP, something real. How much is Japan printed? 128 last I looked, probably more by now. Europe, 50 plus 4042. We're the best house in a bad neighborhood. And, oh, China doesn't print as much money because they have busy printing condos. They're building shit for nobody. That's the worst thing you can do. Overcapacity. You know that China went from 20 to 60 percent urban in three decades, the fastest of any major country. But today, if they didn't build another thing, they could go to 80 percent because they got 22 percent of condos. Nowhere. China is dead. They did the worst money printing. We're the best house in a bad neighbor. That's why I say when the you know what hits the fan like it did in 2008 with Lehman Brothers, dollar up, other currencies down. We're going to go up and I will bet half of my career on that. Not forever, just in the crisis. And the treasury bonds with them, up. 
not gold. Area. Gold went running last time, Jim. It went running when it saw a real crisis, Lehman Brothers, financial institutions melting down like the 30s. Harry, your, your camera's just slipped a bit there, mate. I'm going to go to uh, Jim and uh, Jim. Now, Harry got pretty hostile about the stimulus of this stimulus and this printing money. What are your thoughts? Yeah, let me uh, let me see if I can correct five hours and five minutes here. We'll do like a lightning round. Uh, first thing, print, printing money has nothing to do with inflation. It's not what causes inflation. The quantity theory of money is M times V equals Q times P. Q times P is nominal GDP if you multiply them out. M is money supply and V is velocity. Uh, and Milton Friedman used to say that a, a mature economy can only grow in real terms about three and a half percent. And he was right about that. Uh, and he said, we want inflation to be one, meaning we don't want inflation or deflation. If we want nominal GDP to equal uh, real GDP, that means the P has to be one. Um, and velocity is constant. So all you have to do is dial up the money supply or dial it down to get three and a half percent real growth with no inflation. You don't even need a central bank or a board of governors. You just need a computer to run it the way I described it, like turning up a thermostat in your house. Milton Friedman was right about everything except one thing. He was wrong about velocity. Velocity is not constant. Velocity is highly volatile. Velocity has been dropping like a stone, depending on whether you use base money. It's been dropping for 20 years. If you use M2, it's been dropping for about uh, 10 years. But the point is, if you increase the money supply and velocity goes down, your nominal GDP is unchanged. So the way I describe it is, you know, seven trillion. The, the Fed went from about three and a half trillion to seven and a half trillion in less than one year. That's true. They did print four trillion dollars of new money, but seven trillion dollars times zero is zero. Meaning, if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So forget the money supply. They could go to ten trillion, as Harry said. They could go to fifteen trillion. It won't matter. It will not cause inflation unless velocity goes up. So let's talk about velocity. Velocity is a psychological variable. It's not something that the central bank can control. Right now, velocity is declining because when you have interest rates at zero, which the Fed does, what signals does that send to people? It says the Fed's worried about deflation and they should be worried about deflation. They have been. So why should I go out and spend money if you're going to have deflation? Why should I borrow money? Uh, I'll save more. My money will be worth more. So you got to change the V. That's a psychological variable. What's going to change it? Well, you could, the government could target the price of gold at $5,000 an ounce. I doubt they will. I'm not forecasting that, but that's one way to do it. There could be some other shock, but the shock that's coming is the one I described, which is wages are going to go up. And I, and I don't understand how Harry and I can agree on uh, on demographics, which we do, and you can't disagree because it's in the data and you can't make up data. Harry and I both see the same demographic wave. But I'm trying, I can't understand why if, if, if the labor force is declining, why that's deflationary. That's highly inflationary. We've had deflation for the last 20 years because the labor force was growing and it kept wages low. The minute the labor force stops growing, which it is starting now, wages are going to go up, which is inflationary. So I don't see how you have, how can you have deflationary in a world where the labor force is growing? But it's also deflationary in a world where the labor force is shrinking. It doesn't work that way. Labor force is going to shrink, but that's going to drive wages higher, which is inflationary. The other thing that Harry said that, that I just um, that couldn't understand, he kept he said we you know I forget the exact number, we have 500 trillion or whatever of debt. We have to deflate the debt, deflate the debt, deflate the debt. Well, there are only two. First of all, debt. You got to look at the right side of the balance sheet. Debt's on the on the liability side. It's not an asset if you're the issuer. So there are only two ways to deflate the debt. One is default. You can default, not pay it. And then the debt goes away. Of course, that will destroy the economy and cause something far worse than the Great Depression. Uh, but the other way to do it, the American way, is to inflate. In other words, the way you deflate the debt is by inflating the currency. Because when you inflate the currency, the currency is worth less. Well, guess what? That means the debt is worth less and you can actually manage the debt. And that is what we did from uh, the end of World War II to 1980. Now, 1980... It turned around, but, but basically we had slow inflation, then we had rapid inflation, we didn't quite get to hyperinflation, but we basically melted the debt, made it go away. So in other words, I, I agree with Harry that the debt's out of control and has to go away, but there are two ways to do it, you know, default, which will be, you know, again, we'll be back in the, in the Stone Age, or inflate, which is what's going to happen. And so it'll just, it'll just go away. But, but it was deflation of debt equals inflation of currency. And that's what I'm talking about. And that drives the price of gold higher. As far, and as far as um, 
the dollar going down, the dollar going up. There, there are only like five people in the world who actually understand how to measure the dollar because everyone looks at you know DXY or the Bloomberg index or the Fed has a broad trade weighted uh, currency index. And I, I look at all of them. I mean, they're they're, they're on my my screens, my trading screens every day. But all they do, uh, you know, the dollar is 60% of global reserves or dollar denominated assets, I should say. But the, about 25% is the euro. So 85% of global reserves are denominated in dollars and euros. So the euro US dollar cross rate is about the only exchange rate that matters. You can trade sterling and Swiss francs and, uh, you know, New Zealand dollars to your heart's content, but they're just tiny little markets. Uh, you can make it lose money, but the, the whole world basically revolves around the euro and the dollar and the euro US dollar cross rate is the only one that matters. But that's not a measure of the dollar. That's just a measure of a cross rate. If you want to measure the dollar, you have to look at gold precisely because it's not, it is a form of money, but it's not a currency that comes from a central bank. And what's happened in the last six years, the price of gold has almost doubled which means the dollar has gone down 50%. So the dollar crash has already happened. Nobody noticed because the way, because they don't look at the right yardstick. They're looking at the euro dollar cross rate. You have to look at the price of gold and the price of gold has almost doubled. Uh, it actually did double uh, as of last August um, in the last five years, which means the dollar went down 50%. So the dollar crash already happened. It's just a lot of people weren't paying attention. Uh, and the last thing, uh, Harry's kind of banging the table about gold going down in the immediate aftermath of Lehman Brothers. Yeah, it did. It also did uh, last February when the stock market crash started. The stock market crashed 32.1% between late February and late March. That always happens. It has nothing to do with gold. It has to do with the fact that if you're if you're a leveraged stock trader, and most of the, first of all, 95% of the stock trading is, is robots. So it's not you against somebody else who disagrees with you. It's you versus the robots. So the way to figure it out is, figure out the programming, the algorithms in the robots and front run the algorithms. But these, um, when stock markets crash and, and leveraged investors get margin calls, when you're in distress, you don't sell what you want, you sell what you can. And gold is highly liquid, you can always sell it. So what happens is the hedge funds and others sell gold to get cash to meet the margin calls on the stocks that they're losing. And that's why gold goes down in the immediate aftermath of a crash. But it's a very short lived period. I always, cherry picking like a 30 day drawdown. And, and, and that is the data, yeah, Harry's right about that, but that's about a 30 day window. What happens is the weak hands puke the gold to get cash to meet the margin holes, but the strong hands sit there and they wait and they wait until the last weak hand you know, pukes it and then they buy it and then it goes up from there. And that, so the, the, the gold went down, you know, running from mommy or whatever Harry said in the wake of a stock market crash. It's true for about 30 days, and but sophisticated gold investors know you just wait 30 days and then come in at the bottom and buy it up. Hey, real quick, Greg. I mean, I, Jim, I hate to say, it. you're describing disinflation, falling inflation, not deflation. Deflation is negative inflation, falling prices. We only saw that for a flash in 2008 before they printed so much money. And you're saying you're admitting money printing doesn't cause inflation. Well, tell right. that to the people buying gold because the people buying gold were following the money printing saying it's going to cause inflation and gold went from 1934 to 1050 in several months from late um, 2008 in, 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 I mean, 15 into uh, 15, I'm sorry, in the 15, late 2015, because there was no inflation. So tell people that people are expecting that. I agree with you. It doesn't cause it unless the money goes into spending and business and consumer spending. It will not cause inflation. And but that's my point. That's, but that's my, that's, my, that's my point, Harry. For the last 10 years, the, the money printing has not gone into borrowing. It has not gone into consumption. No, I, I, agree with, gone into I, agree with, I agree with you. I agree with you. But you're taking the last 10 years and projecting the next 10 years. The next 10 years no, are going to be I'm just projecting the next 10 years. Different. When all these different. 525 different. This is, of assets deflate and destroy money so fast, you couldn't print it fast enough. But Harry, you haven't, you haven't explained. The way, and, Harry, you haven't explained. And, Harry, Harry, yes, Harry, you keep, and, and you you keep say, yelling, it's deflated. You, you don't, don't know explain how it deflates. You don't hey, know how it deflates, Harry. Listen to me, but you say the solution is to inflate your currency. They've been trying to do that for this whole time, for 12 years, and they can't do it. They well, can't inflate it. They printed $30 trillion. What's it going to take? 100? You're saying it doesn't cause it. You say inflate the currency. There is no choice to inflate the currency. Deflation is the only way to take out this unproductive asset. And by the way, Jim, you're wrong about workforce growth. That is my inflation indicator. I invented it in 1989. It's worked like a charm. 
We've seen lower inflation with slowing workforce growth. We haven't seen declining workforce growth. Now, if you look at workforce growth, who's got the lowest inflation of the major countries? Japan at zero. Who's who that? Oh, Europe, 1%. We're average 2%. That's because the differences in workforce growth and Japan hasn't let their economy slow down enough. They keep stimulating it at three times the rate we do to keep deflation at bay. We have not seen deflation, Jim. When we do, it's exactly what you said. It's gonna be the most painful thing we've experienced since the 30s. The stock markets don't know what it is. People don't know what it is and they're gonna get their ass kicked. And, and the only grace about this from history is it's going to happen so fast and it's going to change things so fast we get thrown into crisis and we end up hopefully doing the right thing instead of just printing more money as if it would work anyway. Jim, well, here's, the, here's, here's the thing, Harry. Screaming is not a form of analysis. Let me explain this to you. You said we have to deflate the debt. You never said how you deflate the debt. There are only two ways. It you can... failed. It oh, failed. Okay. 62% failed in 30. Okay, so, so you don't want to do that. Something happened to Harry there. Um, he's, he's muted. He's, he's muted. <laughs> what to me? I'm, a, I'm good on technology, but I'm not that good. So. Yeah, I think you, I did that purposely. <laughs> Harry, you're muted. You're muted, but I'm going to give Jim a chance to answer. Yeah, well, if, if, if Harry's right, and as I said, there are only two ways to get rid of this debt. We do have to get rid of it, but there are only two ways. You can default or you can inflate. So I think, I think we agree on that. Uh, we're going to inflate, um, not because of central bank money printing, but because of the demographic wave. I, I just don't understand how Larry can, uh, uh, Harry can agree that the workforce is declining, which it is, but that doesn't drive wages up. And that's just a simple supply. We have fewer laborers, fewer workers in a world of lower productivity because of aging. They're going to be in a very good position to demand higher wages. They're going to get the higher wages. They're smart enough to know that the, the wage increases have to be greater than inflation or else it's not a real wage increase. And that's going to drive inflation even further. And that will melt the debt, in effect, because the, the nominal value of the debt will still be there, but the dollar will be worth less. It'll easier, be easier to pay. If Harry's right, and the way out is to default, what, on the United States Treasury? You want to default on the U.S. Treasury, Harry? Is that the idea? I think Harry's muted still. So um, sorry, Jim. Um, you don't deflate the government debt. It didn't deflate in the 30s. The private debt is three to one to government debt in the first place. And that's what's deflates. The only thing that gets the government out is once you deflate and, and take all these burdens off consumers and businesses of unproductive debt that's weighing everything down, the economy grows faster again. It was, will never grow as fast as it did in the 50s and stuff, but because demographics is weak. Yeah, but just to be clear, when you say that, that helps the debt ratios go down. Yeah, but, when you, but just to be clear, when you say deflate the debt, you mean default. Default. That's okay, exactly. default. Okay, default. Okay, yeah. Well, that's not, right, that's not going to happen. Is there any other way to do it? How else do yeah, you deflate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, actually, there, there is. Take half as much. That, that's yeah, Puerto there, Rico's approach down here, by the way. Yeah, there, there, is, there is another way to do it, Harry. It's the way we've done throughout history, which is inflation. Mm. How do you create inflation when we 30 trillion money printing hasn't created any inflation? Because hands printed more than anybody. I did, but I, well, I explained it. I explained it three times, but I don't mind doing it a fourth time. When I didn't get it, Jim. Zero inflation. In, in, well, why don't you listen for a second, Henry? How do they okay, inflate? Just, they printed more well, than anybody. Well, I, I said the central banks can't do it, but I also said there are other factors, psychological factors, behavioral adaptive behavior factors that will cause the inflation. I've said it three times. I'll say it a fourth time take notes, which is that when the labor force declines, wages go up. That's inflationary. Not when it's a depression, not when it's in, because of a down economy. Yes, long term, that could happen, but not in a crisis. It's starting now. Mm. Gentlemen, I'll, I'll keep it moving because I've got many other questions for you. The, there's a vaccine been rolled out for COVID, which is now going around the world. Do you believe this vaccine will solve the pandemic problem? Um, will this then lead to a quick fix for the economy? Or do you believe that we're in for a long, a long hangover? I'll get to you first, Jim. Yeah, first of all, it's not a vaccine. It's uh, it's genetic modification. It's a, it's a gene therapy. It's kind of like chemotherapy for people who don't have cancer. Uh, so uh, so I wouldn't call it a vaccine. But it's out there, and we don't know the side effects. That's a long-term thing. We don't know 
um, if it's potent against new variants or strains of the virus, hopefully it is. Uh, it, if, you, if you get this um, gene therapy, this genetically modified, uh, it's experimental by the way, so it's experimental genetic therapeutic. If you get a, a jab, you get a needle of it, um, you're, you, uh, you're not, first of all, you're not immune to COVID. You can get COVID. It's just that it will suppress the symptoms. So your experience could be better, although for most people, it's not that bad. You're still contagious. You can still transmit it to others. So um, it, it does have some beneficial effects. It could have a lot of side effects, may or may not be potent against um, the new strains, but it doesn't really matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because the, uh, the psychological effects are going to be with us for 30 years, meaning let's just say all the restaurants open up, okay? Um, that'll be a slow process, but let's just say they do. The ones that survive, not counting the 50% that are out of business where the job losses are permanent, the leases defaulted, the equipment set for sale and fire sale prices, and those people are never getting their jobs back. Leave them aside and look at the half, let's say, that actually do reopen. It doesn't mean people are going to run right out to restaurants. They're afraid. Uh, they've been kind of, you know, bludgeoned by the government and the neo-fascists like uh, Andrew Cuomo and Gavin Newsom, who basically have got everyone so afraid and you know not everyone's a scientist not everyone's can study the immunology they just know they've been told to be in the house for the past year it doesn't mean they're going to run right out the first chance they get mm -hmm. eric yeah i think you've already seen most of the recovery because you had a big hit to spending businesses and consumers businesses were failing and 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 they just gave everybody money consumers business everybody, and they just spent it somewhere a lot of business just paid people to do nothing which by the way that's what they do in japan uh, all the time um, to cover over deflation and stuff. So, so I think you've already seen most of the recovery, even when the vaccine maybe starts to work increasingly. Let's say you do get something like herd immunity by at best, and that's when I might, might be able to come to Australia, okay? That's a long time between now and then. I think the economy is gonna collapse before then. I think it's ready to collapse now, and, and, and I love Jeremy Grantham, finally have somebody agreeing with me on that, that this bubble just can't go much further no matter what they do, because it's just hit that diminishing returns point and that euphoria point where everybody's going to invest is in, and then it turns the other way and there's no way to stop it. So I think that this is an illusion by the markets on crack. Markets are always going to look for the reason to go up. It'll go down for a week and they'll say, oh, but it's really good because, oh, they're going to have to print more money or something's going to happen. No, that's not what happens. You know, you have to pay the pipe at some point. The point I'm trying to make, and we haven't seen it yet, and when we see it, it'll, it'll become obvious. If we see it, and I do think we're going to see it, when deflation really sets in, it's this spiral you can't stop. Okay, debts start to fail and then businesses start to fail and that causes banks start to fail and they both lay off people and then people spend less and then that causes more businesses and banks and loans. But it, that's what happened in the 30s. This thing spiraled down so quick. That's how 62, now that's a fact, 62% of private debt right out of Dalio's chart disappeared in a matter of, of, of most of that in a few years and that, how do you fight that with inflation? There is no inflation to fight that. There is no money printing. There's no trick to fight that once that avalanche starts happening. See, they, everything's been to keep that at. Don't let the market go down too much. Don't let the economy slow too much. And, and they were really heroic on this. It's all to keep the avalanche from starting. Once it starts, and I'm just suggesting this, we'll see if it's right later. Once it starts, I say there's no stopping it. And then deflation will be everything Jim and I have been talking about. It's the people should fear deflation more than infl hyperinflation and deflation are the two worst scenarios, not yeah. high Harry, inflation like in the 70s or moderate Harry, inflation. Harry, Harry has a very truncated view of the Great Depression. A lot of what he just described is an accurate description of the period from 1929 to 1932. The stock market did go down 89.2%. There was 25% unemployment, massive debt. So Harry's right about that, bank failures, et cetera. What he's missing, in the middle of the Great Depression, gold went up 75%. It went up from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. And it was gold was your best performing asset. Homestake mining was the best performing asset on the New York Stock Exchange in the middle of the Great Depression. And we had two technical recessions in the Great Depression. If you say Great Depression, 1929 to 1940, I think that's generally accepted. Uh, we had two recessions, 1929 to 1933, 
and then again 1937 and 1938. But the period from 1933 to 1936 was a period of high growth. 1933 was one of the best years in the history of the stock market, but that's because FDR devalued the dollar and the gold went up 75% from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. So you can have inflation and you can have growth in the middle of a depression, but you do it by raising the price of gold. Hmm. Thanks, Jim. Now, Jim. One thing, Greg, real quick. This yeah. is important to understand. We've already been in this depression phase. They've been fighting it with money printing. I'm saying the depression is going to be over in two to three years. I say I agree. Gold will come out of this strong and gold will boom for a long time into the next 30 year cycle, into the whole growth of Asia. So I'm not saying I'm just saying the next two to three years is going to be the, the backside 29 to 32 instead of the front side. We already had the front side GFC like the 37, 38. That's the difference. This thing's going to be over. The demographics get better after that in, in a lot of countries. And gold will be a huge beneficiary of clearing out this debt and growing again, especially because Asia is going to be, be the big growth area. And Asians love gold. Jim, I'm not saying gold it's, really, it's, really a, it's really a mistake. It's really a mistake to talk about Asia. I've been there. It's a big place. Uh, I think uh, you will see a bullish case and you will see growth in India and certain parts of Southeast Asia. China will be- well, That's what I said. Well, no, you said- That's what I said before. Southeast no, Harry, Asia and India is no longer gonna be Chinese. I, no, Harry, I just, no, I said that. You said I Asia. You said, you said Asia is gonna be growth period. I said, no. India and Southeast Asia, yes. China and Japan, no. So you can't generalize about Asia. Um, Jim, uh, you've said that gold will reach 15,000 US an ounce in the coming years. I saw that on the video. Yep. Today, it's about 1,800. So what's your forecast now? Do, is 15,000 a bit far-fetched in the coming years? No, it, it sounds far-fetched, but it, it isn't really, because again, I, I, like, I, say I like to stick to sixth grade math. Here's what people don't understand. So let's just take 2,000 for a round number. I know it's 1,800, and I know that's you know a little bit away, but just take 2,000 for a round number. To get from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce is a 50% increase. That's a big jump. That's a, that's a high hurdle. But to get from $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase. That's like one week's volatility. What people miss is they focus on the $1,000 an ounce. And yeah, that's a big deal. If you have an ounce of gold or 100 ounces of gold or whatever, if you have an ounce of gold and exactly $1,000 an ounce, you made $1,000. So that's real money. Good for you. But the point is, as you get to progressively higher levels, the same dollar increase is a smaller percentage increase because the denominator is larger. So unless you, unless you want to compute it logarithmically. So the point is, yeah, right now, getting from 2,000 to 3,000, that's, again, you got to be a, a high jumper. But as you get to higher levels, each $1,000 increment is going to be easier than the one before. Going from three to four is a 33% gain. Going from four to five is a 25% gain. Going from 14 to 15 is only a 7% gain. In other words, what happens is it starts out slowly, but then it goes hyperbolic. Those gains come very easily at the end because they're smaller. It's the same thousand bucks, but they're smaller percentage gains. So that's why the curve steepens dramatically. All the more reason to get in now when those big gains are ahead of you. Don't jump in at 14,000 and catch the tail end. Mm. Harry, what's your thoughts on the future of I'll golf? I'll say the same thing I've said before. It's impossible to create high inflation. The demographics and high debt all argue for low inflation to deflation in the years ahead. I don't see how you create enough inflation to get gold to 12 to 15,000. Now, what I would see is possible, what Jim said, if the collapse was severe enough, which I do see, by the way, obviously, is that if people said, well, wait a minute, we got to have some standard here and it ain't going to be Bitcoin. Maybe 10, 20 years, it ain't going to be Bitcoin, okay? It's the most volatile asset on earth. And by the way, gold's almost as volatile as stock. So it's not a stable asset in these days either. But if they came to the conclusion, we got to have a standard now and gold became it, then that would be the case for gold going up uh, for some period of time. But that's going to come at the end of the crash. I'm trying to protect people here. I'm just going to be really honest. For the next two to three years, what I call the crash of a lifetime um, on a 90 year cycle, that's the most potent. You've got to get through this, preserve your assets. And if you're in deflation friendly investments like long term treasuries 
um, stuff. You can make money to have more money to invest at bargain prices in the best places. And it will, I'm sorry, I did say before, crystal clear, China's done. East Asia's had its boom. It is Southeast Asia and India, and there's more people in that part of Asia than the others. And it doesn't mean the other ones go bankrupt. They just don't grow as much. So you can still have, Asia is going to dominate the economy. I'll stand by that one because that's pure demographics. U.S. is plateauing. Europe is dying. East Asia is dying as fast as Europe, including China. China's going to go from one point for some billion down to 1 billion by the end of this century. So even China is gonna be deflating. So I don't say you create high inflation, but if gold became a standard again, that would be a reason. No, but Harry, you, you, go, you go from declining population to deflation without pausing for breath. How does the declining workforce, how is that, how is the declining workforce deflationary? That's inflationary because you're gonna to have to pay higher wages to get fewer people to do the job. No, because no, people are spending less money. They're less productive. Productivity rises into the early 40s. Spending rises in the mid to late 40s and early 50s if you're more wealthy. Those things create you know, rising trends and money velocity and stuff it's like called that. Inflation. Workforce growth means fewer people earning money and fewer people spending as much no, money. I mean, I mean workforce, workforce growth, growth slows because people get older, no, older. No, people Harry, come on. Work Harry, so Harry, work, I'm just Harry, you, Jim, this is 100%. My best indicator is my inflation indicator. It is workforce growth and negative workforce growth would be deflationary. Now, we'll why? test it out. Why? 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 If, you have negative, if you have a negative workforce growth, you have to pay more people to show up. They, they get higher no, wages. Not, not when people are spending less money because you're in a depression with 25 you just said that You just said they're spending more money. I mean, the, 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 old, the older demographic, they, people don't save when they're 80. They spend what they have. So the older demographic means just saving more money spending. But they have and, less. And, and let me finish. Let me finish. And a smaller workforce means you have to pay people more because you don't have as many people, so they can demand higher wages. So I agree that there's fewer people. people spending money. You have, we just said there's more people spending money. They're just older. They're 80 year old. They're, they're 80 years the old. They're, people spending money right now is the government's giving it to them, and rich people are getting. I'm not uh, talking about demands them. No, no. Until that stops. People do not. Now I'm not talking forever, but but it is true. It's not making sense, Harry. It's just not. It's just not making sense. Everywhere in the world, even in the high growth rates like in, in I said, I said, they, I said, they, I said, they, I said, they, I said that growth was going to slow. We agree on that. The population is going to go down, and growth is going to slow, and that's going to be inflationary because wages are going to go up. And if you have higher wages and less output, then, then that's almost the definition of inflation. Hmm. Look, my next question is going to start with you, Jim, and because Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is a big subject at the moment, and over the last 12 months, we've seen enormous growth and Bitcoin's last night reaching 50,000. We're seeing companies like um, Tesla, Facebook, Apple, PayPal, large life insurance companies joining in on this asset class. Jim, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, this subject is becoming the elephant in the room. Will Bitcoin hurt gold? You have mentioned over the last year that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are not sustainable. You said it will hit the brick wall. You have painted a very great picture for this currency. Do you still believe this? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is basically garbage. If, if you want to buy it, you know, knock yourself out. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it, it's junk. Now you, now you can say, well, why is it going up? Well, it's uh, it's like any other bubble. Just look at a chart. It looks like every other bubble. It looks like the Nikkei in 1989. It looks like the Nasdaq in 1999. Uh, it just has bubble dynamics. But what people don't understand is the extent of the fraud in the Bitcoin price. A couple of things. First of all, gold Bitcoin is trivial relative to gold. There's about one trillion of market cap in Bitcoin uh, versus twenty-four trillion dollars of market cap in gold. So uh, that's not counting gold miners and paper gold and other forms of gold, et cetera. So it, it, it's it's the market's tiny. But here's what's driving Bitcoin. There's something called Tether. Uh, Tether was just um, basically uh, there was a, there was a settlement yesterday uh, with the New York State Attorney General where Tether admitted fraud, paid a fine. Uh, but here's what's going on with Tether. So Tether says they call themselves a stable coin, meaning you give them a dollar, they give you a Tether, and they say one Tether equals one dollar. Uh, okay, so where, uh, so you get your Tether. Why do people want the Tether? Well, they're using it in exchanges, not some of the, the couple of the more reputable exchanges, which do not accept Tether, by the way, but there are all kinds of exchanges around the world that don't have any money laundering rules, don't have know your customer rules, they're not regulated, et cetera. 
and people are using the tether to go buy Bitcoin. Sometimes they offer leverage, et cetera, and they're bidding up the price of Bitcoin. Now, just to kind of take that in reverse. So what happens when um, people want to sell the Bitcoin for tether and then cash in the tether for the dollars? Where are the dollars? There's no evidence that they have the dollars. In fact, they don't. They just kind of print tether as it goes along. This is the greatest Ponzi in history. It makes Bernie Madoff look like a, a prudent banker. Um, people are too naive to understand what's going on. This is happening in, you know, I don't know, teenagers in Africa on cell phones or whatever, uh, or Asia, or, or probably millennials in the United States, et cetera. But the point is, uh, it's it's not worth anything. I try buying a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, you can't do it. Um, and there used to be one coffee shop in Brooklyn they always pointed to. They said, you can go buy coffee there, but I think it's boarded up now. Uh, so you can't spend it. It's an open-ended speculation. If you like it, go for it, be my guest. But it's it's a, it's a, a, a fantastic Ponzi scheme being driven by the fraud in Tether. And if you want to buy Bitcoin, take you know, do your homework and study what's going on in Tether. Look at where the Bitcoin purchases come from. They come from Tether. They don't come from hard dollars. And Tether says they take the hard dollars and and they back it up. But they don't. They've never shown their bank account. They they claim to have more dollars, and their bank is in the Bahamas. But the number they claim, which has never been audited and never been visible is greater than the combined dollar banking assets of the total Bahamian banking system by a factor of 10. So you tell me where the dollars are. They're, they're long gone. Uh, they're being skimmed off by the, by the billions and these people are going to be left hung out to dry. So uh, as we say in New Jersey, enjoy. Well, Jim, you've taken a machete to the Bitcoin. I love it. Okay. Harry, what are your thoughts? The, I'm down here with a bunch of crypto people in Puerto Rico, for <laughs> obvious reason. They love paying no taxes on, on super high short-term gains in, in, a, in, like you say, a speculative kind of Ponzi-like thing. The insiders say, and, and this is what I see as potential, but not proven, the play in Bitcoin, it's never going to produce anything. It buy stuff with it. It's kind of stupid. Is to build it up, like Jim was saying earlier, gold could get up to a certain level of value to be a backing for currencies, Okay. They want Bitcoin to replace gold as a backing for currencies, and it has to get accepted enough. It's only at 2%, 3% uh, US adoption and 1% global. So, so it could get a lot more, and they fixed the price to kind of force that, which is kind of weird, but that's what they're doing. They want it to come accepted enough that it can become a standard, and, and Bitcoin could become worth 10 or $20 trillion and rival gold in that. And by the way, I got numbers more like 11 trillion dollars on gold and it is right about one trillion i may be wrong about gold but that's what i got um blockchain is different blockchain actually is software that deals with financial assets in the real world of the internet and stuff and that has potential but none of these companies are profitable like the dot com so so that's why i think bitcoin is going to collapse it may or may not survive and become that standard but that's the game it's not to say Bitcoin, and anybody I know that in the Bitcoin, they think it's going to go up forever to a million dollars. They wouldn't dare buy anything with it, even if you could, because the, the great story in the crypto community is the guy that bought the first pizza on it, and it cost him $42 million, you know, three years later. So, so, so it, it is kind of insane, but it is an early stage industry. Now, I do think real quick, Gold should be performing. Even I was predicting it would go up to $2,200 in the early stage of this crash. It is underperforming, and it's because of a, a misperception. I, as I said earlier, I think gold investors think money printing does automatically create inflation, like Milton Friedman kind of thing. And, and then when, when inflation didn't come, that's why gold had its first crash. Um, there's the perception that Bitcoin is an inflation. I literally listened to Paul Tudor Jones at the Tony Robbins Platt conference, I think, at every year. Come out and say, he is buying Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. I'm like, what? It's not an inflation hedge. Gold is a legitimate. And even commodities and real estate are inflation at hard assets. It, it is not an inflation hedge, but there is that perception. And I hear more and more people on CNBC, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, you, we're using this as an inflation hedge, which means they're substituting it for gold. That is an error. And that is another reason I think Bitcoin's going to go down 95% before we see if it survives or not. If it does survive, and Ethereum and some of the more real companies like blockchain, I would consider investing them as new tech companies. Uh, but, but Bitcoin is a huge question mark, but it's not 
about producing something. It is about becoming a standard that may or that that's unproven. It could happen. I could see it happening, but it is unproven. Yeah, I mean, block, blockchain technology has been around since the 1980s. It's kind of boring, but it has nothing to do with um, uh, so-called cryptocurrencies. And by the way, um, this idea I hear a lot, you know, Bitcoin will replace the dollars, the global reserve asset, all that stuff. It's nonsense. What people don't understand is that currencies are not global reserve assets. The assets are securities denominated in a currency. So you go to China, they have $1.4 trillion in treasury notes and bills. And they do, but they don't have you know pallets of dollars, printed dollars stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They have securities, which by the way are a digital form. The original cryptocurrency is the US dollar. It hasn't been issued, in, treasury securities haven't been issued in paper form since 1980. Uh, and uh, so it's a completely digital ledger. The message traffic is encrypted. So your dollar is your best uh, cryptocurrency. But, um, but the reason that Bitcoin will never be a reserve asset, it's not because there's no form of money there. I guess you can say Bitcoin's a form of money. It's because there's no bond market. There's no Bitcoin bond market. There are no securities to invest in and there never will be. And here's why. Because the reason people say it's an inflation hedge is because the, the amount of Bit Bitcoin is capped, which shows that really good applied mathematicians and developers don't understand anything about monetary economics because your economy keeps growing. Now, the complaint about central banks is that they grow the money faster than the economy, and that's a legitimate complaint. But you at least have to grow the money supply to keep pace with the economy. If you don't, then each unit of money, and Bitcoin's capped at, I think, 21 million coins. We're getting there. We're never going to get to 21 million because you need more electric power than the, like the sun to mine the last Bitcoin. So you're going to get you're going to run out of new Bitcoin sooner or later. But if you fit, if the amount of currency is fixed and the economy keeps going up, each unit of currency buys more and more goods. And that's why they think that the value is going to go up and has so far. But here's the point. Why would you, that's deflationary. When, when the value of money goes up, that's deflationary. Why would you borrow money in a deflationary currency? You would owe more than you borrowed borrowers love inflationary currencies because they get to pay back less. Now, in a perfect world, there'd be no inflation or deflation, but you're never going to have a Bitcoin bond market because you're never going to have a borrower dumb enough to borrow in a currency that only goes up. And if you don't have the securities market, you're not going to have a reserve currency. So again, it's just, it's gambling. I prefer roulette because you, you get a nice drink and you can enjoy the ambiance, but it's, it's kind of a joke. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for your views. I'm just going to ask Jim for you just to give your closing remarks and Harry will take on after that. And Jim, can you say to us as you're signing off, does, does gold still win? Uh, well, actually, gold never wins or loses because it's an element, it's atomic number 79. It's, uh, it is what it is. If you have a gold coin and you put it in a drawer, and you go away for a year and you come back and open the drawer, you got one gold coin. It didn't multiply itself. So what happens is the, the dollar price of gold goes up or it goes down. You know, you got different forecasts. But when that happens, nothing happens to gold. It tells you something about the dollar. It's kind of like when you have a patient, the first thing a diagnostician or a doctor does is you take the, you take the uh, patient's temperature and you just stick a thermometer in your mouth and now you just kind of scan your forehead or whatever. But you take the, the patient's temperature to see if they're sick. And the dollar price of gold is the temperature of the dollar. So when, when the dollar price of gold goes up, all that's really, ha nothing's happening to gold. It's just the dollar is getting weaker. When the dollar price of gold goes down, nothing's happening to gold. It's just that the dollar is getting stronger. So fluctuation in the dollar price of gold really tells you more about the dollar than it does about gold. And so if, if you say to me, is gold gonna win? Yeah, gold's gonna win uh, a lot. But what it really means is the dollar is going to collapse. So $10,000 gold, and that is my forecast. I think it actually would be higher, but I'm comfortable saying $10,000 gold uh, or higher. That's my forecast. Um, that's not a big win if you're a gold holder, because what really happened was the, the value of the dollar collapsed. You, and, but the reason to have gold is because it protects all of your other assets. In the world of $10,000 gold is the world where everything else has crashed. Uh, and so the gold will preserve your wealth. So yeah, gold's going to go up a lot. It's going to go up for the, a lot for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, I've never seen a debate where Harry and I agree on everything except the outcome. We agree on demographics. We agree on declining workforce. We agree on lower productivity and lower growth. Uh, some countries will do better than others. I think India is going to be a winner. I think we agree on that. Harry and I agree on a lot of things. 
The one thing we don't agree on is the one thing where all the science, history, and mathematics support me, which is that when you have a reduced workforce, you get higher wages, and that's inflationary, and that's going to drive the price of gold much higher. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for being with us. Much appreciated. It was a wonderful debate. And uh, we'll see you another time. I'm just going to cross to Harry now. Harry, to close off and uh, move on to the rest of the program, over to you. You know, I think the most important point of this debate and why I like it, and I was looking forward to it, because, I mean, I, I, have, to, I, I have debated a lot of gold uh, and inflation, um, people that have that view of where things are going. And, and what I don't like about it is it, it's like a religion. You know, it's not facts. I and mean, and stuff. So, so I, I feel like Jim has that view. He's not a religion. He's just looking at it from a logical point of view and saying, here's how this could work out. What's important here is we have something here. Yes, we've had 90 year super bubbles before. Yeah, we've had demographic booms and but we've had all these things. We've never seen governments, central banks in particular, hijack the economy and take over the free market system. They took it over. They set short-term rates and long-term rates and all risk assets are set against that 10-year treasury bond, real estate, stocks, everything. It's crazy that they've done this. And so I, I look at it and say, well, okay, because of the financial asset bubble and the debt bubble, I know that when those fall apart on the private side, and that is all private stuff, most of it, that that causes deflation. So that's what I'm looking to protect investors against and make money on. But I think the most important point again is this is unprecedented what's happened. There is no way to fully gauge this. And again, I'm sitting there changing my, I'm telling my own subscribers gold could go to 2200 this year and I'm having to back off because the Bitcoin investors are so stupid. They think it's gold, like gold. Now, Stupid is stupid, okay? And, and, and I hate to say a lot of gold investors that thought just because they're printing money, Jim doesn't say that, but a lot of gold investors think, oh, it's got to cause inflation and it doesn't. So, so I'm looking at, listen to everything you've heard here today. Inflation, deflation, that is the most important. Booms and busts are easier. The difference between an inflationary crisis and a deflationary is harder to determine. They both happen in history and they both uh, favor very different investments. Bonds, good deflation, gold, good inflation, and a lot of other iterations. So as this unfolds, I already just changed my mind a little bit on gold short term by seeing how it plays out. Of course, I'm managing a fund in Australia now. What's we're going to be looking for? As this plays out, look at these arguments you've heard today. What caused inflation, deflation, and monetary velocity? And I'm big on money velocity all this stuff. And as it plays out, you can shift and say, well, wait a minute, is it playing more like this and the bonds are doing better or is it playing more or something happening? And, and yes, like I do agree with what you said. If, if one of the outcomes was, my God, we have to have a standard and the only one left is gold and it's not the US dollar. And certain, again, not even a chance on Bitcoin, by the way, but, but uh, that would change things and I would react differently. OK, so so I, I think that's the way we all need to see this. We've laid out the types of things that can happen. And I'm telling you, you're not going to get this clear a layout because I've debated too many other people. Um, I, I'm not going to mention names, but there's people I do nothing but fact correct because they're not they're not looking at history and what actually happened. They're looking at ideology and, and something. It's, and people love that. It's like, oh, you know, if you print too much money, then then then, you know, you get punished by inflation and debase your currency and just happen. Okay, and, and that does happen, but it doesn't always happen. So that's the way I would walk away from this. We've heard a lot here today and, and you're not gonna hear much more than this. I'm, I'm just telling you that because I've covered the whole field and listened to everybody and debate a lot of people. You've heard, I think the best two sides of this story from people that are into facts and logic and not ideology and making Bitcoin, talk about a religion I'm down here in crypto land, okay? <laughs> Bitcoin, you know, a, a religion. And, and, and so you'll be able to play this better no matter how it comes. And that's the way I'm looking at it. I have my scenarios all the time, but I'm also changing them as this evolves because nobody's going to figure this out 100%. This is the doozy, the, the wild card of all history from what I can see. Harry, would you help me introduce the next speaker? Yeah. 
Okay, I'm very happy to introduce Sean Allison. I've been touring with him until I couldn't last year for years now. He is our most popular speaker when we have these conferences and stuff. He is a very serious and accomplished trader in options. And you know what people think when they hear options? Oh, options, oh, that's risky. Oh, that's crazy. You know, they almost think like Bitcoin or something. No, smart people, the smartest money, use options to reduce risk because you can target them and, 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 and limit your risk on both up and down and everything. So the key is in a time like this, and what have you heard today? You've heard two people say, you're going to see one way or the other, inflation or deflation, boom, bust. You're going to see a lot of volatility in the years ahead. This isn't going to be like the 80s or the 90s, or the, and certainly not the 50s and 60s, a stable, booming economy. One of the things you can do is allocate some of your assets to a trading system that can do well in up or down markets, inflation or deflation, because it is a system that's proven and has a track record and that sort of thing. So, so all I know is, is Sean is our most popular speaker in the investment arena. Uh, people are happy. I, I've never heard anybody unhappy with his service. And, and so I beg you to stay and listen to him. And, and again, get a view of, oh, oh, how can options be used and see that this is not, it is a higher return potential, but it's not a high risky roller coaster type of system. The whole point of the system is to get higher returns without as high a risk. And Sean is very good at that. So with that, I open it up to Sean. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much, Harry. I really appreciate that, my friend, and uh, fantastic to hear your uh, debate there with Jim. Incredible content there. I think you would have to agree, everyone, the fact that uh, they've laid out their separate cases and very compelling both ways. Now, certainly right now and in 2020, let's go back just a little while. In 2020, it was my most successful year financially ever in the markets. In fact, last year in 2020, we literally created millionaires from what unfolded. Now, it's not because we're, you know, I'm some sort of a genius. It's just the fact that I have a unique skill set. I understand how to make money, whether the markets go up or down. And very importantly, right now, there are incredible opportunities that are unfolding as we speak. Uh, silver is one of those that uh, I am trading right now, not silver itself, but actually silver mining stocks. In the last week, I have made a 41% return on one particular silver miner that I used options on. 41% in a week. Not only did I make 41% in a week and my members, but we were able to cash flow that silver stock as well. So what you've got to understand is the ability for you to try and predict what's going to happen in the markets. It's near impossible. No one knows longer term what is going to happen. What I am doing right now is I am cash flowing without silver, for example, having to even move. Do you realize that there are very legitimate, safe strategies that can generate you cash flow from silver, from gold, from Bitcoin without actually owning it? This is very important. Now, do I own some gold and some silver? Yes, but most of my income comes from actually not owning it. I'm not interested in owning Bitcoin, um, in particular, and I'll show you exactly what I do with that a little bit later. What I want to be able to do is cash flow Bitcoin without the risks of actually owning it itself. Personally, do I think that it will go much higher before we see a large move down? Yes. Right now with Bitcoin, there's only about 1% of institutions that actually own Bitcoin. We'll talk a bit more about this later. So the potential for Bitcoin to go much higher from here is certainly there. But then you've got to understand that there is a huge risk of a dramatic pullback, even a crash in Bitcoin, okay? Before it could then maybe move higher again. So what I'm interested in is cash flowing gold, silver, Bitcoin, and different uh, you know, equities within the market without actually owning them. 
this is a very unique skill set that I believe everyone can start doing right now and start making an incredible amount of money. These are some of the strategies and techniques that we used in 2020 to make people literally millionaires. So I'm talking about specifically what we did in 2020. So it's not just lip service. Sean, what did you actually do? And I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. Two things that I live by. People lie, numbers don't. So I want to be able to look at the numbers. The other thing I live by is to look at people's actions. Don't just listen to what they say. So for me, it's about the actions that you've taken. And what are the numbers telling me? So we're going to look at those things in a moment. But what I want to be able to do is give you my viewpoint about what's going on right now, uh, my viewpoints on gold, silver, and Bitcoin, how to cash flow those, and set up long-term positions that can make you a lot of money without necessarily owning them, uh, in particular Bitcoin. So we'll talk about that in a moment, but we are witnessing a massive transfer of wealth. The people that have money are getting richer. The people that don't have a lot of money are becoming poorer. And it always seems to be in, in a crisis like we have now, probably more of a financial crisis than anything else, that the small uh, player or the, you know, the little guy always seems to get crushed. What I wanna be able to do is show you how you can get on the right side of this wealth transfer. It is only just the beginning. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And really, I want to get you to a point where you're not just relying on your business, on your employer as your only source of income. Very, very important that you're able to do that. So what I want to be able to do, please get a pen and paper. I'm actually going to show you a skill set here that you can start implementing right now in 2021 to make incredible amounts of money like we just did in 2020. So a little bit about me, it's not really about me, we'll go through this quickly, I don't really like talking about myself, but I've been doing this now for just over 20 years. This is something that I do full time. I have been able to create an incredible lifestyle from doing this, but more importantly, I've been able to get members results. People that I've taken from complete beginners to teaching them this relatively simple skill set and be able to start making money quickly. Some of our members here that you're seeing here right now. Now, talk is cheap. The ability to be able to prove what you do live is very important. And this is something that I've been able to do live on stages throughout the world. In fact, in London at the Excel Center, I was able to trade live in front of 2000 people. I chose a volunteer from the audience, brought them up on stage and actually showed them how to do this. We traded live on stage with real money in front of 2000 people. We made $1,952 live on stage and I gave the volunteer the money. So I've been able to do this over and over and over again. A lot of people are good at talking, but not a lot of people are good at actually delivering when it actually counts in a real life situation. I do this for a living. This is not a game to me. I'm semi-retired these days. I don't go and uh, talk on stages anymore, but I wanna be able to at least show people a different way of making income with what's happening right now. I think in the past, being able to make money from home was a nice skill to be able to have. I think now though, that is an absolute critical skill that you must be able to have. So I've been able to do this, uh, you know, for over 10 years, I traveled the world, uh, demonstrating this live on stage with real money. But now semi retired these days, I just want to help people that really want to do this. And for me, uh, it's something that I know works because I've been doing it for 20 years. And I've been teaching people how to do it for the last 10 years. But it's all about results. So I want to be able to show you guys how I get these type of results for people that are complete beginners and even some of our members that are extremely uh, experienced, how you're able to start generating cash flow in these volatile markets. With what I do, I love volatility, absolutely love it because it enables us to make a huge amount of money. So Sean, what were you doing uh, back in late February, the 24th of February, right? Let's go to the actual chart here. The 24th of February, when the market started to implode, right? Around a 30, 35% fall from this high here. 
What was I actually doing here? Well, I'm going to show you that in just a moment. In fact, let me show it to you right now. Before I show you what we're actually doing, I need you to understand a little bit of basics here. So pen and paper here, just write down these basics and then I can show you how we made so much money in 2020 and how we're already doing it again in 2021. We're going to utilize one of the most powerful investment vehicles called options. Now, options are a way of reducing risk. So I'm not interested in owning shares. What I want to be able to do is control a share instead of own it. So there's two types of options. There is a call option and there is a put option. Okay. Rather than owning 100 shares, what I will do is I will go and buy one option which controls 100 shares. Now, I can buy options in gold, I can buy options in silver, I can buy options in commodities, uh, in the overall stock market, and obviously specific stocks as well. So one option controls 100 shares. What's the advantage of that, Sean? Well, one option costs a lot less money than it would to actually buy 100 shares. So we're reducing risk from the outset by using less money to achieve a greater return. Now, call options are used to generate you income when the market or a stock moves higher. So you buy a call option, as the stock or the market moves higher, your call option goes up in value. You then sell that call option and you keep the profit. A put option, the only other type of option that there is, is used to make money when a market goes down, which is where we made most of our money in 2020. So we buy a put option, as the market moves down, the put option goes up in value. What do we then do? We sell the put option and keep the income. Now, as far as what you need to know to make money in 2021 and a huge amount of money, that is it. That's the basics. You don't need to be a brain surgeon to do this. You don't, you know, intelligence doesn't make you any more money in the markets. The financial industry is created to keep you confused, right? You couldn't possibly do this. This is too hard for you. Give us your money. We'll look after it for you. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, I want to be able to do this for myself. And what my goal here is to not blow you away with everything that I know about the markets not interested in doing that. I'm not interested in trying to make myself appear intelligent, couldn't care less. What I want to be able to do is give you a actual strategy and a technique for making money that everyone understands. Keeping it simple will make you more money. The, sometimes I think a lot of people you know, get to paralysis by analysis. They overanalyze things and they look for things to be complex. I can tell you right now that to make the most money in the markets, you need to keep it simple. And what I'm going to show you is simple. What was I doing? I was showing people, uh, well, I was telling people to start buying put options in the market on the 2nd of February in Perth, Western Australia. This is all recorded. I am one of the few experts that can actually prove that I was saying this in front of live audiences prior to the markets imploding. Uh, this is an email that I sent to one of my coaches. I told him, I think we'll see significant selling. Um, 100 million people being locked down. That was a while ago now. 304 deaths, obviously a long time ago. And 14,000 people affected by the virus is going to have a huge impact on the global economy. Short the market and long volatility type trades. Now, I was saying this back then, 9th of February in Melbourne, I was saying the same thing in Queensland, telling people to buy put options. And this is why myself and my members made so much money here. Now, what I want to be able to do is show you some of the things that we were making money on. Now, can you buy put options on the overall stock market? Can you buy put options on the overall stock market? A hundred percent, right? A hundred percent. Okay. So what we were doing here, not just what we were talking about, but what were we actually doing here? We were actually buying put options on the overall market. Sean, how else did you make incredible money in 2020 as the market started to implode? Well, we were certainly buying put options on the overall market, but what's two forms of transport that actually caused uh, 
well, what are two forms of transport that you wouldn't have wanted to be taking when the pandemic first hit the globe? Someone, you guys give me a bit of feedback here. Goodness me, there's a lot of people here. Give me a bit of feedback. What are two forms of transport you wouldn't have wanted to be taking when the pandemic first hit? Yeah, absolutely. Airlines, uh, cruise ships, yeah, buses as well, right? So what were we doing? American Airlines, we were buying put options. As it went down, we were making incredible amounts of money. Uh, United Airlines, buying put options here, making incredible money. So they were some of the things we were doing. Now, obviously, uh, cruise ships as well, okay? Cruise ships, cruise ships had an absolute crash, imploded, buying put options and selling down here. Again, this is not brain surgery. Now, one of my most valuable resources is my phone. The reason for that is I have some incredible contacts there, right? People that are high up in the military, in the government, and certainly in the financial industry. One of my contacts told me, Sean, they're going to shut down Las Vegas. Now, they hadn't done that since 1963, the JFK assassination. So what type of options, let's, I want to test you everyone here, what type of options would I have been buying on casino stocks when I found out they were going to shut Las Vegas down? Let's make sure everyone's with me. Yeah, Kelly, yeah, absolutely. Yep, Robert, yes. Jonathan, absolutely. Yeah, I was simply buying put options. I was buying put options on what? Las Vegas Sands. Okay, uh, MTM is another one, right? So I was buying put options on casino stocks. So these were some of the things that I actually did. Put options on the overall market, put options on cruise ships, airlines, and uh, obviously um, uh, casino stocks as well. Another one we made very good money on was Boeing. Boeing went from around 350 down to 100. Again, this is not brain surgery. We simply bought put options and sold them down here, making incredible amounts of money and making some of our members millionaires last year. So that was some of the things that we actually did, uh, not just what we were talking about. So as far as the basics and getting things moving, that's what you need to know. But what I want to be able to do now is just go through some of the issues that we're facing right now and then show you how to really monetize what is going on. One of the big issues and something that I've been talking about to my members for a long time and telling people is the fact that you cannot, you cannot simply just rely on one source of income, okay? Very, very important. Now, a lot of people now, after the lockdowns, are in a, in a lot of trouble because they're living paycheck to paycheck. In fact, 78% of US workers live paycheck to paycheck. Almost one third of British workers live paycheck to paycheck, right? They've got to wait for the next pay from their employer just to survive. They don't have any additional savings and they don't have any other way of making an income. Millions of Australians would be forced to live pay to pay and would be broken a month if they lost work. Now, this was written before the pandemic first hit the globe. And this is something that is playing itself out right now, where a lot of Australians and certainly Americans and certainly uh, the UK and you know many countries around the world, people are in trouble because they only had that one source of income. This is uh, in Pittsburgh in the United States. And these cars here are lining up for food. Pretty heartbreaking what's happening right now. So some people ask me, Sean, why don't you retire? Well, I am semi-retired, but why don't I retire? Well, I want to be able to help people understand there is another way of making money. And, uh, you know, these are people lining up for food. Absolutely heartbreaking. 100 million people have, have been thrown into extreme poverty because of what's happened. Now, small businesses are the backbone of any economy. And, you know, due to the uh, coronavirus, 60% of them are now permanently closed. Unemployment was supposed to be temporary, but now it's permanent for 4 million people. In the United States, there are around 20 million people that were unemployed. 10 million have actually regained employment. However, that last 10 million is going to take significant amounts of time to actually come back, several years probably. Now, has anyone else noticed when you look at your grocery bill that it's actually gone up? Has anyone actually noticed that or is it just me? Have you guys noticed that, that actual food seems like it's been going up? 
Yeah, you guys can see a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly when I look uh, at world food prices, they have risen uh, for seven months straight. And uh, yeah, this is something that I have noticed as well. Uh, energy prices, uh, household uh, energy in particular, uh, has been going up as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems now or disruptions with supply chains and you know containers and uh, all these types of things transportation costs have gone up dramatically they will filter down into prices as well so these are some of the things that are playing themselves out as we speak now bitcoin my goodness me there is a lot of conflicting views on bitcoin isn't there right some people think it's going to 200 or I've even heard 500,000 and then I've heard other people say it'll crash very soon my view is that we've just recently seen a pullback in Bitcoin. In fact, let's just have a look at this. So if we have a look at Bitcoin, we've had a big move up, then a pullback down to the 50, a big move up, and then a move back down to the 21. What do I think will probably happen now? I think we'll get a bounce from here and we'll go back up to these all-time highs here of around 58,000. Could it get to 100,000 by the end of the year? Probably. Probably, right? There are some analysts that say could hit 200,000, right? Before the move exhausts itself and it starts to move down. We know Tesla has purchased $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin and uh, has made a huge amount of money as a result of doing that. Some of the things that people don't understand though about um, Tesla's buying of Bitcoin, yes, they've made a huge amount of money, right? Massive profit. In fact, in since they bought Bitcoin back in October 2020, they've made more profit from Bitcoin than they have as an entire company in profit for the last 10 years. Right? So definitely uh, Tesla has done extremely well from Bitcoin. But another thing that you've got to understand is that because Tesla's bought Bitcoin, they can use an accounting principle called indefinite in, uh, indefinite life impairment. Now, this indefinite life impairment actually helps Tesla in a big way now that it is owning uh, Bitcoin. Okay, so obviously it's got an indefinite life. They can't use depreciation or claim depreciation on it, but they can use this accounting principle called indefinite life impairment cost. So what does this mean, Sean? Break it down for me. If Tesla has a large move, sorry, if Bitcoin has a large move higher, Tesla can actually just simply put that increase or that profit in an asset revaluation account. In other words, they won't pay tax on it until such time as they actually sell it, which they may never do. If it does go down though, what they can do is they can claim it as an impairment cost. So they bought it for 1.5 million, for example. Let's say it goes down to 1.2 million. They've lost $300,000. They can claim that as an expense and reduce taxes. So if it goes up, they put it in asset revaluation account, don't pay tax on it unless they sold it, of course. And if it goes down, they get a tax benefit. So it's actually a pretty good deal for them either way. MicroStrategy buys more than 1 billion worth of Bitcoin, adding to massive holdings. Square has bought $170 million worth of Bitcoin. Like I just said, only 1% of institutions own Bitcoin. Probably the best explanation of Bitcoin that I have heard is this. Bitcoin is a deeply fundamentally uncorrelated hedge to the existing traditional financial infrastructure. Right? which is basically saying that people have lost uh, faith in governments and the traditional financial infrastructure, right? And obviously fiat currencies as well. The other thing though, to understand about Bitcoin is the fact that yes, it's had a dramatic move. Yes, it could continue to move up, right? But what you've got to understand about this is that like I said, only 1% of institutions own Bitcoin now. I think that is going to gain traction dramatically where more and more institutions will start buying Bitcoin. You think about these big players in the market, institutions. Now, institutions account for 90% of all of the trading done on the US stock market, 
right? So institution is just simply a company that trades for profit on the stock market, right? That's all an institution is, but they make up the majority of the volume. So these institutions here, they run their funds using modern portfolio theory, which sounds complex, but it's not. All they're doing with modern portfolio theory is they're looking for investments with higher returns, well, it's pretty obvious, and that are unrelated to other investments. Well, I think Bitcoin would fit that modern portfolio theory um, criteria very, very well. Also, it's been the best performing asset in 10 of the last 12 years. So I think there's going to be big moves in Bitcoin. Could it have a dramatic move down though, Sean? And could it actually crash before moving high? Yes, absolutely it could. I think it's going to be extremely volatile, extremely volatile. For me though, uh, I'm interested in cash flowing it. Talk a bit about that later. And utilizing strategic stocks and ETFs rather than owning Bitcoin itself. Now, uh, 200,000 Bitcoins in forgotten wallets. People are losing Bitcoin at an astounding rate. Now, this man wants to dig up his hard drive with Bitcoin worth 280 million that he accidentally threw away years ago, right? Uh, yeah, he's even offered the uh, local council, you know, I'll give you half of it if you help me dig up this tip right? This huge landfill. Uh, they said no, funny enough, right? But if you like, if you have to get a hardware stick, which is pretty much the only way to protect your Bitcoin, if you lose that hardware stick, uh, and certainly if you lose your encrypted code, uh, that's it. You are never accessing that Bitcoin again. It's gone. Lost password lock millionaires out of their Bitcoin fortunes. Bitcoin investor lost 100,000, right? All he was doing here was simply changing from his old computer to his new computer. He had some password problems and he lost almost $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. This man owns $321 million worth of Bitcoin, but he can't access it because he lost his password. Stefan Thomas has two guesses left before he's locked, locked out of his fortune forever. Ouch. 1,500 Bitcoins lost every day. Less than 14 million coins will ever circulate. There's 21 million that will eventually be um, in circuit, well, actually be mined, but uh, only 14 million of them will ever circulate because of the amount of people that are losing them. So for me, I think there's a pretty large risk there to actually owning Bitcoin itself. Do I think it's going to help people become ridiculously wealthy if they understand how to cash flow it and actually make money from particular stocks that are in that field. Well, for example, Bitcoin went up 459% in the last 12 months, which is obviously amazing. However, if you understand there are certain Bitcoin stocks that went up 4,959% and 4,100%, 660%, then all of a sudden those gains in Bitcoins don't look that great. So I want to be able to benefit from Bitcoin and gold and silver without necessarily owning them. Now, it cracks me up when I get experts trying to predict whether the market is going to go higher from here or whether it's going to crash. Newsflash, no one knows. Right? <laughs> no one knows. I don't care who they are. So what I want to be able to do is set up a position right now, which I've already done, that if the market has a dramatic move higher, I make a huge amount of money. If the market crashes, I make a huge amount of money. With the power and the versatility of options, I can actually do that. So the worst of the global sell-off isn't here. JP Morgan thinks that the S&P 500 is going to go to 4,500 by the end of this year. It's the roaring 20s again. Goldman Sachs thinks it's going to hit 4,600. Right? It's around 3,900 now. So the bottom line is no one knows. One thing I do know, though, is that we are going to get dramatic moves higher and then dramatic moves lower in huge amount of volatility, which is going to help us make a fortune like we did in 2020. 
So gold, silver still have a lot of potential for upside after a record year. I agree, right? I think gold and silver will move up. But what I want to be able to do is set up a long-term position in gold, in silver. And what I then want to be able to do is be able to cash flow gold and silver and Bitcoin without them having to move one cent. And this is exactly what we did just this week. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So there's some of the things that are going on right now, but we need to have a bit of a look about how we can position ourselves, okay, going forward. We understand there's only two things that can happen, okay? We can get the price crashing down to meet the value or the value moving up to meet the price and things continuing to move higher. I mean, there are still incredible areas where you can make massive amounts of wealth within the market, okay? Uh, certainly renewable energies is one of them. Uh, we've done very well with autonomous or electric uh, car makers. Uh, there's massive um, potential there. Um, we've done, and you know, I mean, space travel, you know, by 2028 could be a $890 billion um, industry, right? So there are huge, areas for you to make money with what's going on going forward. But for me, you need to be able to understand how to make money, whether it goes up or down. And let me tell you this, when a market moves down, you can make incredible amounts of wealth very, very quickly, simply because fear is a bigger motivating force than greed. Stocks in the market will move down much more quickly than they go up. And we just proved that in 2020 by making so much money. But you've got to understand though, Sean, why is the market not crashed already? Well, we know the Federal Reserve has come out and said, you know, unlimited stimulus. But what they've done is they've gone and they've started buying um, bonds. They've bought ETFs. I mean, in high yield bonds, they've, they've bought $412 billion worth. So, you know, you've got to understand that the Federal Reserve can, has many, many tools in their arsenal to continue to drive this market higher. And for you to be oblivious of that is a really bad idea. You cannot just load up on this market crashing. You've got to be able to make money in either direction that it goes and set a position up that will actually do that for you. Because you've got to understand that the Federal Reserve, I mean, there's something called the, plen, uh, the Plunge Protection Team, which was brought in by President Reagan in 1987, where the actual, um, the working group it's called, Federal Reserve can actually come in and start buying equities to stop them crashing. The other thing you've got to understand is circuit breakers, right? Uh, I was there when they had two circuit breakers going off within the one day. A circuit breaker is where the SPX will drop, okay, I'll just show you this, where the SPX will drop 7% in a day and a circuit breaker will come in, which simply means they will halt trading completely, no more trading for 15 minutes. If it then drops to 13%, another circuit breaker will come in to halt trading for another 15 minutes. And these circuit breakers kicked in in 2020 for the first time in 20 years. And they did actually have a pretty good um, result in stopping panic selling. And you know the, the Federal Reserve, yes, they need congressional approval, but they can even start buying equities. Negative interest rates, there's a whole range of things that can go on here. I mean, uh, Bank of Japan is probably a very good um, yardstick when we look at that and you know they own now 434 billion dollars worth of equities so there's still many more things that the federal reserve can do yes we are overvalued there's no doubt about that right we're overvalued but don't think for a second that we couldn't move higher i mean last night we we're up over one percent uh these markets could still continue to go higher um the federal reserve um president uh, came out and said, Powell came out and said, look, we're going to do whatever it takes. In a nutshell, that's what he said. What happened? The markets had another move higher. Look at the Russell 2000, over 2%. So no one can predict what's going to happen next. You need to be able to set yourself up to make money in either direction is the point. Okay. Now, acquiring a new skill set is certainly something that we want to be able to do. But what I want to do is just give you some of my viewpoints here. Tesla, 
Anyone here trade Tesla in 2020? Everyone, you guys obviously saw how much of an incredible move that it had, my goodness me, but incredible amounts of money was made here, provided though you had the necessary skill set. Now, some people will look at this chart and see red and green things, and that's all they'll see. What I see is huge amounts of money. Why? Because I've got a different skill set than the average person walking around on the street. And so do my members. So let's go to this chart now. So if we look at Tesla, we can see that if you start to understand patterns and price action, four things you need. Sean, if I really want to narrow it down to what I need to make massive money in 2021, what are they? Understand what the institutions and the corporate insiders that work for these companies are buying or selling and understand price action. And finally, patterns. Every top trader in the world will utilize patterns. So we saw here, we were in a nice upward channel. When we broke out of that, we formed a bull flag. How far is that likely to go, Sean? Well, so bull flags where you move up, and then sideways consolidation. The length of the pole will tell you where it's likely to move to. That's where you take your profits. It then formed an ascending wedge. It broke out of that. Where's it likely to move to, Sean? The length of the wedge moving forward. It then entered a channel and broke out of that channel. How far is that likely to go? The length of the channel, which is exactly where it went. Now, this recently, I just called this where we had a head and shoulders pattern. Funny name, but a powerful pattern. Left shoulder, a head and a right shoulder. My call was, I believe that Tesla will move down now out of this head and shoulders down to 700. We went to a low of 619. So when you start to understand that with the right skill set, there are incredible amounts of money to be made. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a legitimate way for you to make an income, actually understanding what is going on with the numbers, with the price, inside this institutions and charting patterns. Tesla, a lot of people don't understand Tesla for whatever reason, right? If you look at Tesla purely from a profit point of view, Yes, it doesn't look terribly attractive, right? It doesn't make a huge amount of profit right now. Certainly the forecasted earnings growth of Tesla is certainly what's driving the price, but Tesla is not just a car company, it's a data company. It has the highest resolution of miles driven on planet Earth. So every time a Tesla goes out, it actually reports back that data to headquarters. So what it's doing is it's making the resolution of roads clearer for future autonomous vehicles or autonomous driving. So you should think of Tesla as a data company with very high resolution. But even beyond that, even if you didn't know that, or even if you didn't know that its solar business, its battery business could explode and it's, there's a huge amount of things going on there as well, just simply looking at the charts themselves will give you the answers. Okay, very, very important. Now, we know that, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles and uh, electric vehicles are a thing of the future. No doubt about that. Uh, a lot of these companies have done extremely well. Uh, let's just have a look at one of these in 2020 and will more, more than likely continue to do so. Look at this move. My goodness me. Sean, there's not much moving up these days. Rubbish. There's incredible amounts that are moving up. That's an electric vehicle company. So there is massive amounts of money to be made here. You just need to understand the skill set and the investment vehicle to benefit from it. Like I said at the beginning of this presentation, the rich are getting richer and the people that don't have a lot of money are getting poorer. Well, what does it take to be in the top 1% in the world? What does it take, right? Not in a particular country, but what does it take worldwide for you to be considered in the top 1%? Well, it takes around 753,000 US dollars to your name, which simply means say your house, for example, minus the loan or the debt attached to it, any investments you have minus the debt attached to it, and obviously cash in the bank and things like that. If at the end of that minus the debt, you have 753,000 US to your name, free and clear, 
you are in the top 1% in the world. If we look at the various countries here, Australia, 1.7 million, not bad for a small country. China, 2.7 million in the top 1%. I thought with a population of that size, they may have had more. And you know, we have a look at this and then we go the US, over 19 million. So if we look at the United States, it actually has more than all these countries put together. So that's the top 1%. Now, if you looked at the United States as a distribution of wealth throughout the world, this is what it would look like. 1% would own this much of the United States, 9% would own this much, 30% would own this much, but have a look at this, 40% would own this little red dot here. So it's quite clear that the difference between the people that have money and that don't is growing dramatically. Let's get to the reason why this is happening. Well, I believe the rich have different skill sets and they have different ways of managing risk and obviously understanding asymmetrical risk, which we will talk about very soon. But I wanna ask you all some questions here. A lot of people here right now, and I wanna ask you some questions. Number one, on an annual basis, how much are you looking to make in 2021? Don't have to tell me, but just write it down. How much are you looking to make in 2021 as an annual amount of money? How much did you make five years ago? Again, looking at an annual amount. How much money did you make 10 years ago? Now, when you look at those three numbers, they are going to tell you a story. Now, it may be a story that you're not happy with, but it's going to tell you a story. Are your numbers improving? Are you increasing or are you staying the same or potentially going backwards. I think if you're going backwards or staying the same, same thing really to me, you need to start improving your financial skill set. That's really what it is. Things that have made you money in the past are more than likely not going to make you money going forward. You have to adapt with what's going on right now. You have to reinvent yourself to a certain extent. So if we have a look at the US average income by age, you have a look at this, you know, we've got the different ages here. You can see up until 44, we're increasing that annual income. But after 44, starts to level off or go backwards. Exactly the same thing in Australia. After sort of the mid 40s, it starts to level off or in fact, go down. But Sean, what about the 1%? Surely that doesn't happen with the top 1%. Well, yeah, it does actually. You have a look here, after sort of the age of 50, the income, annual income stays the same. So why do you think, again, a lot of people here like you to, to uh, participate here with me. It doesn't feel like I'm talking to myself. Why do you think people's income starts to level off or go backwards after sort of mid 40s? What do you guys think that is? I'll give you my view in a minute, but what do you guys, why do you think that's the reason? Uh, Kelly, yeah, people stop learning. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Only one way of making money, Joe, yes. Uh, Russell, they get lazy. Yeah, in a lot of people's instances, that is true as well. Uh, paid for assets, don't need anymore. Yeah, Robert, there are some very financially uh, successful people where that is the case, sure. Inflation, drawing down on savings, Kelly. Yeah. People become comfortable in their jobs, Paul. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. They want to take less risk. Yeah, reach the comfort zone. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Warren, kids finish school. Yeah, okay. There's some valid reasons. For me, I believe it's you need to continue to recreate and continue to learn. Now, you know, I understand some of the things that happen in the mid 40s, you know, it could be divorce, could be you've lost everything during the GFC, perhaps someone's uh, that's close to you has died. Now that can have one or two impacts. Number one, uh, oh goodness me, you know, um, my, my best friend or a loved one's died. What's the point? Or it can be time is short. I need to make this happen now. Uh, but, you know, I understand, you know, life events get in the way as well. But, you know, as we enter the world, certainly at school, we're reinventing ourselves. We're learning. Income is growing. Enter the workforce. Want to work our way up the corporate ladder, improving, continuing to make money. And then, yeah, we stop learning, right? We become comfortable. Uh, we start hanging around with people that are on the same money or less than us. We stop 
improving our skill set, which leads to a decline when a lot of people need the money more than ever. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you can learn some very basic financial skill sets and up your financial education, you can really start making dramatic money with what's happening. Benjamin Franklin, I love this quote. If a man empties his purse into his head, no man can take it away from him. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. No doubt about it. If you took all of my money away from me now, I know that I could make it back again because I've got the education. I've got the skill set. I've trained my eye to see opportunities that the average person can't. So let's say you had a 3% per year skill set. You could generate 3% per year on your wealth with the skill set that you have right now. Okay. So say you had $10,000 and your skill set right now enables you to make 3% per annum. At the end of 10 years, your 10,000 has grown into 18,000. Hmm. What about if your skill set, you had a skill set that would make you 12% per annum? Well, your 10,000, not adding any more money, using your skill set of 12% has grown into 108,000. Hmm. Dramatic difference between 18,000 and 108. But Sean, 3% and 12% is only four times as much. Why is it so much more? Due to a very important concept called compound interest. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, again, what did we make in 2020? 616%. My goodness me, Sean, on your overall account? Yes. That's what we did in 2020 with the dramatic moves that we saw. Literally creating millionaires. Now, I don't think money's everything. I bought a couple of, I bought a house for cash and I'm buying a new one and some cars all this year because I've developed a skill set. I don't think money's everything. I wasn't born with money. Up until the age of 25, I'd never been outside of Australia, couldn't afford to travel. Yes, I've traveled the world now and I travel first class, but you know, I wasn't born with money. I've had to acquire this skill set to be able to live the life that I've got. But really what money is, it enables you to have the lifestyle that you want. But beyond that, be there for your family. Recently, just in the last week, my dad just finished 38 sessions of radiation for cancer. He needed a private nurse and he needed a house right near the hospital. Dad, the money's in the bank. My mum went into hospital as well, both parents at the same time. Mum, the money's in the bank. My brother needed money to actually buy a house. Brother, the money's in the bank. So you can really make a dramatic difference, not only to your life, but your loved one's life as well. That's what money is, right? That's what I see it as. Education system, I believe, is letting a lot of people down. Um, you know, this is something, yeah, Robert, exactly. It's, it's a tool to be able to create lifestyle, help the people that you love, and obviously, you know, put that cash flow into investments um, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. I agree. Education system. Everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it's stupid. Yeah. So what we want to be able to do, though, is not rely on the traditional education system. I think the traditional education system is outdated and severely flawed. A lot of companies are starting to realize this, right? Uh, I believe universities are in trouble. There's 12 major companies and many more are jumping on board that no longer require a college degree or a university degree. So you have a look at this. I mean, uh, these companies now, what are they doing? They're actually taking students out of high school, as soon as they finished high school, taking them into their company and training them themselves with what they actually need to know within three to six months within three to six months, right? So I don't need you to go to university for three, four, five years or longer, party on, get drunk, have a great time with your friends and then come out of that university degree and forget more than half of what you've actually learned. And a lot of it's not even applicable to the job that you do, right? Companies are starting to switch on now. Problem with universities is they find out about the changes 
last. The companies find out first. These are the things we need our employees to know for us to grow as a business. A lot of these degrees are becoming obsolete. So I think we'll see more and more of a change there going forward. Do you guys agree with that? With universities and traditional education, there's got to be a change. You need a different skill set than what a lot of them are actually preparing you for. And, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of waiting that amount of time to get educated, to go out in the workforce, uh, yeah, it's very expensive as well. Let alone the university debt and the student debt that a lot of people inquire as well. So these are some of the things that are going on right now. Yeah, a lot of people agree with that. Yeah. Now, AI, if you ask, if you ask uh, Elon Musk, what is his greatest fear? Without hesitation, he will say AI, artificial intelligence, robots. Right now, around 30% of all jobs are done by robots, AI, and 70% by humans. Within the next 20 to 30 years, 70% of jobs will be done by robots and 30% will be done by humans. So you've got to change the skill set that you have because you may actually be in an industry that's going to be disrupted by the huge explosion in AI. One in eight jobs uh, in Asia will be lost due to AI uh, by 2024. And this is something that is certainly having a big impact. I mean, autonomous vehicles, just take autonomous vehicles by itself. What type of people are going to be losing their jobs there? Truck drivers, taxi drivers, Uber drivers. Yeah, no doubt about that, right? That's just one example. Uh, obviously, manufacturing is the big thing, right? Uh, assembly line workers, just about all done by robots now. And this is something, you know, it's a trend that's actually occurring right now. Developing a different skill set with what's going on moving forward is critical. So how are we going to make big money with what's going on right now, like we did last year and have done for many years, but particularly last year? Well, we're going to utilize this investment vehicle called options. Now, Warren Buffett uses options all the time. In fact, from 2004 to 2007, he made four and a half billion dollars in options income. Robert Kiyosaki uses options all the time, who I've spoken with several times. Mark Cuban protected all of his Yahoo shares on the sale of um, uh, Comcast to actually protect $1.4 billion worth of Yahoo shares for zero cost. For zero cost, because he understands the power and flexibility of options. Selling out of the money calls and buying in the money puts for a zero cost to protect his investment. So obviously options are where we're going to focus and this is how I've been able to make over a 600% return in 2020, not just me, but my members as well. So let me show you some of the things that you need to know. Yes, options, right? But if you don't understand what the biggest traders are doing, the smart money is doing, you do not have an edge in the market you must understand what two particular groups are doing. Let's go through them again. Institutions are simply a company that trades for profit and institutions account for 90% of the volume on the market. So you've got to understand what they're buying or what they're selling. They have more resources than you and I will ever have. And we need to know what they are doing. The other group you need to understand is corporate insiders, which is simply people that work for these companies, like a CEO, chief executive officer, a CFO, a director of the company, someone who works for one of these companies, what are they buying or selling with their own money for the company that they work for? So I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but let me ask you guys this. Who here has their own business? Who runs their own small business here uh, that's on the call right now? Anyone here have their own business? Okay, quite a few people, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Who knows more about your business than you? Who knows more about your specific business than you? Exactly, no one, right? You're there on a daily basis, aren't you? You know the insides and outs of that business like no one else. However, what we want to be able to do is utilize that and understand what someone who works for these companies, what they're buying or selling. So for example, if I worked for Facebook and I all of a sudden went out and purchased 
$200 million worth of Facebook stock, do you think there's a chance that I possibly know something? <laughs> Absolutely, right? So let me give you some examples of how we do this. A Form 4. Now, a Form 4, SEC, Security Exchange Commission, Form 4, is something that must be lodged within one to two days if you're buying or selling a significant amount of shares for the company you work for. If you don't, you're going to jail. So is there ways of scanning for this, Sean, and understanding when someone who works for a company is buying or selling a huge amount of shares for the company they actually work for? Absolutely. One of the ways we do it is through scanning for Form 4s. Let me give you some examples here. This was with Papa John's Pizza, where I saw a 10% owner, a 10% owner of a company or more can be considered or is considered a corporate insider as well, right? So this particular gentleman was the CEO and 10% owner of the company. He just sold $157 million worth of stock. What do we then do? We look at the actual chart because we need to look at the price. Remember, people lie numbers don't. So we need to look at the numbers, look at the price. We saw a beautiful head and shoulders pattern. Selling $157 million worth of shares right here, we simply bought put options, turned 2,000 into over 5,375 in two days. Here's another one, $14 million worth of stock being bought for the company they work for, CEO, president, 10% owner, a whole range of different directors here buying this company. Has a beautiful move to the upside. We simply bought call options here, 3,000 into 5,000 in just seven days. Have a look at this one, 6.25 million shares. How do you find this, Sean? Form four, we scan for form fours is one of the tools that we use. Not the only thing, but one of the tools we use. Now these insiders purchased these 6.25 million shares. A week later, they had made over $11 million in profit. Who thinks that's a coincidence? Or maybe it's just a fluke. What do you guys think? If all of a sudden, all these different insiders, the CEO, the president, whole range of directors are purchasing millions of shares of the company they work for, and within a week, within a week they make $11 million profit, what do you guys think about that? Do you think it was a fluke? At Robert, educated purchases. Absolutely. People that really know what's going on. They work for the company. MGM, huge insider buying going on here. And not just from the CEO, but from a lot of different people, right? Yeah, Joel, no fluke of plan. I agree 100%, my friend. Uh, acting CEO, direct, a whole range of directors, the CFO, all buying $22 million worth of shares for the company they work for in two days. So what was going on here? Well, my, my contacts were telling me that MGM was transitioning into online gambling. Obviously with Las Vegas being shut down, the pandemic and all that type of thing, they were starting to invest heavily and had already done so to a certain extent, but were really pushing online gambling. Who thinks online gambling has exploded since the pandemic first hit the globe in late February? What do you guys think? You guys think uh, online gambling has exploded? Yeah, absolutely, it has. It has moved up in a big way. Huge amount of online gambling going on here. Yeah, no doubt about it. It has. So these insiders knew that the company was transitioning far more into online gambling. So all these different insiders purchased twenty-two million dollars worth of stock with their own comp with their own money with for the company that they work for. Beautiful move to the upside, 3,830 into over 11,000. Warren Buffett here. Warren Buffett here, uh, 314 million, right? Selling. Now, we found this out on the 3rd of April. It didn't become public information until the, until the 4th of May. So we found out a whole month before everyone else did. That's how we made money with put options ahead of everyone else. So again, by understanding what these insiders and institutions are buying or selling, we have a significant edge. $500 million worth of stock being bought by Bill Ackman. Hmm, very interesting, an institution buying here. 
We simply followed along buying call options, making some incredible money. $38 million worth of stock being bought. We scanned for this. We move with the institutional money flow. Very important that you do that. The stock moved 42% in six days. What do you guys think about this? Tell me something significant about this. I want you guys to interact with me here a little bit. What's something here that's powerful about this particular form for? Have a look at this and tell me what you see here. One thing I'm looking for in particular, if you can tell me. What's one thing in particular here? They're selling, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Robert, yeah, they've sold. Yes, Martin, good, sold 100%. Every single share that they own. Yes, Michael, 100% dump, yeah. Every single share this institution owns, they sold it. Who thinks they might know something? The stock goes from 65 to 37 in 17 days. We made huge money with put options on that. Now, that's one way of doing it. What's another way? Well, would you guys like me to show you a way that you can understand what the institutions and insiders are doing, but this time only requiring a couple of hundred dollars to be able to follow along and make massive money. You only need a couple of hundred dollars, three, four, five hundred dollars to be able to do what I'm about to show you. Who would like me to show you that? Give me some feedback here. Give me some love. You guys like that, Michael? Okay, wow. All right. Good. Okay, so let's look at this. Thank you very much for the interaction. I appreciate it. We're going to look at unusual option activity. Okay. Now, if someone wants to avoid filling out a form four, an institution or a insider wants to avoid filling out a form four, what they will do is they will use the options market instead. Because if I fill out a form four, the public needs to know, right? The public, you're going to tell the public, right? But if I use the options market, I don't have to tell anyone. So this can work whether the market's moving up in a bull market or market's moving down in a bear market. What are we? We are the little fish, okay? All we are doing is simply watching the whales of the market, okay? You know, the mutual funds, the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds of the market. We're simply following along with what the big traders are doing. Now, the reason that I trade options is yes, they're very flexible. I can make money whether it moves up or down. It doesn't require a lot of money. But the other real reason is there are no dark pools in the options market. So what's a dark pool? A dark pool is where you have a private exchange where the big boys trade, where the public can't see what they're doing. So in stocks, futures and Forex, there is something called a dark pool these private exchanges that are away from the view of the public. However, in the options market, there are no dark pools. Every trade that goes across the tape, I can actually see it. So it gives me a distinct edge, a distinct advantage over people that trade stocks, futures and Forex. It's the most transparent market in the world for that reason. So how big is dark pool trading, Sean? Well, it accounts for 40% of all trades done on the US stock market, 40%. So you have a look at these, institu these are institutions here, 323 million shares traded in a week in a dark pool. So they're significant, but we avoid that by trading options and seeing exactly what is going on. So if you have a look at this, 1,500 put options being bought. Okay, very interesting. It's a lot of put options. What did this company know? Well, the insiders knew, the institution knew that this company was about to move down strongly on earnings. A $320 investment with put options turned into 3,450. Pretty incredible, right? This one here, $28,000 worth of call options being bought. What did these insiders know? The fact that Google and Twitter were about to start using their processor. Now, if you get massive companies like Google and Twitter using your product now, that is going to cause the stock to move higher. Did these insiders and institutions know that this was about to happen? What do you guys think? 
did these insiders and institutions know that Google and Twitter were about to start using AMD's new processor? 100%, no doubt about it, right? No doubt about it. So a $380 investment there turns into over 5,000. But have a look at this one here. This is a very interesting one. What I saw here was 4,440 put options being bought at the ask price. Hmm, interesting. You can see that's unusual volume, isn't it? 0, 280, 16, 4,440 at the 50 strike price. So what happened here? Let me explain to you what actually this is about. They actually purchased $688,200 worth of put options that expired in three days. So what does that mean, Sean? Well, let me show you this, right? We followed along. $295 we invested. Same put option, we saw the unusual option activity. So this one here, the stock price was $53 at the time, $53, okay? This institution came in and bought put options down here at 50 that expired in three days. So what does that mean, Sean? That means that unless this stock moves from 53 below 50 in the next three days, if it doesn't do that, they are going to lose almost $700,000. Now, either they're a complete idiot or they know something. Have a look at this the next day, crash. It's dropped dramatically from around 53 down to 38 because of the fact they had very poor earnings. What did we do? We turned $295 with a stop. So we only used 150. We had a fixed limited risk of $150 to make 7,782. Let me give you another example of unusual option activity, CRM. Have a look at this. Right here, an institution bought $22 million worth of out of the money call options. Have a look at this move here. Have a look at this move. What caused this move up, Sean? CRM, Salesforce, got added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is the oldest index in the market. Very prestigious to be added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average as well as the fact that they had record earnings. Did these institutions know that CRM Salesforce was about to be added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average and was about to have record earnings? You better believe they did. A $22 million investment turned into 95 million. SoftBank made $4 billion by buying call options on CRM, 4 billion. This is not a coincidence, my friend, and this happens all the time. If you can start to utilize this, you can start to make an incredible amount of money. So let me get a bit of an idea here about where you guys are at. What I want to do is I want to now show you probably it is amazing, John. Now, can you guys, well, firstly, before we go on, can you see how powerful that information is? Can everyone see how powerful that edge is? that advantage will be in your trading, along with price action, along with charting patterns. Yeah, it, it's, it's a huge thing, right? So you've got to understand what they're doing. In addition to, um, thank you, Joe, uh, but I've said no line that answered many questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe, I appreciate that. So you've got to be able to utilize what the big traders are doing. Very, very important, right? This is how we can make so much money. So let me talk about actually practically putting this into a strategy. A lot of speakers just talk, talk, talk. Sean, show me an actual example. Take me from A to Z. I want to see the whole thing played out. All right. Let's do that now. We want to use this new skill set to start making big money. All right. So we want to turn your knowledge into money here. But what you must understand is you have to utilize asymmetrical risk in order, skewed in your favor, in order for you to make massive money. We have been programmed to thinking that the only way for us to grow our wealth, in which would involve taking huge risks. While there's no such thing as a riskless trade, every master trader in the world will tell you, without exception, one of the most vital components of your portfolio or account is to find investments with asymmetrical risk and reward. 
So what is asymmetrical risk? It's the concept of taking a risk that will produce a return that far surpasses the risk taking, taken. In English, risking $1 to make $5. So your risk is a dollar. And if you're right, you will make $5. If you're wrong, you will lose a dollar. Okay, that is an example of asymmetrical risk. This is a really important concept that can change the quality of your life greatly. Yet the idea of leveraging asymmetrical risk is not really emphasized in today's world because a lot of people in my industry don't actually trade for a living, right? You've got to understand asymmetrical risk. Paul Tudor Jones, one of the greatest traders of all time. I look for opportunities with tremendously skewed reward to risk. Okay, so what does he use? He uses a five to one, five to one risk to reward. Five to one means I'm risking $1 to make five. What does five, what five to one does is allow me to have a hit ratio. In other words, be correct, be right, only 20% of the time and not lose money. In other words, I can be a complete imbecile. This is Paul Tudor Jones. And I can be wrong 80% of the time and I'm still not going to lose money. When someone comes up to me and they say, Sean, how many trades do you get right out of 10? What's your win rate? As soon as they say that, I know they know nothing about trading, nothing. It's not about your win rate. It's about how much you make on your winning trades and how much you lose on your losing trades. That is the key, my friends, in very, very important. Okay. So asymmetrical risk, you've got to be able to structure all of your investments utilizing that very powerful tool. You must. Okay. And I'm going to give you an example of this right now. So who would like to know the number one pattern or strategy I use or have used and continue to use to generate income for the last 20 years? What's the number one? Yes, I use a whole variety of strategies, but if you're going to put a gun to my head and say, Sean, give me just one, the most powerful way that you find opportunities in the market, who wants me to, and I'm only going to do this if you guys give me some love here. Who wants me to give you this secret here? All right, I'm getting some love now. Good, <laughs> okay. Wow, okay, that is a lot of love. Very nice. All right, so let's do this. It's called a bull flag, okay? Now, a bull flag is where you get a big move up followed by a sideways move, okay? I've uh, got some love hearts there from Manny, <laughs> thank you. Uh, or a sideways move, right? Now, it can have a flat top, and this line angling up, this trend line angling up, or it can sometimes be a sideways triangle here, okay? But the overall pattern is a big move up, and then it starts to go sort of sideways, doesn't go up or down, consolidates before then breaking out. Entry here, stop here. So this pattern in and of itself is the number one pattern that I've used to make money. So Sean, let me see this pattern and your asymmetrical risk and everything you've spoken about. I wanna see it all play out in an actual trade that you did. All right. What do you guys see here? Let me try and educate you guys and help you guys here. What do you guys see here? What, what, is, what do you guys all see? Always look at the right-hand side of a chart whenever you're looking at a chart. You see a gap up, yeah, absolutely. Yep, feel good. Anything else but a gap up? What else do you see right here? Big move up, Martin, good. Big move up, bull flag. Yeah, a bull flag. So what would you say if I said to you these three things, okay? I said these three things to you. I said, look, I've found a bull flag here it's just broken out. We have igniting volume. How do you know it's igniting volume, Sean? Well, look to the left. Is it bigger than anything else? Yeah. Igniting volume, a lot of people participating. And what about if I said an insider, several insiders just purchased a hundred million dollars worth of this stock? What would you guys say about this particular investment opportunity or income opportunity? Who's in? 
if I show you how to structure it with asymmetrical risk. All right, good. You guys are in. Fantastic. All right. So let me show you the whole procedure here. Igniting volume. There it is there. A lot of people participating in this move higher. Okay. Martin, that's right. Positive with controlled risk. Yes. So first thing I'm going to do is draw the, the pattern. So draw the bear flag, a bull flag, which I've done very poorly there, right? The bull flag. Okay. There's the breakout there, right? Entry here, risk to the bottom of the prior candle. Entry, risk, target. Every single trade you get in. Entry, risk level, and target. Entry, risk level, target. You must, if you're going to actually be a trader, again, I'm trying to give you something that's real, not BS. I want you to be able to control your risk, okay? So let's look at this. How do we do this, Sean? Well, we measure the length of the pole. So from the top of the flag, to the bottom of the flag. So the top of the flag was 127.50, as you can see there. The bottom of the flag is 120.50. So the difference between the top and the bottom of this move higher is $7. Is everyone with me there? Can everyone see the length of this move up? The pole of the flag is $7. Just want to make sure everyone's with me. I want to go through this so you guys actually get it. I'm not trying to make myself intelligent. I just want you guys to get it. I don't care about anything else. Okay, good. Now, this $7 here is actually going to project where our target will be. We're going to use this to find out where the target would be. So, yeah, Martin, you could use the, the gap. Some people do. Uh, sometimes I do, but I'm keeping it very conservative on this one. So I'm just going to use the actual pole itself. So what we do is we got $7 here. Okay, we then grab that $7 and project it forward. So our entry is 127.50 as it broke out of the bull flag. What would our target be? 134.50. $7, the length of the pole, added on top of our entry point. Ah, so our target, Sean, here is 134.50. Absolutely. Where's our stop? The bottom of the prior candle before it broke out the bottom of that prior candle. So our stop is 126.50, our entry is 127.50, and our target is 134.50. This creates a seven to one risk to reward. Let me ask you this with what you've learned so far. Is this using asymmetrical risk skewed in our favor? What do you guys think? Is this an asymmetrical risk trade in your favor. 100%, seven to one. Now, if I use an option, one option controls 100 shares, potential reward, $700, potential risk, $100. So you've got to understand, yes, Kelly, I will take profits at 134.50 and I'll show you that in a moment. Yes, yeah, that's correct. So what you've got to understand here is if I use a seven to one risk to reward and I continue to do that, I am going to make phenomenal money. It's not about your win rate. It's about how you structure your trades, entry, stop, target, every time. Anyone who doesn't talk about asymmetrical risk, entry, stop, target, they're just a gambler. They don't know what they're doing. So. Positively skewed asymmetrical risk, seven to one, okay? One option, $700 reward if it gets to the target and 100 would be your maximum risk, okay? Now, we can see here that it's actually gone to our target here, this real life trade, not a made up trade, a real life trade that we actually took. So let's look at this, seven to one. What does it mean? Well, let's say that you're not very good at trading and you're only right 30% of the time. So you've only got 30% winning trades. Uh, Joe, I typically go 90 to 120 days to expiry. So the theta is very, very small. The time decay is very, very small. Yep. I exit the position long before that, but that's typically what I start with. So 30% of the time, 
I am right. In other words, 70% of the time I'm wrong, right? So I've got 100 trades, 70 of those are losers, okay? And 30 of them are winners. My reward is $700 for a winning trade and $100 as a risk for a losing trade. So throughout the course of these 100 trades, I've made 30 trades that are winning trades times 700, 21,000. 70 losers times 100, 7,000. Have I still made money being right only 30% of the time? Absolutely. Conclusion, only risking $100 and only being right 30% of the time, if you use asymmetrical risk correctly and structure your trades correctly, you can still make a good income. Is this starting to make sense now, guys? Is this starting to make sense? Can you guys see what I called here with GameStop? Look at the bull flag on GameStop before it took off to the moon. Anyway, um, yeah. Can you guys see the power of this, right? So let's look at this now, right? Let's actually look at it from a practical point of view and let's actually go ahead and actually do this. So here's the trade right now, okay? Now, with this particular trade, what type of option would I buy on this trade? This is the trade we've just been talking about, okay? You guys can all see the bull flag. Has it broken out of the bull flag, right? Let me, let me talk to you guys about this. Has it broken out of the bull flag right here? You guys can see it? Yeah. So you're going to buy what type of option? Call option. Fantastic, right? Where would your risk be, right? I want to see if I've taught you guys well. Where would your risk be? What's your risk level? Yes, bottom of the prior candle. Good. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay. Now, then if it goes to 134.50, that's going to be your target. Right? So I've got my risk level in place here of 126.50, the prior candle. Okay, that's the stop. And I've got my target here of 134.50. Okay. All right, so let's play this out now, right? Actually play this in real time. So we fast forward this a little bit. Now, what are the two things that I'm looking at? What are the two things that I'm looking at here? I'm only looking at whether it goes below my stop of 126.50 or it goes to my target of 134.50. Anything else here, I'm not interested in. I'm simply focusing on those two levels. And I have this, imagine, imagine if I found all the institutions buying this, okay? I told you about the bull flag. I told you when to get in. I told you the option to buy. I told you the risk level and I told you the target. Who would love me to be in the market with you live and actually do this for you and you simply follow along exactly like I'm doing here? Give me a bit of feedback there. Yeah, this is this is what we do, right? This is what we do, right? It's not a game to us. This is what we actually do, right? So can everyone see there? It's actually had a beautiful move higher there. We're then going to take our profits and we are done, okay? So that's an example of actually putting it into practice, uh, not just talk, okay? So it's very, very, very powerful. And this is something that we used to great effect uh, for the last, or well, I've used for the last 20 years and obviously uh, in 2020 to make incredible amounts of money, not massive amounts of risk that need to be taken here. And this is the power of what we're talking about. So you can see that by using this strategy, we can make money when the markets go down through the use of put options where the markets go up through the use of call options or even sideways, right? Where the market is not moving up or down, we can do that through the use of something called a spread. This is what we just did on our number one silver stock where we made money even if it didn't move one cent in price. That's the key. You can't just use directional trading, my friends. What I showed you there is directional trading. Very good, very good. But you need non-directional trading as well. In other words, cash flow when a stock doesn't even move in price. If you don't know how to do that, you are missing out on huge money. You need a combination of the three. 
If you can do that, you can compound your profits in a dramatic way. Albert Einstein referred to covered calls. Goodness, no, no, not covered calls. Uh, compounding your profits um, is very, very important. Albert Einstein referred to it as the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, it's a reliable, systematic accumulation of wealth. This is how you grow your wealth is through compounding. What is compounding, Sean? It's interest on interest, okay? Making your money and allowing it to grow, leaving it in the account and allowing it to grow on top of itself, okay? Interest on interest. So we wanna be able to do this in a very conservative manner, okay? Very conservative manner, okay? And we wanna be able to do this and make sure that we have our risk in check and we make money whether the market goes up down or sideways with silver we made money from a cash flow strategy as well as a call option we made money with both so if you have a look at this here compounding let's look at 10 years of making five percent per month sean you can't make five percent per month rubbish in 2020 we made over 600 percent so i'm talking this down instead of talking it up right five percent per month starting with five thousand making five percent per month or starting with ten thousand not adding one more dollar okay after 10 years you've grown that into 1.7 million your ten thousand five percent per month has grown into almost three and a half million this is pure mathematics put this into any compounding calculator you like you get the same result now, when I look at this, I see a retirement plan. I see a savings plan. I see a way of making up for lost time if things haven't gone well for you financially. But what I see more important than all of those concepts put together is opportunity cost. Now, opportunity cost is the money that you could have been making, but you decided to do something else, which most people is to do nothing. Is there a cost to doing nothing, Sean? you better believe there is. Let's say you waited for the right time. Rather than you procrastinated for three years, for example, rather than making three, rather than making 1.7 million, you made 300,000. What's my opportunity cost, Sean, for waiting three years? About $1.4 million. So there is a very real cost to not acting. The problem is most people don't see it. Albert Einstein summed this up pretty well. People that understand compound, <clears throat> compound interest and opportunity cost, they, if they understand it, they receive it. They will get rewards from it. If you don't understand compounding or opportunity cost, you pay it. You pay it, right? Very, very important. Now, have a look at this, this opportunity cost here, right? Opportunity cost. This particular member started with us at the beginning of 2020, okay? Beginning of 2020, okay? His name's Michael. Have a look at what he did here. What's the opportunity cost for Michael not becoming a member of ours? 1.48 million. He turned 240,000 into 1.75 million in 2020. Pretty incredible, right? He made a 613% re return on his overall account. So the opportunity cost for Michael waiting for a waiting for something else, procrastinating, doing nothing, would have been 1.48 million US dollars. Luckily, he didn't wait. Now, a lot of people on this call right now, what I wanna be able to do is get your permission right now to show you how to start doing this right now in 2021 and duplicate the incredible results that we had in 2020. Is it okay if I show you guys how I can help you do this? I wanna get your permission, your feedback first. Is it okay if I show you guys an opportunity here? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, Warren, uh, Nesta, thank you. Okay, so what I want to be able to do is give you step-by-step -step instruction on how to implement this right now, okay? There is massive opportunities in 2021. They have already made us massive money just in the first two months of the year. 
So I wanna give you step-by-step -step instruction on how to implement these strategies that I've shown you right now. The great thing with the cash flow options trading program is it will help you generate consistent returns where the market's going up, down, or even staying the same price. We're gonna guide you through step-by-step -step video modules which will help you trade successfully and profitably, very importantly, while managing your risk effectively. All of these modules can be watched at your own pace in the comfort of your own home. This is a very comprehensive program that will allow you to go from beginner, if you've never done this before, that's okay. Even if you're very experienced, uh, people benefit from what we show substantially to mastering the art of trading options anywhere in the world. So what's involved in the program, Sean? Well, here it is. The seven steps to becoming successful. I looked at all of our members that are making seven figures plus, and I, I did a survey to ask them, what do they do? These seven steps are the seven steps that they actually took, okay? If you follow these seven steps, action steps, you will make money. Mastering option basics. There's certain basics that you need to understand, right? I break it down very simply. Each one of these modules here is only around 20 to 30 minutes. So it doesn't take long to go through this. I've put my heart and soul into this program. I've recently redone it. So it's completely up to date. Understanding money flow, very important. Money never sleeps. You need to know where it's moving into or moving out of. Price action, the truth, very important. If you're going to be a good trader to understand price action, what are the numbers telling you? Now I've got six powerful trade setups that I use. I've already shown you one, right? I've already shown, so there's only five more you've got to learn, right? I've shown you the bull flag already. There's five additional trade setups that I want to show you so you can actually do this for yourself forever. Now, if you're anything like me, you want to be able to see it done. Pretty similar to what I just showed you now. Because if you, no, I'm very much of, yeah, theory is great and you need some theory, I understand that, but you need the practical, how do you do it, right? Once people actually see it, I find they learn very, very quickly. It doesn't take long. So we actually show you uh, how to actually do this in real time with real trading so that it all makes sense to you. Balance of power, how to work out whether buyers or sellers are in control within seconds. I have a very good technique for doing that. Putting it all together, more live trading. Um, very, very, very important. High short interest strategy, my goodness me. That worked very well with GameStop and a whole range of other stocks that we've been trading. You need to learn this one. High short interest strategy, very, very powerful. GameStop is a recent example. Ultimate earnings strategy. How do you trade stocks that are having their earnings coming up? like they will do four times a year. We need to be able to make money from that scenario. This is the holy grail of income investing. You will love this. Now, when you're first starting this, you need some support, okay? I understand that. So what I've done here is I've found some of the very best traders that I can find, okay? People that have gone through all of our content that are successfully and profitably trading themselves. They are fully accredited to teach you. Now, one-on-one, -on -one, we don't put you in a group and say all the best. We want you to make money now in 2021. We want you to make money in the next week. How do you do that? You get your own coach one-on-one -on -one, to guide you through everything that you need to do. This will start making you money more quickly. So you're fully supported in your options trading journey. Okay. Now we also give you lifetime access to our email support, which is same day response. So we really help you, really support you every step of the way, but your own coach is just fantastic. And we do this through Skype sessions, or we can do it through Zoom, um, whatever you like, but we can actually see your screen. So we can guide you through step by step how to start doing this and how to start making money very, very quickly. So Lifetime access to all of the content there. You can get through that content within a week or two. It doesn't take long. I've laid it out very, very simply for you. Okay. Now, full support with your own dedicated one on one coach and unlimited email support as well. Some frequently asked questions that I get. Uh, can I do this in a retirement savings account? Absolutely. Many of our members are funding their retirement, this question here, right now through the use of this. So certainly uh, you can do this in a retirement account. In fact, it can be paid for uh, out of a retirement account, self-managed super fund as well. 
How much money do I need to start? Well, you can start doing this with as little as $500. That's right, $500 and you can start doing this and compounding and growing your wealth. What's the next step? You don't have to go through all the modules to start making money. That is not necessary. We will actually get you started with your own one-on-one -on -one coach, like I said. So your coach is gonna call you. I insist that my coaches call brand new members, okay? So this is something that I think is uh, sort of lost these days, right? Where you get a phone call from the people saying, welcome, uh, look forward to working with you as a new member. These are the steps we need to take. So we're going to call you and we're going to send you an email to give you access to everything and get you started very quickly. We've had members, as I'll show you in a moment, making over $10,000 in their first week within the program as a new member. Here's some more people that have made incredible money. Uh, have a look at this. This is Dr. Peter Mounts in the UK. Uh, he's a retired dentist now and he's funding his retirement. He refers to the program as a life changer. His words, not mine. And he's made 50,000 pounds income in the last five months by following along with what we do. Another one of our members, Sandra, 5,800 at the airport while her flight was delayed because she understands the six setups that I'm going to teach you. Warren, 165,000 US in 12 months, starting as a complete beginner. Another one of our members, Zev, 18,000 in a week, which is great. But what's even greater than that is the fact that he had six trades, three of them were winning trades and three were losing trades. And he still made 18,000 for the week. Let us show you the magic and how that happens. Now, this is an email that I sent to my mum. I said, hi, mum, how are you? Love, okay, so that's $12,031.89 to spend in your income generator strategy accounts, what she calls it. Go and spend the money and enjoy it. You deserve it. Don't worry, I'll make more cash flow next month. The ability to be able to do this for my own mum and help her fund her retirement was worth the 20 years that I've spent learning this the 20,000 plus hours I spent learning off some of the greatest traders, option traders in the world. And the well over quarter of a million dollars I've spent actually getting the accreditations to learn this. All of that was worth it to be able to do this for someone you love. So the reason I show you this is you're gonna be able to teach this to your kids, teach this to people that you love. That's why I don't retire, that's why I continue to teach this. I want you to be able to transfer this skill to other people once you have the success yourself. So we're gonna help you set up your own trading account, okay? Step by step, takes about 20 to 30 minutes to set up. We'll be there with you. Your own one-on-one -on -one coach will help you set it up. And then about two days to all get finalized. So within two days, you can start trading and start making money here. Now, who thinks that there is a possibility the market could crash in the next, say, 12 to 24 months? Give me a bit of feedback here. Who thinks that's at least a possibility? The markets could crash. Yeah, a lot of people saying, yeah, pretty educated audience here. I think that's certainly a possibility. So would it be advantageous for me to show you a particular strategy that can make you a fortune if and when the market crashes? Not just the strategy though, but what I'm gonna do is give you a 10 point checklist that you do each day. It takes around five to 10 minutes. And what this does is it mathematically measures turning points, or another way of saying it, human insanity, right? That's where markets turn at, at insanity points. So these 10 points or human insanity can be measured mathematically. So you look at these 10 points, if seven or more of the 10 points are telling you the market's going to move down or crash, you start buying the put options that I show you there. Very, very important. Watch this first as a new member, please. What about if I could help you trade crypto and Bitcoin without ever needing to own it? So discover how Bitcoin can make you huge returns without the risk of ever owning it. No wallet needed, no hardware needed, no need to deal with crypto markets at all. The secret strategy to generate cash flow from Bitcoin without owning it. Bigger returns, less risk. Bitcoin in the last 12 months, 459%. This CFO Bitcoin stock, 4,959%. CFO Bitcoin cash flow option strategy, 304% in three days. 
So this is really big. If you guys follow along with what I do here, you are going to love that and make a huge amount of money with Bitcoin without even needing to own it. Gold, very important, long-term bullish on gold, but you need to be able to make money now without the price moving. Right now, since August, gold's been in a downtrend. You've got to be able to have made money while that's happening. So we want to show you how to generate cash flow and have a long-term position that is paid for from your cash flow strategy short term. Very important. I'll show you my number one gold mining stock and how to really start making great money from gold and position yourself to make a lot of money uh, when it does have its big move. Same with silver. This is something that we've done very well just in the last week. I started trading my number one silver stock. Okay, my number one silver stock, I bought long term. Okay, not the stock, but the option long term. And then what I did is I cash flowed as well, that particular silver stock. So I made money from the cash flow strategy. And I made money from the call option moving up in value made 41% this week. Let me show you how I trade silver with options as well. That is for new members. I'm only going to take a select group of new members too. The fact is there's no comparison to what we do, right? You can try out, try this yourself, or you can start a new online business, or you can do something different, but there's no comparison to what we do here. Imagine for a moment your life's like this. You're able to be at home and make money, or maybe be home with the kids, or maybe by yourself and generate income. Why? Because you've developed a different skill set now. Now, like I say, semi-retired these days, I only want to work with people that want to do this. If you're on the fence, that's okay. I only want to work with people that want to do this, okay? This is why I'm going to give you an incredible offer today as a massive thank you for being here. Normally, what I would charge with what I'm about to show you and what I've already shown you is around $21,000, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all this for you for 6497 or three monthly payments of 2497 If you already know that you want to become a new member, go to cashflowoptions.com.au forward slash GOCO. Go there right now. Jonathan will put that in the chat as well. Go there right now because I'm only going to accept a very select group of new members. Now, there is no risk here to you. I'm going to give you a 14 day money back guarantee. So if for whatever reason you're not happy, we give your money back. Don't need your money anyway. Think about asymmetrical risk here, just for a second. If I don't, if I'm not happy, I get my money back, no risk. What about if what Sean's showing me could help me make incredible amounts of wealth and has unlimited upside? Yeah. This is the greatest example of an asymmetrical trade that you will ever see. Now, I'm going to make this offer. There's hundreds and hundreds of people here right now. I'm going to make this offer available for the first 10 people, right? I'm going to offer this for 10 people and 10 people only. For the first 10 people, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do this rapidly, rapidly. What I'm going to do, where I'm talking to you from now, right here, this is where I find the magic, where I find the trades that make people substantial money. I find what the insiders are buying or selling. I look at the greatest silver investments, gold investments, Bitcoin stock investments, and I actually lay them out for you so that you can start making money now. I spend hours and hours of research here, and you simply follow along with what I do. Who likes the sound of this? Every week, I will tell you what to trade, when to manage, how to manage it, the whole thing laid out for you. Typically, what I do is I do this for a year for new members. What I'm actually going to do as a special gift here, check this out, I'm actually going to do it for a lifetime. That's right, a lifetime. Every week, I'm going to give you the greatest opportunities to make money and follow along with exactly what I am doing for a lifetime. We're talking about my lifetime, okay? So uh, I'm 46, got a few years left here, uh, but we're gonna be, you can actually follow along with what I do for a lifetime with my weekly crisis trade service. So have a look at this. This will give you a bit of an idea 
about what we've been able to do with this weekly crisis service that again, for the first 10 new members, if you already want us to reserve your place, put it in the chat right now. Look at some of the results that we've been able to get people just simply following along with us. 13,300 in a week. Look at these profits. Just do what I'm telling you each week. I'm gonna make you a fortune in 2021. 3,200 into 17,000 in two weeks. 4,200 just buying put options when I told them. Have a look at this member here. 4,466, that's what they started out with in their account. They followed my weekly crisis trade. Two days later, it's now worth 21,669. Four days after that, 62,854. That's right, 4,466 into 62,000 by following my weekly crisis trade service. I just traded everything that Sean mentioned in the video, right? Every week, I'm gonna give you one of these and you can come along and make money with me. Look at these results that people have been getting. The Boeing, remember I spoke to about Boeing going from 350 down to 100, have a look at this. Three and a half thousand into 28,000, huge. These are straight from people's brokerage accounts. Can't get any more transparent than that. Look at these results. Brand new member, Sean, how quickly can I start making money? Well, have a look at these brand new member here, following my crisis trades every week. Made four and a half thousand US in a week, their first week. They've paid for the program and now they've got my trades for a lifetime. Talk about value. Absolutely, I quadrupled my account. Absolutely incredible here. 6,196 in their first month. Martin, there you are. <laughs> there you go. Martin's here right now. Uh, that was you. Yeah, that's right. 6,196 in their first month. They've paid for the program plus made a stack of profit in their first month. 13,184 in the first two months. Incredible. Uh, 9,882, right? So you can see, you know, 200,000 in four months. This was the earning strategy. Very powerful. 25,000 into 157,000 on Zoom. Oh yeah. Now have a look at this one. This member made 410,000 US profit in, in, uh, for the uh, year. And have a look at this, one hour a day. Thanks for everything you do every day. Since I started with CFO, I have 410,000 US in realized profits in the bank, which is a lot better than expected. Not bad for roughly an hour a day effort before I go to bed at night. Pretty amazing. About an hour a day is what you need here. And here's Michael our uh, million dollar trader. Uh, he turned 240,000 at the beginning of 2020 into 1.75 million. Now, what I wanna be able to do is help new members, those people that say right now to me, reserve my place, Sean. Uh, put it in the chat right now so we know. Um, better yet, go to the link, okay? Now, Here's four opportunities for new members. Make sure you put reserve my place right now. This is only for people that are reserving their place right now. Number one, have a look at this opportunity that I found here. All these different insiders are selling in a big way. Uh, I wanna be able to get you in this position right now. This one here, the number one silver stock to buy and how to cash flow it as well. Very important, very important. I want to give you that as a new member as well. Bitcoin, the number one Bitcoin stock to, to own and to cash flow. I'm going to give you that as well. And very importantly, our fourth opportunity here for new members, people that are reserving their place right now, making payment. If the market moves up in a big way, we're going to make a lot of money. If it crashes, we're going to make a lot of money. I'm going to show you how to set up this trade right now so you're positioned to make huge money regardless of what the market does going forward very powerful i'm going to give you all of those in the top uh in for those people that are uh, becoming new members now okay now everything that you've seen there okay uh you know everything involved in the program, your full support, opening your accounts, uh, just simply click on the link that uh, Jonathan has put in the chat right now, and that will help you to secure your place as a new member right now. Uh, cash flow, uh, be able to make money from the coming crash. 
very important, okay? And very importantly, following what I do every week, I am going to make you a fortune in 2021. Still, with me doing all the work and you just following along, still only 6497 or three monthly payments of 2497. Go to cashflowoptions.com.au forward slash GOCO now. I'll also be running personally a two day conference that you can attend, okay? Yeah, lifetime. You'll become a lifetime member. Yeah, Jeff, absolutely. You can bring along a partner as well, okay? So two days here. I'm going to take you to the next level with this uh, two-day conference as well. You get that included when you become a new member now. So uh, 6497 or three monthly payments of 2497, go to cashflowoptions.com.au forward slash GOCO. Now, someone was asking me just now, if I don't have a credit card, how can I become a new member? Um, Janine, here it is here, okay? So if you've got a debit or credit card, let me just show you this firstly. Go to cashflowoptions.com.au, okay? John, congratulations, my friend. You've just purchased, you've become a new member. Welcome to the program. You've made a, a huge, hugely important decision for yourself and your family in 2021. Uh, this is uh, Australian dollars. This is Australian dollars, yeah. So when you go to the GoCo uh, link, it will look like this, okay? Let me just show you. So it'll look like this. You'll see my smiling face there, okay? And it'll give you the opportunity to become a new member full pay, the best value or part pay. The other thing that this page does, which is cashflowoptions.com.au forward slash GOCO, is it tells you everything that's involved in the program. So if you've sort of forgotten all this stuff that we've shown you, because it's a lot, uh, if you've shown, if you've forgotten everything, it's all here. Okay. So you'll see everything that's involved as well as a 14 day money back guarantee. It doesn't get any better than this. Now, if you wanted to do this via a bank, trans a bank transfer, you certainly could, and you're within Australia. Cashflow Options is my company name and the account name, BSB 014688, account number 2880824497. If you're outside of Australia and you would like to do this via a bank transfer, uh, obviously the account names the same along with the BSB and account number. However, you will need a SWIFT code. And here it is, ANZBAU3MXXX. Also, you'll need a company address. Here it is, lot 121, 18 Fern Street, Surface Paradise, Queensland, 4217. Take a screenshot of that now. That's how you become a new member. That's how you take advantage of what I'm about to do for you in 2021. It is going to be big like it was in 2020. If you're having any problems making payment, go to billing at cashflowoptions.com.au now and we will help you with any issues that you've got. Reserve my place, Sean. I want in this incredible offer. Go to billing at cashflowoptions.com com.au right now and they will help you with any issues we've got uh, Michaela and Jonathan there for you right now so what I might do is just bring on uh, Steve uh, right now with uh, any questions uh, that you might have um, at the moment John it's, it's Greg here um, oh, it's Greg sorry Greg that's okay mate always a pleasure to talk to you um, listen buddy we've got a number of questions if we can just um um, have a look at these. Um, how long does, as Adam speaking, how long does it take to get through all the training? Okay, the each of those modules is around 20 to 30 minutes. If you're very motivated, you could do it within a week. Um, you know, I mean, if you're putting in an hour a day, yeah, maybe a week or two, and you've got all the content, you've gone through everything. Okay. Um, it doesn't take long at all. Right. Now, Tracy is asking, how long does it take to open your account? Yeah, it takes, we will get on a Skype call with you. Okay, we'll get on a Skype call with you. And what we will do is we will get the account open in about 20 minutes. And it normally takes around two days to finalize it. So everything from beginning to end, about two days. Terrific. Now, everyone, don't forget to go to the link, which is www.cashflowoptions.com.au forward slash GOCO. Hey, listen, if you're thinking about it, just do it. Uh, this is an outstanding program. I've worked with Sean. I've forgotten how long, Sean. And I can tell you, I just get so many beautiful reports about Sean, uh, the work he does uh, with, his, um, with, with his people. He goes all the time. He's thinking uh, about his clients every day. Um, Sean, I love your passion to people that come into your fold. It's wonderful. Um, Philip. 
Philip from is asking, how many hours a week do I need to spend doing this? How many hours a week? Yeah, it's a good question. Our top members, the people that are making the most money, are typically putting in about an hour an hour a day. Um, and I think everyone's got an hour a day. Maybe you need to, uh, you know, organise things a little bit. But you know, an hour a day would be more than enough for you to be able to do this. And you know, you can do this while you're working as well, because you don't have to stay up all night watching charts and screens. We've actually set this up in a way that even if you're working full time, you can do this. And uh, you know, it doesn't require huge amounts of time. About an hour a day would be great. Wonderful. And of course, this is Australian dollars. We have a lot of people from around the world. And this is Australian dollars, not American dollars. Correct, Sean? Yes, that's right. Uh, Australian dollars, yeah. Look, somebody's asking, Can with 500 US, does it work to be working this with $500 US? Yeah, definitely. The strategies that we have, particularly our cash flow strategies, um, $500 is more than enough because that's the beautiful thing about options. We don't have to put huge amounts of money into this uh, to be able to start leveraging and making a lot of money. So, yeah, $500 is fine. Wonderful. Listen, Vince is asking, uh, are we trading Australian UK markets or only the USA market? Uh, only the US market. It's the biggest options market in the world. So it is uh, only the US market. The most opportunities are there. Uh, very, very liquid, obviously. And uh, you know, you, you've got to go where the money is. Sean, a lot of people are asking this question. Do you need to be glued to the screen all day, all night, trading, watching? No, definitely not. The way that we structure this is that our trades are set up in such a way as they're set and forget. In other words, we can set our entry, our stop, our risk level and our targets all at the same time. So this way we can trade outside of market hours without needing to stay up late at night or even be there live in the market. And we can get our time back because we want to be able to make the money and still have the lifestyle. So our use of uh, limit orders and bracket orders and various things like that alerts allow us to set these trades up the, the ones that i'll give you every week without you needing to be glued to the screen look tony has uh, tony has uh, signed up he's uh, one of your pupils now but he's just asking what happens now how quickly do i get started we will call you very, very quickly. So probably uh, today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, tomorrow we will call you what your own personal coach will actually call you. And they will say, uh, welcome to the program. These are the things we need to get started. So we're going to call you. In addition to that, we're going to send you an email. Make sure you check your spam or your junk uh, box there in your email. Make sure you whitelist us as well. Uh, that's very important. But you're going to receive an email from us, access to all of the content online, everything that you've seen, um, as well as well as a, an ability with a link to book a time with you, your own personal coach, and you'll get a coach from us. Uh, get a, sorry, a call from your coach as well. So um, simply just wait for your coach to contact you. Really, look out for your email, and we'll get you started quickly. Sean, Jonathan's just texted me to say that we've reached the the ten. Can you, can you help? Uh, yeah, I don't want to take too many new members just simply because of how much we much value we give everyone and how much time we spend to help people. What I will do, I am doing another presentation shortly. I will take some of the members that I was going to, uh, some of the positions I was going to allocate in the next presentation and I'll allocate them here. What about Greg, if I do uh, just 10 more places, just 10 more uh, for everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That is fantastic. Okay, look, Max is asking, I really want to get this program, but I'm, I'll be away for two weeks. Can I buy now, get the discount and start in two weeks time? Yes, yeah, certainly you can. You can start in two weeks time, that's fine. Uh, that's not a problem for us. The only problem I would say is that you're gonna miss out on some great money-making opportunities before then. Um, but yes, certainly we, we could help you with that. Sean, I know a lot of people are sitting there thinking, will I, won't I, will I, won't I, should I wait? I should have done it, I didn't do it. What would you say to these people right now if they're thinking about it? I would say that you are going to cost yourself an awful lot of money. Remember that example I gave you guys about opportunity cost. I mean, you think about Jonathan, one of our members, um, the fact that he made 1.48 million in profit this year, if he hadn't have done anything 
he would have missed out on that money. You've got to understand that the volatility in the market, the opportunity that's going to present itself in 2021 with what's going on globally and the massive moves we're going to see, you are going to miss out on substantial amounts of money. You can't afford to sit on the sidelines anymore. Uh -huh. Now's the time to take action. So for me, I would say you're missing out on a lot of money. Uh, grab this opportunity while it's here. You've got nothing to lose, 14 day money back guarantee, and you've got everything to gain. Absolutely. Sean, can you give us some last words, uh, uh, my friend? I would just say, look, if you're on the fence here, well, there's only a couple of positions left anyway, but I would grab those positions now simply because you have little to no downside, right? 14 day money back guarantee. The upside I know is enormous. And just the four positions that I've researched for you and I'll give you right now are going to make you a huge amount of money. So okay. grab this opportunity while it's here. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for being with us and part of the GoCo channel today. And uh, you have a wonderful day. And to everybody out there, come on, if you're thinking about it, don't think about it, just do it. Just get out there and do it now. Okay, th thank you for that. Now we're going to have our next speaker and last speaker. And I've asked Aidan Michelson to speak to us. And the reason I asked Aidan to come is because this whole Bitcoin thing is gone crazy. And um, it's time that... Um, you know, we all probably sit down and listen. What is going on in this world of cryptocurrency? You're, you're seeing it go up, you see it go down a bit, and then just races up again. And so we've got um, Aidan Michelson, who is standing by. Now, I just see, um, I don't know if Aidan is there at the moment. It, um, is he there? G'day, Greg. How are you, mate? I'm, oh, mate. Good to see you, mate. Looking as handsome as ever. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, Louise. <laughs> um, anyway, mate, let me do. I'm just going to turn my screen off. I know how to use these um, uh, 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 bu buttons. Uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I can share my. Do you want me to share my screen here? Yeah, you. Hang on, he's starting my video now. You see? Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, Jonathan, you can try that all you like. My <laughs> Look out, my friend. That bonus may be gone for the quarter. Um, great to see you, and we're looking forward to it. Hey, mate, what's going on with cryptocurrency? Goodness yeah. gracious me. You know, there we were um, after Michael Turpin, and uh, Bitcoin was $30,000, remember? Yeah, absolutely. It got to 55, 56? Yeah, it got to almost 60,000 and then uh, just bounced back a bit, but they're all buying opportunities at the moment. There's just so much happening in the space. So yeah, it got lots to cover today. <laughs> and these guys are all saying this is going to race to 100,000. Uh, and and, we, and I watched it within, how long ago was it? Well, that was only three or four or five weeks ago. Yeah. With Michael Turpin. Yeah. And so many, so many of the cryptos have gone, it's all been drawn up together. Yep. 100%. So everybody, please listen to this young man. He has a fantastic message. And like it or not, we all need to learn about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Aiden, over to you. Awesome. Cheers, Greg. And um, yeah, guys, absolutely. It's an exciting time. I, I, I really do think that this is history in the making that we're seeing. And um, yeah, the look, we've got a lot to cover. I'm just going to quickly share my screen before I go on a big tangent. Uh, one moment. Hopefully everyone can see that all right. So um, yeah, guys, welcome on board. Look, um, like you can see, unless you've been living under a rock, the market's absolutely going parabolic at the moment. And guys, like I said just before, it, it really is history in the making. We, we're seeing Fortune 500 companies getting involved now. Uh, hedge funds pouring billions of dollars into it, not just hedge funds, but now corporations as well, um, you know, getting rid of their cash reserves and putting in that into things, assets like Bitcoin. Um, you know, and with so much turbulence happening, I mean, we're seeing, you know, trillions of dollars being injected into the economy. You know, it's very turbulent, the markets all around, right? Um, but also with that turbulence, folks, it brings around a lot of opportunity as well. And that's why now it's so imperative. If you have been sitting on the rock, you know, sitting on the fence, I should say, with this uh, market, guys, you know, this is the time to be getting informed right now as we speak. And I honestly do believe 2021 is going to shape up to be one of the biggest rallies we're going to see in this market. 
um, because yeah, look, I've got lots to cover. I won't go too much of a tangent now, but um, and I'll get into all this stuff and so much more, guys. And look, there's going to be Q and A at the end of the day as well. So if you've got any questions, do fire away. I'll be happy to answer those. But guys, look, today I want to talk about how you can get involved. Uh, more importantly, what it is you need to know and how you can really start to capitalize on this market and you know jump on these gains without having to ma have massive risk, right? That's one of the things. People feel like you need to go all in or nothing in this space. And it's just quite frankly not true, right? You could be putting in as little as a couple of hundred dollars in this space and watching your investment grow uh, exponentially, right? With some of these particular assets. And guys, if you think Bitcoin's done well, well, I'm telling you right now, we're sitting on, I mean, we got assets uh, right now that we're looking at, which I'm going to be sharing some today, that I believe are actually going to even potentially outperform Bitcoin over the coming years. And I know that's a massive statement, but guys, you know, if you really start to dig deep into this market and you see what it's all about and how much bigger this is getting, you will be converted. And look, I'm going to do my best to paint the big picture here. So with that said, let's just dive in and I'll get straight to it, guys. But look, I just want to give you a bit of a story, a bit of my background and uh, talk about how I even turned a $983 investment into as high as $100,000 plus in as little as 90 days and how I'm already seeing people do even more than that now um, as we're very much at the early stages of this new market rally. So uh, lots to discuss there, folks. Now, look, guys, for those of you that are just tuning in and you've never heard me speak before and you want to know what, you know, if this webinar is worthwhile hanging around, well, look, here's a few key things. You know, you may have heard about people talking about these 3,000 to even 80,000% gains in this market. And while that may seem astronomical and unbelievable, folks, we're already seeing this in the market right now and the market hasn't even come close to its peak. Uh, you know, so this is what I'm trying to share. I'm going to be talking about today. And guys, we're already making these sort of gains within just the last few months. Um, so, and again, I'm going to show you all this and more today. So this is why it's now so important to be getting alert and starting to understand what's happening in this space. Also, you may just be tuning in because you want to know if this market's in a bubble. Um, everyone loves to throw around the terms bubble. I mean, everything is looking quite bubbly. But my question, guys, is different. You know, what if this is the start of something much bigger? You know, this could be, in my opinion, guys, one of the most significant market rallies we may witness in our lifetime. And I know, again, that's a massive statement. But what we're seeing is completely unprecedented at the moment. And with so much turbulence happening in the market, uh, folks, we're talking about major transfers of wealth happening in all different asset classes, multi-trillion dollar asset classes. And you got to remember how small this market still is. You know, if you feel like you've missed the boat, folks, I'm telling you right now, the boat hasn't even left the dock. Um, and guys, that's why I'm saying now's the time to pay attention uh, because we're already seeing many people become millionaires out of this market. And like I said, you know, we are still in the early, very early phases of this. Also, um, you may just be retiring soon, guys, and you're worried about living off the pension. And let's face it, who wouldn't be, right? If that's you guys and you're coming up to that time, I mean, it's a pretty nerve wracking time. I mean, their governments, as everyone knows, they're ticked up to the eyeballs in debt, folks. And quite frankly, that's debt that they're never going to be able to pay back. And that's why we seriously need to start considering a plan B, folks, if you haven't done so already. And I want to talk about why cryptocurrencies is something we want to look at as a plan B right now. Also, you may just want to learn how to maintain your lifestyle and the current standard of living that you have right now. But again, how the heck do you do that with so much geopolitical uncertainty, right? You got, you know, China tariff wars still going on with the states here in Australia. Um, you know, you got money being printed out into oblivion and diluting the value of everyone's savings. Uh, you got this whole COVID rampant stuff still going on. Um, you know, we don't really necessarily see it too much here, but in places like the states and in Europe and the UK, it's, um, you know, it's insane. So um, I want to talk about how you can use cryptocurrencies again, folks, as a tool uh, to mitigate this risk and create this financial security and create even multiple streams of passive income and other things, guys, like we have not ever seen in any other type of traditional market. It's just exponential, the growth we're seeing. Well, look, you may just be here because you want to leave a legacy for your family, guys. And look, here's the thing, right? We, we are seeing billions of dollars pour into this market right now. And within the next 60 minutes, folks, you're going to understand why trillions more are going to flood this market. Now, not only is that going to allow you to leave a legacy for your family, folks, if you start getting informed today, but this is what you could call generational wealth, right? Uh, and for those of you that get set up, guys, and you understand how to get the right setup, how to put the safety nets in place, which I'm going to be talking about today, 
folks, you can hand this down for generations to come because this market's here to stay and it's only going to grow as you're soon about to understand. Again, I'm just gonna connect all the dots, folks. And then you can make your own mind up about it. Take plenty of screenshots if you need to. I got that much information to cover, cover but I'm gonna make sure I put it in a nice concise way so that you can digest it all. So look, so much to cover folks, but just in a nutshell, this is what you're ultimately gonna walk away with. I'm gonna give you my proven methods to safely invest in this market, guys, with little to even no risk. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more. Uh, I wanna talk about how 2% of Bitcoin can even dramatically increase your investment portfolio and mitigate risk in that portfolio. I wanna talk about why this pandemic is pushing cryptocurrencies to a multi-trillion dollar asset class. I wanna also talk about how you can generate 100X returns from what people simply do not see coming still, folks. There is that many people still burying their heads in the sand with what's happening. And I'm telling you right now, there is a wall of money coming into this space. And if you get positioned before that wall of money comes here, folks, this is where I'm telling you, this is going to be generational wealth for those that get uh, informed about what's happening. And finally, folks, just quite frankly, you're going to walk understand by the end of today why 2021 will be the greatest wealth building year of your life. So look, that's a big statement. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to unpack all this. Now, look, uh, for those of you that have never seen me speak, so guys, I've spoken to thousands of people now all around Australia, over in New Zealand, and over in the UK and America. Um, and look, I've talked about cryptocurrencies, about how people can get in this space and safely get set up. But if you've never seen me speak, spoke, uh, never seen me live speak before, guys, or anything like that, um, let me just take a moment to explain, you know, how the heck I got where I am talking to you all here today and uh, exactly what it is that we do, right? So quite frankly, guys, it's probably not what you're thinking because just a few years ago, in fact, this is actually what I used to call home. <laughs> um, guys, I used to be a high voltage electrician in the mining industry of Western Australia. Um, and basically I used to go out and do field service and I'd live out in the middle of basically nowhere. I just sometimes wouldn't get phone reception. And um, I'd be away from friends and family for months at a time before I'd get a flight back. And I'd just be living out in basically the dirt. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, guys, I was just going around fixing heavy earth moving equipment, um, fault finding things and whatnot. And I was bouncing from one mine site to the next, uh, just basically fixing faults on different machines, right? And um, guys, I absolutely hated this lifestyle. I missed out on birthdays, I missed out on weddings, I missed out on all sorts of things uh, because I basically was working 85% of the year and um, you know, barely having a chance to come back and catch up with people. And I did this for about seven years, folks. And the reason I hated it is because I can literally summarize what my life looked like for seven years straight, guys, um, in just three photos. <laughs> in the far left-hand corner here, folks, look, I used to live in these little three by three meter sea containers, um, what's known as dongers for those of you that are tuning in from overseas. Um, so guys, you may be aware of them. And look, they were tiny rooms. They heat up really quick, especially when you're out in the middle of nowhere. And um, yeah, and then guys, I'd wake up, head down these dusty old red roads, go work under these trucks for anywhere between 12 to 14 hours a day, getting covered in absolutely everything you can imagine. Then I'd get jammed back in a bus, head down that road, guys, and I'd be put back in my little three by three meter sea container. That was it for about six years, folks. And then one day I woke up and just said, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> so I'm sure some of you sitting there, folks, have had that time in your life where you just think, you know what? Enough is enough. Right. And for me, it was coming back off that bus one day, covered in grease, oil, flies, just absolutely stinking. And I went to go open my donger and basically, guys, the aircon was just broken. It was about 40 degrees. And I just thought, stuff this. <laughs> right. Um, so, look, I just handed in my notice to my supervisor. And I literally, within a couple of days, guys, I was dumb and dusted. I got back to Perth and look, guys, I had no idea what I wanted to do. All I knew is that I just did not ever want to have to go back up to that mining industry <laughs> again. So look, I tried everything. I, um, you know, I got into flipping properties. You know, I got into trading equities. I got into um, selling products on uh, different uh, e-commerce sites. And look, while they're all very lucrative uh, niches, folks, it just never really fitted with me, right? It just wasn't kind of in my flow. And then, you know what, I was sitting there at a mate's place one day thinking, what the heck am I going to do next? And then my friend turned around when I remember I was still sitting on his balcony and I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do? And he goes, Aiden, have you ever heard about this thing called Bitcoin, right? The first time I've ever heard about it, it was probably late 2016 when I first heard about it. And he goes, and I go, what is it? And he goes, well, I actually mine this stuff from home. 
Now, <laughs> me having a mining background, you can imagine what I was instantly thinking. I was trying to think of the logistics of how he was mining these Bitcoins from home. And immediately I thought his house looked something like this. <laughs> I thought he was digging these things up from his basement or something and then selling these Bitcoins on Gumtree. I, I had no idea, right? As I'm sure most people do when they first hear about this whole Bitcoin mining stuff. And he goes, no, 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 mate, let me show you what my real setup looks like. And then he took me into this other room and he had all these different GPUs basically connected to all this hardware. Um, and basically, guys, he was just mining this stuff 24 seven, uh, virtually mining it online. And as when you know, when you first hear about it, guys, it just goes completely over the top of your head, right? Um, so look, but this is the different thing here, folks, you know, instead of just dismissing it and thinking this is just ridiculous, you know, what the heck's he doing? He's probably just some kind of, you know, scam, or whatever the case is, guys, I took the time to understand it, right? I went home that day after he told me what he was doing and I read everything and anything I could get my hands on about Bitcoin. And this was back in late 2016, where I really decided to get, or I really got excited about the space. And now after months of researching what the heck this thing was, folks, I finally went out and decided to pull the trigger. And it was about early 2017 that I did that. Unfortunately, I waited a little bit too long, but guys, I didn't want to rush into this, right? I really wanted to understand what the heck this thing was, right? And after really seeing the market it was addressing and what the technology was behind it, which I'm going to be talking about a bit later, that's what got me excited. Right. And at this point, everyone thought I was absolutely crazy now going from doing all this other stuff to now buying virtual currencies. But I didn't care what they said, guys, because I took the time to understand what this was really about. So here I was going out and buying Bitcoin at $1,700 per Bitcoin in late 2017. In fact, <laughs> here's a photo of me basically pretty fresh out of the mining, guys, uh, where I went out and decided to buy my first ever 4.1 Bitcoins for $11,000 back then. And as you can see, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to learn. I was going on Reddit forums, trying to understand how this worked. And yeah, guys, that's a picture of me back in the very first days that I finally went out and bought my first Bitcoin. Now, for those of you that have gone out and already bought this stuff, guys, as you would know, you know, Bitcoin very much acts as a gateway, especially back in 2017. You had to own Bitcoin before you could go and buy any of these other cryptocurrencies, right? It was basically the gateway into the cryptocurrency market. So look, what I ended up doing is I bought this Bitcoin. Then I went, you know what, I'm going to go start buying some of these other cryptocurrencies that I started researching. Now, look, what I'm going to show you here, folks, is what happened over the course of 90 days after first investing into Bitcoin and then investing into a handful of other assets similar to Bitcoin. Now, the first one I got into guys was a project called Dash and within 90 days that shot up over 118%. Now, I only had just under $2,000 on this trade guys, but nevertheless, I still walked away with over four and a half thousand dollars. Uh, well, that's what my trade ended up growing to. You know, you look at things like the S&P 500 folks, the top 500 companies in the US. And, you know, that's over the last five years, typically made about 60%. You know, I just made this in 90 days and I was absolutely blown away <laughs> um, by even just getting this on a small investment. Then the second one I got into was another project called Ethereum, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you might be aware of now. This is now the second largest cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin. But after 90 days, folks, I invested into this and that shot up 230%. So I had just over 2,000 on this guys, and I almost made $7,000 on this one trade. So as you can imagine, the excitement was really starting to build at this point. But then I also invested into another cryptocurrency, and that was called NEO. Now, at the time, guys, I was only sitting at about 45 cents when I first invested in. Now, in order to invest into this type of uh, cryptocurrency, guys, I had to use an exchange called Bittrex. Now, this is where you go to send your Bitcoin, and then you use that Bitcoin to buy other cryptocurrencies. They don't accept Australian dollars, US dollars, or anything like that. So look, this is Bittrex. And as you can see here, folks, I was buying not just NEO, but I was buying all these other different cryptocurrencies here around the same time. But look, on the 17th of May, 2017, I purchased 2,234 NEO at the time. And back then, guys, it cost me around 0.19 Bitcoins, which at the time, that was equivalent to about $983, right? Now, what happened next, folks, was completely unprecedented, right? In that same 90-day period, NEO shut up over 10,000%, right? That turned my little $983 investment into as high as $106,000 plus, so you know what I did when I basically made a year's wage had I been working in the mining industry still? <laughs> Guys, I went straight back to Bittrex after 90 days 
And on the 17th of August, it was literally 90 days on the dot. I sold 2,234 NEO and I got back around 26.8 Bitcoins back then, right? That's only, that was only worth about $106,000 then. But guys, let me just stop there for a moment because you're probably thinking, hold on, Ada, what the heck, are you, what did you just do here? You know, did, did you have a crystal ball that told you that NEO was about to go absolutely parabolic? <laughs> Not at all, right? But folks, this is what I do understand about cryptocurrencies. And that's that they represent a new disruptive asset class. And like anything that's disruptive, right, there's plenty of room for growth. Now, look, does that mean you go run out and go remortgage the house, go get a credit card loan, um, you know, put your whole savings on it, folks? <laughs> Not at all. And simply because we don't need to, right? Folks, cryptocurrencies are what's known as an asymmetric investment. An asymmetric investment, guys, basically means that for every $1 you invest, you could potentially make 10 or more dollars. But what's your risk capped out? It's capped at $1, right? So folks, that's what gives us a brilliant risk to reward ratio because it means we only need to risk a small amount of capital to make an enormous sum of money. And this is a perfect example of what I've been doing now since I've entered the market. Folks, here it is in black and white. To get into this market and really capitalize on this space, it's about using small, even position sizes across a handful of different ideas that you see these sort of asymmetric returns in. So all these different assets I was investing in, guys, I saw the asymmetric return, meaning I knew that the upside potential of these projects were enormous, but the downside, in my opinion, guys, was extremely small. And this is how I turned a $983 investment into over $100,000 plus, guys because it's asymmetric risk to reward. And that right there is the opportunity, folks. Now, look, had I had that crystal ball, like I mentioned about earlier, I can tell you right now, I wouldn't have sold this trade because what happened just a few months later, NEO continued to go sky high, folks. In fact, had I held on just a few more months, it would have shot up over 41,000%. And I almost would have made half a million dollars from less than a thousand bucks. Folks, this is what I'm talking about. It is not about breaking the bank with this market. It is about having some exposure to this new disruptive asset class, even if it's something like 1%, folks. Again, you don't need to invest with money you can't afford to lose, guys. But having no exposure to this market, um, to me, that's more of a risk than anything, guys, because you are missing out on a dis super disruptive technology right now. And it's still continuing to grow and growing much more rapidly now. So guys, look, after I started making these sort of gains, well, quite naturally, I had other people coming after me. And at first it was my family. <laughs> um, so look, my brother came after me, right? And he was like, look, how do I get into this market? What do I need to be doing? Now he had a bit more of a high risk tolerance, right? So he managed to put $12,000 into this, put it onto a few different speculative ideas. And guys, within five days, he generated over 116%. Basically turned his 12K investment into $26,000 in as little as five days. Then I had my parents wanting to know a little bit more about it, right? So they managed to round up about $21,000, folks, and they managed to generate $257,000 in seven months. And folks, they stuck with the three top most conservative cryptocurrencies, right? And back in 2017, that was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Right? They just had exposure to the top three. And these were the sort of returns they had. Now, after I got my family set up in this, my brother and my parents, well, I had my Nana come after me as well. <laughs> so guys, I helped her generate, you know, from her self-managed super fund, you know, she, she wanted to put a small amount in, turned a 5K investment into $33,000 in three months. Again, going for the most conservative assets. And that's what I'm trying to say here, folks. It's not about breaking the bank, but it's about getting some exposure in the market, right? Now, look, after I was doing this, folks, one thing led to the next. Basically, today, guys, I just go around and I've been teaching people all around the world for the last four years now about how they can be getting exposure to this market by making well-informed decisions, overcoming misconceptions, and understanding this simple strategy, guys, which is having a long-term time horizon in this market and let the market do the heavy lifting for us. It's not about going in there and trying to trade the tops and trade the bottoms, guys. It's about finding a core portfolio position, guys, and let the market do the heavy lifting. And that simple strategy alone, without having to go in there and tinker with things, guys, has made most people I've worked with, thousands of people around the world now, absolute fortunes, folks. In fact, you know, I've started building this business. It was me and my sister that ended up putting this together. And I'm going to be getting her on uh, later on today as well, folks. 
But we decided, you know what, why don't we teach other people the same strategies that I was using for me and my family and start showing other people how to get exposure to it. So me and my sister, we put this company together. And ever since, guys, this is what we've been continuing to grow and just getting the information out there so you too can make well-informed decisions, understand the strategies we use and overcome a lot of the misconceptions that exist out there. Right. And it's the same thing that's helped Ben over here double the money that he allocated from his self-managed super fund. Again, you don't want to be relying off the government's folks for your pensions and other things right now when they're ticked up to the eyeballs in debt. You know, it's um, it's a very turbulent time right now and the future is very uncertain. Um, so this is where we want to start taking control of our own financial security. Right. Even one of our other clients, he didn't want to be named, which is fair enough, but he let me he said I could share with you his uh, portfolio. Uh, and this was from Independent Reserve. Guys, he's sitting on $291,000 in pure profit with zero risk. How did he do that? Let me quickly explain. Guys, he invested it. Well, he bought 15 Bitcoins plus a handful of other cryptocurrencies for $139,000, right? Then what he did was seven months later, the market started to move. And what he wanted to do was just take his initial investment out. So he had to just sell nine Bitcoins and he managed to profit $142,000. And then after that, folks, He's today now sitting on $291,000 of crypto in nothing but pure profits. This is what I mean. You can have little to even no risk in this market. And he said, Aiden, I just want to let the market do the heavy lifting. I don't even want to be looking at it. And uh, yeah, and this is what he's managed to do, folks. So again, there's multiple ways to skin the cat in this space. Again, it's not about going all in. You don't have to break the bank to do it, guys. You can have some exposure and you can minimize that exposure by taking your initial investment out once you've made profit in it. Right, so there's so many different ways you can go about doing this, but the biggest risk in my opinion, folks, is simply not having exposure in this space because it's here to stay. Uh, another one of our clients, Alex, just a few days ago, guys, he sent me this through. He generated $16,000 in 18 days and he wrote to me and said, this stuff is starting to become life-changing. Why is that the case? Because folks, this was just the start for them and so many other people that I've been helping. Look, in just the last nine months, folks, these are some of the returns we've had. I can't share these coins because it'd be a bit unfair to some of our members, but I can show you the results that we've had. We've generated almost $2,000 on one particular trade in the last nine months, uh, just over $2,000 on another trade in the last nine months. And even one of these other trades, guys, which I believe has the potential to even be bigger than Bitcoin. And I know that's a big statement. Um, you know, it's already up four and a half thousand percent. And I believe we have a heck of further to go with just this one particular trade. And again, these are the opportunities that are popping up in this space, folks. And this is what I'm trying to inform as much people as I can about, because this is life-changing wealth, right? Um, just take a look at Kate here. You know, she put $4,000 into that last trade that I just talked about, this one right here, and generated $85,000, folks, in two months, right? That is, that's a massive amount of money. That's someone's yearly wage. And that's what you just generated on the side within a couple of months. Again, like I said, having some exposure, folks, is better than having none. I'm going to be a bit of a broken record saying that throughout this. Um, you know, this is Julia. Uh, basically come and joined us basically a few months ago, guys. And, um, you know, I believe it was December 2020. 3x her entire portfolio in as little as 45 days. Uh, you know, what other markets can do that sort of returns? And, you know, what some of this in that situation, guys, What's the harm in removing your initial investment out of that and then let the rest ride? Again, these are the sort of things I'm trying to convey to people uh, to minimize that at risk. Now, look, going back to those three trades that I showed you, you know, had you had $10,000 on just each of them in the last nine months, you know, you could have generated $196,000, $204,000, or even $468,000, almost half a million dollars. And had you had $10,000 on each in the last nine months, folks, you could have almost generated a million dollars plus, right? in just as little as nine months. And again, these are trades that we still continue to see grow as of this moment. Now, look, it's not just the ones we're looking at, folks. Unless you've been living under a rock, you would have noticed that this is happening across the board. We're seeing this happen with other different projects like REN, like Utrust, like Celsius, Kusama, Aave. Um, we're seeing massive, massive gains here. In fact, one trade alone called Yearn Finance, right? That start off at $34. Now it's trading at over $38,000, right? That's, that could have turned a $1,000 investment into $1.1 million in 44 days. <laughs> so again, this is the opportunity, folks. And I think this is what people forget is that you don't have to break the bank. So why am I showing you all of this? Well, guys, it's simple. 
Like I just mentioned before, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to make this life-changing wealth. And the reason I can say that is because I'm seeing that, right? I'm seeing that happen with thousands of people that we've helped. And, you know, the, the feedback that we get from guys is just second to none, guys. It's unreal just to see how these simple strategies, um, you know, can really radically change people's lives. Um, and again, like I said, it's not about breaking the bank. But guys, this is the catch. If you continue to ignore this market, you're quite frankly just going to get left behind. Um, you know, and this is the key message I'm trying to convey here because these gains that I'm talking about right now aren't going to be around forever, right? There's an opportunity cost to sitting on that fence, folks. And it's already costing people thousands, if not millions of dollars by doing so. And this is why I'm saying it's so important to understand the big picture and see where this market is going rather than just burying your head in the sand about it. I mean, it's gotten so big now, folks, that we're seeing some of the most respectable investors right now come out with these sort of predictions about Bitcoin, of Bitcoin potentially hitting $100,000, $250,000, 400000 dollars 700000 even $1 million per Bitcoin by the year 2025. Right, so why the heck, how the heck do they get those numbers? And that's what I'm gonna dive into a little bit more. I mean, we've even had the World Economic Forum and Cisco, right? Two fairly small entities, you could say. <laughs> Guys, they came out and said 10% of the world's wealth will likely be stored on blockchain technology by the year 2027. This means as much as $10 trillion of global GDP could be stored on decentralized and permission-based blockchains in the next six years. Folks, if that happens, that basically means this market, the entire cryptocurrency market from here will 10x. And that's not considering any other outside factors, right? Again, you've got international remittance markets. You've got all these different markets that this market is going after. And this is just one aspect that people are looking at right now. And that alone would be a 10x. I mean, just a few months ago, we saw Citibank come out and believe that by the end of this year, guys, by the year 2021, Citibank analysts came out and said that they see Bitcoin hitting 300,000 US dollars by the end of this month. So, you know, guys, you can't make this stuff up. And that's what I'm trying to say here. And I'm going to be explaining why that's the case and where they're getting these numbers from and why we're now seeing massive hedge funds pour billions of dollars into this market. And again, folks, if you're sitting there and thinking, oh, but I, don't know, I heard from a mate at a barbecue that this stuff isn't a go and that he got burnt doing this and... Guys, here's the thing. If you're skeptical, I completely understand because quite frankly, you know, whether it's you're at a barbecue and getting this kind of information from a mate or you're just hearing this from the media, I mean, guys, they've been doing you a massive disservice. I mean, let's just look at what the media has been putting out over the last few years. Uh, Wired came out and put out an article back there when Bitcoin was $2.30, basically calling the rise and fall of Bitcoin, basically saying Bitcoin's dead, right? That's when it was at $2.30. You know, would that, you know, as you can tell, that would have cost you a lot of money had you bought into that narrative that they were pushing back then. Then Forbes came out and said, you know what, this is the end of Bitcoin. This is that headline of this article when it was $15.15. .15. Bloomberg said Bitcoin's doomed to fail. Business Insider Australia said Bitcoin is a joke at $266. The New York Times called Bitcoin's doomed to fail. Washington Post called it a Ponzi. Yahoo Finance said it's dead. And in fact, guys, it's become such an ongoing joke in this space that someone's actually gone out of their way uh, to create a website dedicated to the Bitcoin obituaries. And this is all basically tied to all these different uh, major news outlets uh, calling the end of Bitcoin. And guys, Bitcoin's the honey badger of this space, right? It just keeps on doing its thing. And when you start to understand the technicals and how it's been built off, guys, you're going to understand why what they're saying, guys, is completely out of whack, right? And that's what I'm going to be unpacking today. But here's something else the media was wrong about, folks, that you could probably relate to. There was this thing called um, the internet. <laughs> and this is what the headline back in uh, 1995, these are the headlines that used to come out, right? And they used to say things like, the internet is a fad. Most things that succeed don't require retraining 250 million people. Or I predict the internet will soon go spectacularly supernova in 1996 and then catastrophically collapse. And this is my favorite one. No online database will replace your daily newspaper. No CD-ROM can take place of a competent teacher and no computer network will change the way governments work today. Folks, this wasn't too long ago that this is what they were saying. My point is, guys, is that each generation sees innovation and today it's mostly digital. Now, for the baby boomers listening, I want you to do me a favour quickly. I want you to think back into your 20s right now and I want you to think about what was disruptive back then. And 
a few things you're probably thinking about are things like the PC, like Apple or like Microsoft, right? And while they were disruptive assets and they emerged back in, back then, folks, between 1970 and 1980, right? Prior generations have thought that was a flash in the pan. These things are ridiculous. They're not going to go absolutely anywhere. And I could almost guarantee that everyone listening to me right now is either using a PC or using an Apple <laughs> uh, just to listen to this webinar, right? but it was misunderstood by prior generations. Now look, any generation X, I want you to now think back in your twenties. And what did you find disruptive that you believe was misunderstood by the prior generations? And a few things might've been Google, text messaging, mobile data, the digital cell phone, email. And while that was misunderstood by prior generations, guys, you probably didn't think necessarily that was the case. And today, well, given how things operate today, guys, we couldn't live without these uh, different technologies at the moment. It's how the world operates around. And the same thing goes with my generation folks, right? The millennials. And these are the sort of things that we, we witnessed. And just to give you an idea here, guys, let, let's imagine we had a time machine. And if I jumped in that time machine and I said, hey, look, there's going to be this thing called Facebook. And it's going to be the world's most popular media company, but it creates no content. You would have thought I lost the plot. Or what if I turned around and said, and also there's going to be this thing called Uber. It's the largest taxi firm. And hey, it owns no cars. You would have thought I've just gone absolutely mad. And then I said, whoa, whoa, but there's also another thing. There's this thing called Airbnb. It's the largest accommodation provider and actually owns no property. <laughs> you would have thought I've lost the, absolutely lost the plot by this point. And then if I finished off by saying, and there's going to be finally this thing called Bitcoin, and it's going to be one of the world's first potential global currencies. And look, there's no bank even behind it. You probably have thrown me in a loony bin by this point and thrown away the keys, right? And this is what I mean, folks. You know, it's technology that always races ahead. In fact, by David Middleback, he says, technology always races ahead and education is left behind. I mean, how true is that, right? So guys, this is what I'm trying to do here. This is what you need to know so you don't get left behind. Like I said, the boat hasn't even left the dock. You know, for those of you sitting on the fence thinking you've already missed the gains in this market. So let me just quickly set the stage, uh, stage here. Folks, as we speak, you know, as you've seen, these are just some photos from 2020, right? You know, the global economy is skating on thin ice, right? We're seeing headlines like small businesses are dying by the thousands, coronavirus spread showing no signs of slowing down, unemployment crisis getting worse, families struggling to get basic needs to survive amid the pandemic. Uh, coronavirus bailouts will cost taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars and the list goes on. But here's the thing, how are governments responding to all of this? Well, guys, as you probably know, they are printing their national currencies into oblivion, <laughs> right? Look, in places like Qatar, Canada, New Zealand and Brazil, they are printing tens of billions of dollars right now to fight this. In places like Australia, the UK and Europe, they are printing hundreds of billions of dollars. And folks in places like the US, which is the reserve currency of the world and Japan, I mean, they're printing out trillions of dollars. Let me put this, let me, let me paint the picture here. Guys, in the US, which is the reserve currency, right? <laughs> which 80% of the world relies on for trade and other things. Between 1930, which was when the central bank was created, which prints all the money, and 2008, before the global financial crisis, there was $8.8 .8 trillion worth of debt created in 95 years, right? Remember that number for me. Because between 2008 and 2021, folks, there is $19 trillion of all the US debt, that is 67%, was added in just the last 13 years. This is what a picture of it looks like. This is how fast debt is growing right now. Look, in 95 years, they generated $8.8 .8 trillion. But in literally the last 13 years, folks, they've generated $19 trillion. Do you see this slowing down? And again, this is, you know, this is the elephant in the room, folks. People will argue about this little small asset class like Bitcoin and just say, it's this, it's that and the other. But if you turn around, folks, and you look at the bigger picture, what you should be more concerned about, it's this wall of debt that's building up. And that's just the US alone. In fact, in 2020 alone, guys, they'd printed $9 trillion. That's 22% of all the US uh, debt. So, I mean, all the US dollars that was created. Folks, that's $9 trillion. In one year, they generated more debt or more money than what they took to generate in 95 years. <laughs> um, and that's just the insanity of what's going on. And, you know, will 2021 be any different? Well, folks, Biden's already just been put into office and already talking about a $1.9 trillion economic recovery plan with already rumors going around that he's talking about grabbing another $3 trillion and injecting that into the economy. So where does the buck stop? 
When does enough become enough, right? So why should you care about all this debt anyway? Everyone goes, I'll, I'll say that to most people. They go, well, hold on, Aiden, you know, it's not even my debt. I don't have to pay it back. Well, guys, you'd be wrong, right? Because debt creates inflation and this inflation that it creates is the ultimate hidden tax on your savings, right? Let me give you an example. As they print more debt, you would notice that, you know, 30 years ago, guys, you would have been able to buy a lot more than what you can buy today, right? And that's because by design, our national currency is designed to inflate every single year by 2%. So if your bank isn't paying you 2% interest on your money, folks, you are going backwards, right? Because your dollars are becoming buying less and you're having less and less purchasing power. So what happens when you get JobKeeper? What happens when you get these stimulus checks in the mail? Or what happens when you do quantitative easing, which by the way, are all different words for money printing. Folks, I can guarantee you right now, it's higher than 2%, the amount of money inflation that's happening right now. And you can tell by the way of the prices of things today for goods and services, right? And this is what I'm saying. So people are sitting there saving, like if I've got a million dollars, guys, and inflation goes up by say 5%, you can wipe off 5% of that million dollars, right? Because that's your purchasing power decreasing. And people don't pay attention to that because it's that hidden tax. Uh, and, you know, like I said, just think back 30 years ago and think how much more you could have bought back then as opposed to what you can literally buy today. And where it's more noticeable, folks, is where they've just gone and done this uh, to a point of what's called hyperinflation. So let's look at Venezuela. Folks, they flooded their economy with so many dollars that this is what it takes to buy a loaf of bread, a chicken and a toilet roll, right? You literally need a wheelbarrow full of cash just to go buy these three items over in Venezuela right now. Uh, we've, we've heard about the rumors what happened over in Zimbabwe, not, not the rumors I should say, but what actually happened. They raised the denomination of their notes so high that they have starving billionaires over there at the moment. And that's what happens when they fire up that printing press folks and flood the market with new dollars. And meanwhile, you're sitting there working your guts out and saving all this money in the bank and you're actually going backwards because inflation is chewing away at those at your life savings. And this is just the insanity of what's happening. You know, and this is what Venezuela looks like today, folks. Their streets are literally littered full of this cash. And you know what they're doing with their cash instead of using it for goods and services? They're creating arts and crafts and they're selling that over to Colombia because they make more money doing that than carrying this around in wheelbarrows full of cash to go buy three items down the shop. And guys, this is a fiat currency, right? A fiat currency is just government-backed currencies. And this is the, what the entire world operates off is one of the longest lasting experiments that we've had for this particular fiat currency, right? And again, it is an experiment and that's what everyone needs to remember. And with debt continuing to skyrocket at the moment, folks, not just in the US, but all around the world right now, you know, we're past the point of no return and the global, the entire economy guys, the, you know, the entire market regime is completely changing. What do I mean by that? Debt has gotten so high folks, that now they're talking about negative interest rates. What the heck does that mean? That means that if you leave your money in the bank, you're no longer earning an interest on your money, not that you probably are at the moment, but now you've got to pay the bank money to leave your money there. And not only that, but they're saying that things like inflation is the only way to pay off coronavirus debt, AKA let's keep saturating the market with more dollars so it makes our debt cheaper to pay down. So now not only are you losing purchasing power of your currency, but you're having to pay the bank more money to leave your money in that bank, which is losing purchasing power. And then we got these things called bonds, folks. Now I know a lot of people aren't very familiar with them, but this is technically an IOU. So when the government needs more money, they basically issue an IOU and they say, typically what they do is they'll give you an interest uh, to lend their money. But when it's a negative bond, folks, you're basically telling the government when they need money, here, here's my million dollars and I'll pay you extra cash uh, to use my money. And look, if none of that makes sense, guys, again, I'm trying to find the words here because really it shouldn't make sense at the end of the day. It's just totally flipped upside down in its head, everything that's happening right now. And that's because debt is piling up at an exponential rate. It is compounding because every time they release more debt, folks, that's more interest on that debt that they've got to continue to pay back. In fact, it's gotten so bad that the IMF is calling for somewhat of a reset right now, folks. This is the International Monetary Fund that is, overlooks all fiat currencies globally. And they came out and said this. I don't know how this wasn't uh, headline news on every single media, uh, major media station, but this is what they're talking about. 
And that's a big deal. And why is that the case? Because quite frankly, folks, when we see articles like this, that the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the United States pledges to print unlimited money, that should be alarming <laughs> because your savings is sitting in a bank account and it effectively has an infinite supply. I mean, again, guys, the, a good way to think about it is what's the difference between sand and the currency that you have? Both have an abundance at the moment. There's an infinite supply of both technically. So why would you put your life savings in an asset that can be inflated into existence? You know, th this is the type of thinking you need to you need to reframe your mind and how you think about things because this is what we're talking about. This is history in the making that we're seeing, and uh, and this is what makes Bitcoin and other things so apparent. In fact, Peter Schiff, you know, who Harry Dent was talking with not too long ago, he turned around and said the U.S. is about to experience one of the greatest inflationary periods in world history. Right, that's a big deal. Uh, billionaire Paul Tudor Jones said we are witnessing the great monetary inflation and unprecedented expansion of every form of money, unlike anything the developed world has ever seen before. Folks, you know, this is coming from some very savvy investors. Billionaire Ray Dalio, he said, I still think that cash is trash relative to other alternatives, particularly those that will retain their value or increase their value during reflationary periods. So now you're probably thinking, well, Ada, what the heck are these savvy investors doing to prepare for all this inflation right now? And guys, here's one thing they're doing they're getting into Bitcoin <laughs> and you know, why are they getting into Bitcoin? Let me just go back one second, guys. You got former hedge fund billionaire, Mike Novogratz picking Bitcoin over things like gold and US treasuries. You got billionaire Tim Draper admitting to moving his stock portfolio or portion over it into Bitcoin. Billionaire Stanley Drunk Amelia owns Bitcoin and sees it as an attractive store of value. Paul Tudor Jones says that he believes Bitcoin is going to be the best hedge against inflation. And again, guys, you know, they're not billionaires because they, they got lucky. They're billionaires because they understand how markets operate. So why are these investors turning to Bitcoin? Well, guys, here's one reason. Because there is a finite supply. Bitcoin can't be printed into oblivion like you can do with national currencies. But not only that, but Bitcoin soon, folks, is going to become the most scarce asset on the planet. And this is what people do not see coming. Now, let me explain. You see, guys, Bitcoins today are still being minted into circulation. According to CoinMarketCap, which is like the Google of the Facebook market, uh, sorry, of the uh, crypto market, what you can see on the far right-hand side here, folks, is you can see that there's a max supply and a total supply, right? A circulating supply and a max supply. So as we know, there's going to be a maximum supply of 21 million Bitcoins, but the current circulating supply of Bitcoin, there's only 18.6 million Bitcoins circulating around that people can buy and sell. So... How is Bitcoin mined, right? And I'm going to go back to what my, my friend used to do, sitting in his basement mining this stuff. <laughs> well, guys, here it is. Look, every 10 minutes, miners are reward, re rewarded newly created Bitcoins for validating transactions. So when they talk about these blocks on the blockchain, guys, when a block gets added to that, these miners earn a reward for adding that block, which is ultimately securing the transactions and validating transactions, right? Um, and look, today, guys, miners can earn 6.25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes for doing this, right? And that's the incentive for people to mine and secure transactions. But here's the thing that people don't understand, folks, which these billionaires and other major hedge funds are starting to understand. Every four years, these rewards that the miners earn are reduced by 50%. AKA, Bitcoin has a 50% deflationary rate, folks. So again, every, every four years, the supply of Bitcoin that gets drip fed into the market is reduced by 50%. And this is what I mean. So in 2008, folks, you could have earned 50 Bitcoins every 10 minutes for validating a block on the blockchain, right? But then four years passed and then all of a sudden the network updated its software and said, you know what? You're only going to earn 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. Then another four years passed and it went to 12 and a half. Another four years passed, it went to 6.25. And folks, this is going to continue to happen until the year 2140. And that's when the last Bitcoin is gonna be mined. That's over a hundred years away until that happens. And until then guys, Bitcoin is gonna to continue to get exponentially scarce. It is in fact, in the next year, four years guys, it's gonna become the most scarce asset on the planet because of that. It's gonna out exceed gold. It's gonna out exceed any type of other type of precious metal. And this is what makes it so unique. Every time it goes through these particular halving events is what they call them. So why is all that important to know? Well, guys, let me paint the 
picture here because this has significant implications to the price of Bitcoin. And that is what we've been seeing right now. So guys, as you can see here, when we went from 50 Bitcoins to 25 Bitcoins, well, what happened was Bitcoin shot up 80 times in value. Why? Because all of a sudden, miners adding those blocks onto the blockchain are earning 50% less to sell on the market. And it's basic supply and demand, guys. Think about basic economics 101. You know, if you've got less of something and more demand for something, then all of a sudden that's going to have uh, price appreciation. Then what happened, folks, is four years passed and we experienced Bitcoin's second halving event where it went from 25 Bitcoins to 12 and a half Bitcoins. And then all of a sudden we went up almost 29 times in value. Another four years passed and folks, this is what we experienced in 2020, right? We went through this third halving event. And in fact, this is where you are right here. So this is what you need to know, folks. Bitcoin has four year cycles, similar to how, how property has cycles, how commodities have cycles, how the stock market has cycles. Bitcoin typically has its four year cycle as well, folks. And it's based around these halving events that continue to reduce the supply of Bitcoin, the amount of newly created Bitcoins. So that's the first key thing you need to know. The second thing, guys, is that no more Bitcoin can be created. And this is what's super important. So pay attention. If there's a massive property boom, guys, people create more property, right? What's that do to every other block? It dilutes the value a little bit, right? Or what happens if there's a massive need for gold? Everyone ups their mining production, right? They create more diggers, they create more processing plants, right? But with Bitcoin, folks, you can't increase the supply. If every single computer on the planet decided to start mining Bitcoin, the network will still only release at the moment 6.25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And that's it. So that makes this one of the most soundest monies that we currently have at the moment, right? And again, this is what's so unique about it. You cannot up the supply of Bitcoin like you can with any other asset on the planet today. Inflation is reduced by 50%. Here's another thing, folks. Imagine I turned around to you and said, you know what? Every four years, we're gonna shut down 50% of all the gold miners. And we're gonna do that every four years for the next hundred years. What's that gonna to do to the price of gold? Well, obviously there's less people gonna be mining it every single year which does what to the price of gold? It'll drive the value up because it becomes more scarce. And that's what's happening with Bitcoin, folks. And that's what people can't appreciate with it just yet because there is no other asset class on the planet that replicates what Bitcoin does today. And this is what more people are catching on with as we speak. And finally, folks, you know, this is one of the biggest factors that most people don't consider. There is already estimated that 4 million Bitcoins have been lost forever, uh, forever. Right. So like I said, when we had it, when I was talking about 18 million bitcoins circulating around, there's really about 14 million circulating around because people lost their bitcoins. And once you lose your bitcoins, guys, there's no getting them back. It's kind of like this guy here who threw out his hard drive that had seven and a half thousand bitcoins in there. And now he's trying to go to the dump that he threw it out with and he's trying to offer them 70 million dollars. Uh, just to go ahead and try find this hard drive that he had. And this was people when they were mining Bitcoin back in the early days, guys, where they didn't think it would ever become anything. So this is why we've seen so much of the supply already completely wiped out forever. And that's a very, very unique factor with this market. So the question you're probably asking is, look, Aiden, how, you know, how far are we into this new cycle then? And are we too late? Because everyone's looking at the price here and thinking, oh my gosh, it's 56,000 US dollars right now, around about this market obviously is fluctuating quite a bit. But guys, let me explain it like this. Bitcoin at this current moment, folks, is only 154% above its previous all-time high. Now, why does that matter? Well, guys, let me show you what happens every time we see Bitcoin break its other previous all-time highs. When it broke this previous all-time high here, guys, back in 2011, and we saw a break pass in 2013, it shot up 730%. Then the second time after Bitcoin corrected down a bit and then broke past this back in 2013, Bitcoin shot up 625%, right? And then once we basically corrected a bit from here and Bitcoin broke out here, folks, Bitcoin shot up over 1800% to hit its new all-time high before correcting back down. Folks, we are only 154% above its previous all-time high and the fundamentals that we have now are unlike any other market rally. Let me explain, right? This rally that we saw here was fueled by retail investors. This second rally that we had here was fueled by retail investors. This third rally that we had here after Bitcoin broke its previous all-time high was fueled by retail investors and a small portion of institutional investors. 
Today, folks, we now have retail investors, but we have more institutional investors, some of the smartest money on the planet getting involved with this market. And we are still only 154% above Bitcoin's previous all-time high. Same Bitcoin is going to break $100,000, guys, in my opinion, is a conservative, a conservative outlook, right? Given what we're seeing right now, let me explain. Look, in the last three months, folks, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing major pension funds getting involved and buying Bitcoin. This is some of the most conservative money on the planet now getting involved with this market. You're seeing over 167-year-old uh, insurance companies getting involved. Mass mutual folks are buying Bitcoin and getting involved with the market. BlackRock, just a few days, guys, this is an $8.7 trillion asset manager. It's probably one of the most respected uh, financial institutions on the planet are now getting involved with this uh, with the cryptocurrency market. You got central banks buying it. You got hedge funds buying billions of dollars. Grayscale alone owns 3% of the entire supply of Bitcoin. MicroStrategies bought over $1.1 billion. And not too long ago, guys, PayPal and Square, right, two major financial um, providers, they were buying all the newly mined Bitcoin Coins from the miners, right? And what happens when they're not drip feeding Bitcoins onto the market? That's why we've seen the market being going absolutely parabolic because they're all buying up all the newly minted Bitcoins on the supply. Folks, it's not just that, but now we're seeing corporations create this new trend and they're actually buying Bitcoin and holding that in their reserve treasuries instead of holding things like cash because they're worried about the inflation that they see coming. So now they're converting their cash into Bitcoin and holding that on their balance sheet. That is a massive deal. Um, and here's just a few companies that we know of that are buying up massive amounts of Bitcoin. It started with micro strategies. And today, guys, they own $90,000 worth of Bitcoin, uh, 90,000 uh, Bitcoins, right? That's over $4.5 billion of Bitcoin that they have on their balance sheet today. Uh, Canadian software startups started putting 40% of their cash reserves into Bitcoin. UK listed firm called Mode put 10% of their cash reserves into Bitcoin. NASDAQ, put $150 million, uh, sorry, NASDAQ listed company called Marathon uh, Patent Group, put $150 million into Bitcoin. Folks, at the moment, just the institutions that we know about, they own 6.42% of the entire supply of Bitcoin. Think about that for a moment. Again, there is only going to be so much Bitcoins that are circulating around. Folks, even if there was 21 million Bitcoins, considering that no one ever lost a Bitcoin, that means there's only 21 million people that could ever hold one Bitcoin. You're talking about in a planet that has 7.5 billion people on the planet. And this is what this market can serve. And again, this is what I'm trying to get everyone to see the bigger picture here. Look, these are some of the most recent companies that started adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet. Tesla, folks, added $1.5 billion. That's almost 10% of their balance sheet they put into Bitcoin just a few weeks ago. Square yesterday, folks, went out and put $170 million into Bitcoin and added that to their balance sheet. And even MicroStrategies, they went out and bought another $1 billion worth of Bitcoin. And folks, if you're thinking the price is too high, well, have a look at what they're buying Bitcoin for, what the average price is. $51,200. Another average price that MicroStrategies paid was $52,700. Again, this is what I'm trying to paint the picture on, folks. The boat hasn't even left the dock. Folks, you're talking about Fortune 500 companies getting involved now. I can guarantee you right now that in the boardroom of every single corporation around the world, they are having this conversation on whether they need to be doing it as well. Folks, I have barely even scratched the tip of the iceberg on how much other corporations could pile into this market. That is how big of an opportunity this is right now. And we are just getting started, folks. Look, there's more infrastructure being rolled out for Bitcoin right now. Fidelity is creating platforms where you can use your Bitcoin as collateral, similar to how you would use your house for equity to go take out money against. I can go basically use my Bitcoin now, guys, and go take out a mortgage with it, right? Again, these are the sort of instruments that we're coming, that's coming into the market. You got banks in the US now offering cryptocurrency custody solutions to their customers. Imagine walking into your bank and seeing a big banner saying, we will store your Bitcoin here. That is what's happening. You got new Visa cards offering basically Bitcoin rewards instead of miles and cash rewards. Um, new types of funds coming out, guys. JP Morgan getting involved. 
Folks, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And again, here's another thing. It's not just the US. It's happening on a, to on a total global scale right now. You got Germany passing, passing laws to enable banks to store cryptocurrencies. France made a court decision to equate Bitcoin to money. Japan's embracing uh, block, uh, blockchain right now. And look, guys, the list goes on. Four, of major, uh, four major South Korean banks offering cryptocurrency services. Over in Switzerland, you can pay your taxes in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and look, this is again, just scratching the tip of the iceberg. So why do you need to know all this folks? Where am I going with it all? Well, here it is. Folks, right now we have some of the smartest financial institutions on the planet building the infrastructure to take this market global. Think about that for a moment. That getting into cryptocurrencies right now, folks, is like taking a dirt road to get into this market. What happens when you can buy it on PayPal? What happens when you can go buy it from your financial broker? What happens when you can invest straight in it from not even having a self-managed super fund, but directly from your investment trust. Folks, this is massive news. What happens when you can start buying Bitcoin directly from your bank? This is what's happening as we speak right now. And you know what's happening with Bitcoin? It is continuing to get exponentially scarce. And folks, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out what happens when you have surging demand meets this diminishing supply. And all of this is happening, folks, as currency... On a, on a global scale is being printed into oblivion right now, diluting the value of millions of people's savings. And what happens when the bank turns around and says, you know what, you've got to pay us money to leave your money here now. I can guarantee you folks that right now, I know I wouldn't leave leaving my money in the bank. They are going to be looking for an alternative investment. And if you can be earning far more on your cryptocurrencies from passive income strategies, which I haven't got into just yet, Folks, I'm telling you, there is a wall of capital coming to this market. And that is what's so exciting about here. And that's me trying to connect the dots. Now, while I'm extremely bullish on Bitcoin, folks, I'm even more bullish on altcoins. You're probably thinking that's not possible. But guys, this is to me where the biggest opportunity lies. So pay close attention, right? You see, what's good for Bitcoin, guys, is good for the entire cryptocurrency market. As I mentioned earlier, Bitcoin acts similar to a gateway. And when money floods the Bitcoin, it floods into the entire market, our entire cryptocurrency market. So let me give you an example of what happened back in the last bull market so you can start to see the bigger picture with what's happening right now. You see, in 2017, folks, Bitcoin went from $1,000 to almost $20,000. That's an 1,800% rally. And while that would have still made you a fortune, guys, have a look at what some of these other cryptocurrencies did during that same period that Bitcoin rallied. Right back in 2017, we saw Stellar rally 36,000%. We saw XRP rally 54,000%. NEM 56,000%. Einsteinium 262,000%. And even Verge 1.5 million percent is what we saw in the last bull market, folks. And that was just some. We saw this with a handful of different cryptocurrencies back then, guys. And this is the opportunity that we have. Having some exposure into these assets right now is better than having none, folks. Now, let me put this in perspective. What happens if we add a dollar value to this? Well, folks, if you had $500 invested on these, well, these are the sort of returns you could have had. You know, you could have generated anywhere from $77,000. And that's on Ethereum. That is the second largest cryptocurrency. And have a look at what you could have made from some of these other assets, guys. $180,000 with a $500 investment, $600, $1.1, $3 million, even $7.5 million with a $500 investment. Folks, what I'm trying to say here is that the opportunity with cryptocurrencies is the ability to transform a small investment into these life-changing gains while keeping your risk at a bare minimum. And folks, it's not rocket scientists. You don't have to go out and trade the ins and outs this much. It is about simply buying and holding. <laughs> across a wide variety of different assets and let the market do the heavy lifting, folks. It's about keeping things simplistic, guys. And that is the opportunity that's in front of us. So look, why do you need to know all this? Why am I sharing with you what happened in 2017? Because that same trend is happening now in 2021, folks, as Bitcoin starts its new four-year cycle. Guys, you've got to remember that we are only 152% above Bitcoin's previous all-time high, like I mentioned here, right? And now we're talking about some of the, sorry about my writing, we are talking about some of the smartest financial institutions 
also getting on board. This is a narrative that we haven't seen in any other market rally. And that is why I believe that this may be one of the most significant rallies we may witness in our lifetime. And I know that's a big call guys, but you're hopefully by now starting to see the bigger picture and where I'm getting at with this. I mean, guys, in the last 24 hours, we're seeing gains of over 165%, 230%, 630%. Try and make that on the stock market, guys, in the 24-hour period, right? You just don't see these sort of consistent gains. What about in the last seven days? 721%, over 1,000%, over 2,400% in the last seven days. What about the last 30 days? 3,000%, 5,300%, even almost 200,000% in 30 days, guys. Again, it's about some exposure, guys. It's not about going all in here. And these are the sort of gains that you can be capitalizing on. Look, in the last 44 days, folks, we saw Yearn Finance is now in the top, one of the top cryptocurrencies. Like I mentioned just a few months ago, that generated 112,000%. That was an, a loan enough to turn a $1,000 investment into $1.1 million. So again, folks, what I'm trying to say here is that it's not about going all in. This is about a diversification to a new asset class. Now, guys, before I go any further, like I mentioned earlier, I said I'd built this business, not just all by myself, it was with my sister. And I wanted to get her on board to quickly share her story and how she got into the market and just some of the challenges that she went through as well and you know where she is today. So Sadell, um, are you on board at the moment? Uh, could you share your screen if you're there listening? Hi, Aiden. Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me yeah. okay? Yeah, perfect, loud and clear. So Sadell, do you reckon you could just share exactly what your journey was in this space and uh, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, look, absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on today and to share with you all a little bit of a quick story. And I know some of you would be sitting on the fence and just wondering if this is the right thing for you. And I definitely know how that feeling feels. And I can tell you that it's absolutely an amazing and rewarding experience getting into the crypto space. Uh, I began back in 2017 around the start. And, you know, I was watching Aiden speaking and educating people about this space and how it worked. And it definitely piqued my interest. And I'm sure some of you listening today you may be in a position where you've never invested anything before or you've never got into the investment side of things. And that was definitely myself. I was very nervous, unsure what to do. I'd never been in stocks. I've never even seen a chart before. So to get into crypto, I was just going, you know, what's going on here and what am I going to do? So I followed Aiden's steps and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. So I, I heard about the technology. I believe in where it's going. And I thought, well, I've got an opportunity to be an early investor. So that's exactly what I did. So at the time I put uh, $2,000, which was an investment that I was, an investment amount that I was prepared to invest without worrying about it, without losing sleep. So I went ahead and put $2,000 into the market. Now, Aiden said, don't stare at it every day. And I'm like, okay, I won't stare at it every day. So I went ahead and put $2,000 into the market and just set and forget. So buy and hold portfolio. I, I didn't have to do anything. I just got it all set up and let it, let it go. And Months later, I checked in and I was, you know, my portfolio was sitting at $27,000. Now, from $2,000 to $27,000 with no investment experience, I was completely blown away. And I, you know, had to check my portfolio a few times. Are you sure this is right? Have I done the right thing? And uh, yes, I had. So I took out my initial investment and then an extra $5,000. And I went ahead and went on a lovely trip to Cape Town and went to South Africa and enjoyed the lovely wines. Um, and then when I got back to Australia, you know, I was sitting there and thinking, well, I've got $20,000 now sitting in the market, all pure profit. So if I can, if I can achieve that result with 2000, what can I do with 20,000? So I went ahead and followed some additional steps of Aiden's and, and just kept going with what I was doing. And within a year, pretty much a year and a half, I built a six figure portfolio and that's continued to grow to this day. And that's been such a rewarding experience for myself who I've never had any investment background and the confidence that it's given me to go ahead and do all that has been phenomenal. And, you know, once my portfolio grew into the six figures, you know, diversification is key, like Aiden says here on the slide. And then I was able to get into, you know, collectible items and precious metals. And now my portfolio and wealth is built on a whole range of things. So that's such a, that's such an opportunity that, you know, the crypto space gives because it has that amazing risk to reward ratio. And if you go in without having to put, you know, too much in that you're worried about, then you're really going to be in such a better position than, you know, having not done anything at all. And this is what I say, you know, if you're thinking about sitting, if you're sitting on the sidelines and, and thinking about, you know, is this for me? The idea is just to have some, some position. So 
what Aiden and I decided to do, I said, after I'd seen all these games come in, I said, you know, we had people all around Australia asking, you know, how do we do this? What do we do? So we started people helping people in Perth, helping people around Australia, and then eventually all over the world in Canada and USA and UK. And it's been a phenomenal thing just from having a go and, and, and having some position in the market. So all I can say is if you're sitting on the side of the, if you're sitting on the fence and you're not sure what to do and you're worried about this asset and where's it going to go, the best thing you can do is have a position in, you know, don't worry about it. Put something in that you, you, you can afford to invest. And, you know, the benefits are going to be amazing because we've got such a long way to go and you are what we would call an early investor. And you're going to look back in years to come and go, thank God I got in. And it's such a rewarding experience. So, like I said, it's about diversification. It's about having that allocation in and just following the steps and, you know, really having that guidance and knowing and, and, and following a process in between. So I just wanted to jump in there and share, you that, share with you that quick story. And, uh, and I hope that you get into the crypto market like we all have. And it's, it's very rewarding. So I'm going to hand you back over to Aidan. Thanks very much, Aidan, for jumping on there. Awesome. Thanks, Adele. And guys, yeah, absolutely what you just said, right? Again, it's about diversification. And, and you know what I find interesting with Sidel's situation, folks, is that, you know, most people get out there, they'll go build a property portfolio, they'll keep leveraging their portfolio, buying the next one, and then using the equity from that and getting into other different assets. But what's been unique with so many people that we've helped is they've managed to do that, but without the debt, right? They've built up their cryptocurrency portfolio to the point where they were using the, the profits from their, their, from their cryptocurrency and then started investing into property and then started investing into other equities and building out commodities and other things like that. And that's a really interesting and a powerful position to be in because you have zero debt in that, in that particular situation, folks. So again, like I said, I've seen people build up a portfolio from a few thousand dollars and then use that to build their entire portfolio. And that's the power that this market still has. And that's why I'm saying the risk is not having exposure to this market. And guys, you know, it wasn't just Sadell that's also crushed it, myself, my family, and so many other people that we've helped. But Kate here, you know, like I mentioned earlier, turned a 4K investment into $85,000. That's someone's full year wage. And she made that in as little as two months, still doing what she was doing on the side, right? That's the power of what this market can do for everyone that gets uh, involved in this market the right way. Uh, you know, Aussie here generated 2,240% profit. Guys, that was just one of the trades that he did, you know, he generated gains of over 363%, 446%, and 437% as well. Um, and that's what I'm talking about here. This is the sort of consistency we can see in these bull markets with this, with this particular crypto space. Uh, John over here, you know, he tripled his portfolio in as little as nine months, uh, you know, getting back involved in April. And like I said, guys, the boat is still at the dock here. Look, let me go and give you some illustrations of what I mean by this. As little as 2% of your portfolio, folks, is a way that you can offset risk, right? And actually and increase your profit. So let me show you four different portfolio structures here. So this is over a three-year time frame. This is done by Fundstrat. And what, uh, what they did, guys, is they said, well, what would happen if I invested into 60% stocks and 40% bonds over three years? Well, you can see here that they would have generated 59% return on their money. Now, the dark blue line that you can see in this graph right here, folks, is what happens if we just invested 2% of our money into Bitcoin, right? So they took some from their stocks and they invested 2% into Bitcoin. Well, they generated 91% from doing as little as 2% having uh, Bitcoin, having some exposure. What happens if it was 5%? Well, guys, they generated 128% by having as little as 5% in that portfolio. But what happens when they added 5% of Bitcoin, but also added 5% of, say, the top 10 cryptocurrencies? Well, folks, you can see by having some exposure, it's far better than having none because these are the sorts of returns that we can see with a little amount of money in this market. And that's what I'm talking about here, guys. It's all about diversification to a range of different portfolios out there, different asset classes out there. And this is a typical example of, of that. So that's what I'm really trying to drive home here. Look, Bitcoin alone has been the best performing asset in 2019 and in 2020 and heck, even the last decade, right? Um, everyone back in 2019 said we're in a bear market and folks, Bitcoin basically outperformed things like crude oil, tech stocks, US real estate, US stocks um, by 53%. In 2020, it generated 226% and absolutely crushed other traditional markets. And that trajectory right now, folks, is very much still on that same path, right? This is what we're seeing. I believe 2021 is going to be one of the biggest years that we're going to see for the entire market not just Bitcoin, but for these other alternative assets too. 
And like I said, this is just the beginning. I mean, folks, the writing's on the wall here. You got central banks getting involved. You got US regulators now giving banks the green light to get involved, commercial banks. You got hedge funds getting involved. You got corporations adding Bitcoin to their treasury reserve assets. You got millennials choosing Bitcoin over things like gold. You got PayPal and Square and MasterCard and Visa all getting involved right now. You got some of the most respectable financial institutions getting involved. And guys, you got companies like uh, entities like the World Economic Forum and Cisco, even calling things like 10% of the world's global GDP could be entering this market. Think about that. <laughs> I know I kind of rushed that a little bit, but guys, it's this is just the tip of the iceberg is what I'm saying. Heck, in just the last few months, even just this last month, guys, You've got Ray Dalio, you know, a well-respected hedge fund manager saying that Bridgewater, that's their hedge fund, is potentially looking at adding Bitcoin to it. You've got Elon Musk saying Bitcoin's on the verge of broad acceptance, who's talking about using Bitcoin to even pay for his Teslas. Uh, Mark Cuban talking about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as well, saying the upside is truly unlimited. I mean, like I said, folks, these type of people, these savvy investors, you know, that are experts in their field, didn't become rich because of making guesses, right? These are well-informed decisions that they're making and the writing is on the wall right now. And again, not to mention everyone else involved in this space. And quite frankly, guys, you know, what I'm saying here is that, like I mentioned, oh, I know I've been a broken record saying it, but there is a lot of upside opportunity. And some of these assets that we're still looking at right now, guys, I believe are going to potentially outperform things like Ethereum, even maybe Bitcoin. Um, you know, we're already starting to see signs of it. And we're starting to see a lot more major institutions and other savvy investors catch on to this. Folks, when the penny drops and you get that aha moment, you're going to absolutely see that how big this is going. Guys, it is a rapidly evolving market. We saw the internet wipe out multi-billion dollar industries and create multi-trillion dollar industries. Blockchain technology is going to do the exact same. It is going to wipe out multi-billion and even potentially trillion dollar industries and create new multi-billion, multi-trillion industries as well. So folks, look, would you agree that there's an enormous opportunity standing right in front of you? Yes or yes, right? Absolutely there is. And we're only very much just getting started in this market. And look, is it safe to say that the majority of you have probably never done this stuff before? Well, folks, look, I've created a very simple and easy to follow path so you can position yourself today to profit from this rapidly growing market. And guys, here it is. Today, I just want to introduce the cryptocurrency fast launch program that myself and my sister, we've worked through, put together so that you can get the results the fast, simple and right way without any of the mistakes that it's taken us to get where we are today, folks. Look, I've made this that simple, folks, that you can do this right from your kitchen table with no experience whatsoever and you can get started today in this rapidly growing market. And folks, here it is. Look, you're going to get eight fully comprehensive modules that we personally put together, folks, so that you can get into this market the fast way. And again, if you want information, guys, don't do this course. Just go on Google and spend hours trying to look for it. What this is, it's a systematic approach to getting in this market and getting the results in this space, guys. Again, it is the fast launch program to get you in this market fast without any mistakes. And this is what it involves. Look, in module one, it's everything you need to know about Bitcoin and blockchain. Look, you need to understand the potential of this market. I want you to see the opportunity in this market. But folks, I more importantly want every single one of you to be capitalizing on the bigger opportunity happening in this space. There is a major undercurrent of assets growing in this space that no one is analyzing right now, folks. And that is what I want to get everyone onto. Because the moment you see this on the newspaper, the moment you start reading about these things I'm looking at, on the TV or on the newspaper, guys, I'm telling you those opportunities are already going to be lost. In module two, I then want to talk about security, folks. This is the most imperative thing, right? It's all about making sure that you lock the, your assets down like a Swiss vault so that no exchange or no other type of platform can take those assets away. And that's what I'm going to be so critical on before you even consider buying any asset in this space. In module three, I'm going to then talk about how to buy your first Bitcoin. Now, look, this is where the rubber meets the road, folks. I'm going to show you literally step by step exactly what it is that I do so you can simply do the same without falling into any of these pitfalls that people find themselves in by going through this and trying to work this stuff out on their own. You're going to have me and my team helping you every single step of the way. 
in module four, it's how to buy any cryptocurrency on the market. Now guys, this is where the fun part really kicks in. I'm gonna show you how you can start using that Bitcoin and diversifying across a portfolio of crypto assets that have the potential to capitalize on these asymmetric investments I've been talking about, where you can turn these small investments into these astronomical gains that I've been talking about, where I turned a $983 investment into over $106,000 in as little as 90 days. And I'm gonna be showing you how to be getting in on those opportunities while the market's running hot as we speak. Folks, in module five, my ultimate cryptocurrency storage solutions. Again, once you buy this portfolio of assets, folks, you wanna make sure that they're locked down like a Swiss vault. I'm gonna show you how to do that and how I personally do that. And also how you can be generating passive income from that as well, folks. So there's so many different things that are popping up right now, guys, but that is why we're here. So you can leverage off our knowledge. Uh, module six, managing your portfolio like a pro. Folks, you want to make sure that you're basically analyzing it. You're basically keeping an eye on your entire portfolio so that you're 10 steps ahead of the tax man and also making sure that you know where everything is at any one time. I'm going to show you how to literally cut hours down into seconds using some of the best systems and software that we have. So again, you can get into this market the fast, simple and the right way. Uh, module seven is how to build a multi-million dollar portfolio. Folks, there are these all these different get rich quick things that are happening in this market. I'm going to show you what the 20% is that you need to be focusing on to get the 80% of the results as opposed to doing that the other way around, which 99% of people do that first get into this market full prey to. Uh, so guys, again, that's not going to be you. I'm going to show you what I did, what our coaches do and what our major investment thesis is so that you can understand the bigger picture here. Uh, in module eight, it's my ultimate buying and selling strategies. Now, again, guys, like I said, this market has four year cycles. We're going to be showing you while we get, when we're getting in, when we're getting out. And again, guys, once you understand the tools to be able to enter and exit this market that we're going to show you how to do, then you're going to have a lot more confidence entering and exiting this space, guys, and being able to profit more from this space. So look, there's a lot to cover. And again, guys, that is a fast, systematic approach to profiting in this market for the, uh, the very first day that you start. Now, look, guys, again, all of that value comes to $11,976. But here's the thing. Look, I know there's no bank of Bitcoin you can call. There's no central entity you can call because that's what this whole ecosystem was built off. So folks, that's why we're going to give you our full support and you're going to get your very own private coach every single step of the way. Look, so guys, that means you're going to have six one-hour, one-on-one Skype calls and you can call your coach up if you get stuck anywhere along the program that you need help with. You're going to have someone real that you can talk to find out exactly where you are and guide you through anything that you might get stuck on. But not only that, I'm gonna give you 12 months of unlimited direct email access to myself and my team guys so that we're with you through that this entire process. And folks, let me just say that this is what I really pride myself on. I, you know, we've got the best team, I believe, out there, right? They're just so experienced in this market. And again, you're leveraging off people who understand this space, who have been through the hurdles so that you don't have to and you can simply focus on what you need to. That is the power of leveraging off people's knowledge that have already been there and done that, folks. And that's what you have an entire year of access to. And that is what I, this is one of the biggest highlights, I believe, in the program, uh, just because I, I think we've got such an awesome team that's going to be working with you and batting in your corner. So, guys, that's why it's valued at six and a half thousand um, dollars. Not only that, but you're going to get the 12 months weekly live market updates, news, and technical analysis. Why? So that you can focus on what's important to know. Guys, it's about taking out all the guesswork. You can spend every single day watching this market and get only 20% of the information that's going to be really useful for you. What we do, guys, we keep our fingers on the pulse and we go through all that process for you so that you don't need to. And we're going to be filtering out all the BS that's out there, guys, and giving you what's important to know. And that's things like mega trends that are emerging, entry and exit points, major announcements, breaking news, disruptive ideas. Guys, you're going to get that every single week. And that's just how fast this market's growing. And again, you're going to be getting informed with everything you need to know. So you're 10 steps ahead of anyone in this space starting out for the first time, folks. And that's why it's valued at $7,500. Also, I'm going to chuck in how to find the next 100x coin because, guys, there's going to be the next Google, Facebook, and Amazon that are going to merge from this market, similar to what emerged from the internet era. Again, we're going to show you how to literally cut out 90% of projects that aren't worth looking into so that you can start to understand what makes a good project, what you should be looking into, and how your projects that you want to get into, guys, to see if they're valuable or not. And again, 
It's about taking out all that guesswork, guys, and following our blueprint that's helped us make enormous sums of money and capitalize on a lot of gains out there. You're going to get the full blueprint on that. So that's valued at two and a half thousand. Also, 12 months access to our private members only Facebook group. Guys, basically, this is a 24 7 support group, right? Whether we're in there or our members are in there, guys, it's basically taken on a life of its own. Uh, we got members in there answering other members' questions. Look, they're all on the same journey as you folks that are going to be jumping on, right? Any question that you might have, we do also monthly Q&As where you can jump in and ask us. We rotate it between myself and the coaches. Uh, anything you need, guys, you're going to find the answers here too. And again, you can ask, speak to us live on these platforms once a month, ask a question in, and you're always going to have your answers, uh, questions answered, folks. Um, so that is why it's so powerful, guys. And you're going to be joining other like-minded members on the same journey as you. Um, and that's why it's valued at $4,000. Uh, asset protection and inheritance solutions. Guys, like I said at the start of this, you can hand, this is something that you can hand down for generations to come. And that is why people need to be looking at creating safety nets in case something does go wrong. So you do have a plan B and nobody thinks about that, right? Any Joe blog can sign up to exchange and buy crypto, but guys, they're not setting up the right procedures to protect themselves if anything goes wrong. And that is why we're going to be giving you uh, a full description on how to set this up, guys, so you can hand this down for generations to come, um, you know, and create the safety nets needed in order to protect your assets in this place. It's a new game, guys, and we need to adjust for it. Uh, and that's why it's valued at 2997. So guys, just quickly, this is what you're going to get. It's the entire cryptocurrency kickstart program with the eight modules, the one-on-one -on -one coaching. You're going to be allocated with your very own private coach. Um, unlimited direct email support to myself and my team anytime you need us. The 100x coin blueprint guide that's helped us find diamonds in the rough out there, guys, that have generated um, massive returns. Um, 12 months week, weekly live market updates. You're going to get the access to the Facebook group and also the asset protection and inheritance solutions guide. Folks, all of that comes to 32,473. Now, look, does it actually work? Guys, here's what some of our some of our, our members have said, right? This is Tim. I mean, he generated $450,000, guys, of pure profit. <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, guys, there's different ways that you can enter this market. He invested $220,000 from his self-managed super fund, took out the initial investment and let the rest ride, ride, ride in this space. And this is the power of what you can be doing, guys. You can be minimizing your risk so it's zero to the point where you don't have to worry about it. And you can let the market just do the heavy lifting for you without having to trade it or anything like that. That is what I'm talking about, guys. And that is how we really capitalize on this space. And this is what's worked for our members time and time again. You know, this is what helped Shelly here generate 400% in eight months as a complete beginner. Again, guys, once you have the platform to build off, I'm talking about all the infrastructure in place, the security in place, then the easiest part is having your portfolio let the do the, he uh, let, um, do the heavy lifting for you, right? And, you know, Shelly had no experience in this market, guys, right? And again, like I said, similar to Sadell, you know, never traded other investments, never got into any other type of trading or whatever the case was, you know, did this with zero experience, um, you know, and 400% is a great result in eight months. Uh, you know, Warren here, $30,000 up in his first four months after joining back in uh, January, guys. And again, that was just the start. I'm talking about January of 2020, right? He's been absolutely crushing it ever since if you've been seeing what the market's been doing. Uh, Luke here, six figures in six months. I mean, what kind of other asset class, folks, can you generate these sort of returns from? And I'm telling you right now, the opportunity is right now while the market is very much gearing up for this next cycle. So again, this is just very much the start for so many of our members getting involved. Guys, Rob, when he first got into the program, it was 38% up. Raj, 70%. Alex, we already talked about $16,000 in a few 18 days. And look, folks, I could go on and on about all these different testimonials that we've helped literally thousands of people around the world do now. But what I'm trying to say here, and the fact of the matter is that if you've got someone that you can leverage off that's been there, done that, this market is here for the taking. Again, it's not about overcomplicating it, folks. It is about keeping things simplistic and making sure everything is systematic for you to easily follow. That is how we've had such a great result. And that is exactly what we want to help every single one of you do today. Uh, guys, a couple of questions I get asked. Can you do this with a self-managed super fund? Absolutely. Uh, how long does it take to get started, folks? Like I said, the most work that you're going to do is in the first month. 
After that, it's very much letting the market do the heavy lifting and then also adding things as we see pop up in the market that you might want to add to your portfolio. Uh, is it easy to cash out my crypto? Guys, if it's a business day, it can be within back in your bank account. You can cash out your profits and have that sitting in your bank account within a few hours. Um, it can be instantly sold off and put back into your bank. Uh, how much money do I need to get started? Well, guys, like I've been harping on about this whole time, having some exposure is better than none. Look, we've seen what happened in 2017 uh, with what $500 could have done. Heck, if you had $100 on this one trade verge, you would have generated $1.5 million. Uh, you know, year in finance just a few months ago, you guys, if you had $1,000 on that in 44 days, you could have generated $1.1 million. I mean, what would that sort of extra money do in your life for you right now? Um, you know, and for most people, guys, it would change their world completely. And this is what I want to do for as many people as I can, quite frankly. And again, it's not about breaking the bank. You can do this by keeping risk at a bare minimum. A um, couple of bonuses I want to throw in today, guys, as well, that me and Sidel wanted to put together. Uh, so look, here they are. We want to throw in for today, guys, our, um, our ultimate passive income strategies, because let's face it, you're not earning basically anything at the bank right now. And guys, we're going to show you how you can be putting that money into things like uh, US dollars or whatever the case is and earning over 10% interest on it or even earning uh, passive income on your Bitcoin. These are things I haven't even got to touch on today. And look, we can show you how to generate over a thousand US dollars per month while you sleep, if not more, depending on how much you want to uh, put into this. So guys, we're going to show you how, how to do all of that. Um, and this has just been an unreal way. This is a compounding effect. It's been working an absolute treat with so many of our members. So look, that's that at 1997. And you're going to get that completely free today, guys. Um, bonus number two is a 45-minute strategy call. So guys, on top of the six coaching calls you're going to get, you're going to give you an additional 45-minute call because everyone's in it starts at a different point. We want to make sure you start with your best foot forward so that you can get into this market again the fast, simple, and right way. It's a fast launch program, guys, because we want to get you in fast, but make sure you're doing it right. So look, whether you've been a full-time trader in this space already, folks, and you want to get involved, or whether you're a complete beginner, that is what this strategy's call, uh, the strategy call is for, right? It's finding where you are now and what the best uh, spot is for you to start at to really maximize your time in this space. Uh, and that's valued at $500. Um, bonus number three, folks. This is something that we're super excited about. We're doing two tickets to now a three-day workshop. Why is it three days? Because there is so much happening at the moment. Uh, guys, look, it's big opportunities of what's emerging, but we're not just going to give you in theory about what's happening, folks. We're going to be giving you practical examples of how you can be getting exposure to a lot of these disruptive assets. Look, write these dates down for me, guys, and I'm going to see you there. It's on the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. I'll be there. My coaches will be there. Sidel's going to be there. And basically, we're going to be running through about what is happening on this space and most importantly, how to maximize your returns, folks. And look, it's for you and a friend. So guys, outside of this, you know, you can invite your brother, your mother, your sister, anyone that you want to this to be a part of this three day exclusive workshop. Um, look, guys, we've had raging reviews about this. I like it because it gives me a chance to have a chat with everyone. And you can be writing in questions as we go, guys. It's very interactive. Um, and just remember that is happening in March. So write those dates down for me. And that's valued at 4997. Now, look, can you do this another way, guys? I mean, look, absolutely. It's how I started. It's how Sidel started. It's how most people start today, unfortunately. But look, you know, like I said, you know, you can start out like I did years ago and spend hour after hour researching all this stuff step by step, right? I mean, you could potentially lose thousands of dollars trying to find out what works in this space and what doesn't until you realize what it is that you need to be focusing on. You know, spend hundreds of hours watching YouTube videos, reading blogs, just to get that one piece of information you're after to try and make sense of something. Well, guys, even go to your local cryptocurrency meetup groups. This is what I used to do. And I used to learn from others what they did wrong and how I could do it better and all this other stuff, guys. Look, the list goes on and on. But what I'm trying to say here, guys, is the fact is that there is no comparison, right? The reason I wanted to do this program, guys, is because I wanted to give people a silver platter to capitalize on this market without going through the hurdles that I had to get where I am today. It is literally a step-by-step -step guide so you can focus on what's important to know and maximize your returns in this market while keeping risk and your time to a bare minimum, folks. So that is the key of what we're really doing here, guys. And it's worked for thousands of people so far and it will work for you as well. Now, look, as a big thank you for Greg having me on today, guys. Absolutely love Greg. I'm, I'm not going to be charging that much today, guys. 
Look, um, this is what the outside of this course, what we do charge. Look, with everything included today, guys, the bonuses and everything, it comes to $39,967. Why? Because it gets the results of people, guys. Right, but look, again, as a big thanks to Greg, we're not charging that much today, guys. Look, for this one time only, guys, for this webinar today, I told Greg that I'm happy to give it away to uh, everyone tuning in for just 4997 or we can finance this as well, folks, and we can offer this for three easy monthly payments of 1997, right? All you need to do if you want to get started, guys, is go to gocogroup.com forward slash crypto. I believe Jonathan will be adding that into the group chat. Now, again, you can't click on the screen, guys. You would need to click on the group chat or open a new tab to get started. But I'm telling you right now, folks, this is only exclusive for Greg uh, and his whole group. Um, and basically, it's only for today, guys. Now, I also want to offer this um, just to make this a no-brainer because, look, I want to make sure that if you're serious about this market, folks, and you want to get into this space, but you've been sitting on the fence, well, I'm going to give you a 14-day money-back guarantee. That means you can start this program today, check everything out, come meet the coaches, have a chat with our team, and guys, get a feel to make sure this is the right fit because I know if you really want to maximize and you want to get into this space and understand what it's about and where it's going, Guys, you have everything you need in one spot. So this is my guarantee, guys, that if you don't like my voice, even after a few days, whatever the case is, look, no questions asked, folks. We'll give you a full refund. Just send us an email and we'll give you the full refund straight away. That's how confident I am, guys, that you're going to love everything you're going to get. You're going to love working with our team and everything else in between, guys. It's an awesome program. We've had raving reviews about it and you'll love it if this is what you want. Now... I want to do something just before we wrap up for today, guys. Look, for the first 15 people, and I can only offer this for the first 15, guys, I'm going to be chucking in our mega bonus, and I wanted to do this for Greg. Um, but look, here it is. And again, it's only for the first 15 people because we can't do this for everyone. It is my full watch list plus 12 months subscription to the Crypto Confidential Report. Now, folks, these are the same reports that have helped so many of our clients generate enormous returns, right? And this is what me and my team literally spend hundreds of hours filtering out, right? Again, we're looking for that next Google, Facebook, or Amazon emerging in this space where we can get in and have that first mover's advantage. It's the same reason why we've generated gains of 1,900%, 2,000%, over 4,500%. It's what helped Aussie here generate these massive gains consistently, guys. It's what helped Kate here generate almost uh, $85,000 in as little as two months. And that is what I'm happy to offer everyone for the first 15 people, guys. And it's valued at 4997 because we've had so many people get the results from this. Now, <laughs> I'm going to do one last thing here as well, folks. And again, as a big thank you to Greg, I wanted to chuck in, chuck in one more bonus, but this is why it is only for the first 15 people. Guys, I want to give you my mega, mega bonus, right? This is a buy one and get one free. Look, everything that I've offered you here today goes, you can now give to someone else completely free of charge, right? It can be whether, you, whether it's your brother, your mother, your sister, your business partner, anyone that you want, you can nominate and have them have their own login details. They're going to get their own coach. They're going to get their own email access, their own two tickets to a three-day workshop. Guys, like I said, everything that we're offering you, you can now gift to someone completely free, but that is only for the first 15 people. As you can imagine, guys, we can't offer that to everyone. So look, that is valued at 4997 if you want to be a part of that, guys, and have someone else come along this journey with you. And we just noticed that's what's helped maximize so much people's results is having a family member or someone else that's also excited about this space uh, to have you bounce ideas off them. So guys, it's a powerful thing that we wanted to include on this. And uh, look, here it is, folks everything included today, the entire cryptocurrency fast launch program. You're going to receive all our bonuses that we're giving away today. And also our mega bonuses, which are only for the first 15 people, guys. Unfortunately, I can't increase that. But look, that is, uh, you know, a full course free of charge plus our, buy, um, plus our full crypto confidentials as well. So guys, with all that included with the mega bonuses now, that actually comes to almost $50,000. Um, why? Because guys, this is what people pay us outside of this because it does get them the results. But again, we're not charging that much for today only. It just comes to 4997 Or like I said, we can offer you a finance option here of 1997 And just remember, folks, you have zero risk whatsoever for the first 14 days. Now, look, I'm going to hand it back over to Greg uh, or Steve and I'll answer some questions as I promised earlier. And uh, yeah, get, get the ball rolling with that a bit. So I, over to you, Greg or Steve. Thank you. Yes, it's Greg here. I tried to put my video on, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, the host has to open me up. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Aidan. That was outstanding. Aidan, just a just a thought. If um, if somebody is thinking about doing it, what are the consequences if they don't do it now? Uh, missing out on some big opportunities in the market. Uh, look, I, I, I honestly think, guys, that you know the only reason we run these programs is because it's time sensitive. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this market is heating up, and I, you know, I'm not going to be running these forever. And this is why we're happy to open our uh, open our doors to this now. So, look, there is a big opportunity cost for waiting, folks. Is all I can say. Um, and you know, if you are looking to get exposure in this market, you've got everything you need uh, on a silver platter, in my opinion, guys. It's uh, it's an awesome program. We've had some great reviews from it. Fantastic. Well, Aiden, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful, no wonderful day, a wonderful way to finish on a real um, happening subject. And I would just encourage everybody out there, if you're thinking about this, don't think, do it. Get involved. This is a great opportunity. Don't miss out. What happens in life is we go, we, we, I'm gonna, I was going to do it, and then 12 months later, you still haven't done it. So do it now. Okay, do it now. All right, on behalf of everybody, thank you, Aidan. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us uh, for uh, so many hours. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day, and we look forward to seeing you on our next show very, very soon. Awesome. Cheers, guys.